The Eighteenth Book of Orlando Furioso. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland. Orlando Furioso by Ludovico Ariosto. Translated by Sir John Harrington. Book Eighteen. The Argument. Now Griffin's known and felt. Algier doth threaten the Tartar prince. Charles fighteth and prevails. Martano, like a coward, is well beaten. Marthesa's force, Damasco warriors, quails. From thence, with tempest tossed and weather beaten, both she and Griffin and Astolfo sails. Medor and Cloridan, with care and pain, seek for the carcass of their master slain. Most worthy prince, your virtues high and rare, with tongue and pen, I praise and ever shall although my words and verse inferior are in number and in worth to match them all. But all above this one I do compare and far prefer and pure divinest call, that giving gracious ear to those are grieved, yet every tale is not by you believed. Oft have I heard your highness hath refused, although the same most earnestly were sought, to hear the guiltless absent man accused, and when a great complaint to you was brought, you have the matter and the man excused, suspending still your judgment and your thought, and keeping till the truth were truly tried ever one ear for the contrary side. Had Norandino had so great a grace, as not to credit tales so lightly told, he had not offered Griffin this disgrace, no, though thereby he might have gained gold. But so doth rashness virtue oft deface, as here was proved, that was said of old, the silly people bear the scourge and blame, oft when their princes do deserve the same. For Griffin, as in part I told before, when as his hands and feet were once untied, did deal about of blows and thrusts such store as well was he could for himself provide. His wrath was such as none he then forbore. The old, the young, the strong, the feeble died. And they that laughed before to see him carted, now for their labor whined as much and smarted. The people faint and mazed fled away from him whom late they did deride and scorn. He followed them and killed them by the way dastards more meet to die than to be born but in this chase a while i let him stay triumphing now that lately was forlorn of rodomont now somewhat must be spoken on whom at once i said eight spears were broken eight spears at once upon the scaly skin did light and diverse darts were thrown aloof for spears and darts he passeth not a pin such was his strength so sure his armour's proof but when he saw that more and more came in, to part from thence he thinks his best behoof, for why on every side they so assail him, that needs at length his breath and strength must fail him. Even as the lion's whelps that see a bull are at the first of his great strength afraid, but when they see their sire to tear or pull his throat and sides, they run their sire to aid and fly upon his face and horned skull till prostrate on the ground they have him laid, so now, when Charles himself was in the place, each one took arms, each one took heart of grace. Whoso hath seen a huge well-baited bear, with many dogs, men standing close about, when he by hap the stake or cord doth tear, and rusheth in among the thickest rout, how suddenly they run away with fear, and make a lane to let the bear go out. He might, I say, compare by such a sight the manner of this pagan's fight and flight. He rusheth out, and with his two-hand blade he flourisheth about in so fierce sort that soon a way for him to pass was made. To hinder him his way it was no sport, and those that by the way did him invade, except they shifted better, were cut short. Thus, in despite of Charles and all his realm, he came unto the banks of Sequin's stream, and standing from the bank a little distance, that few or none behind him could unclose, an hour's space and more he made resistance against King Charles, whose power still greater grows, till in the end, in hope of no assistance, displeased but not disgraced, away he goes. He takes the river, fretting in his mind that he had left a man alive behind. And so he swelled in anger and in pride that he had thought to turn him back again, and to have mounted on the other side, and all that should withstand him to have slain. But lo! 
a messenger he then espied that made him from that rash attempt refrain but who did send him and what word he bare i mean to you another time declare but first what discord did i mean to show who as you heard was by the angel sent among the pagans seeds of strife to sow and as she was commanded thither went yet leaving fraud behind the coals to blow lest all the fire of strife should quite be spent and to augment his strength as much as may be he carried pride with him out of the abbey pride leaves hypocrisy to keep his place and thus these jarring friends together go and when they travelled had a little space they found by hap dame jealousy also that met a dwarf that run a trudging pace even as she wandered idly to and fro and learning unto whom this page was sent to go with him she quickly did consent you call to mind for sure you cannot choose to call to mind so late a written story how mandricardo doralis did use and kept with joy whom he did win with glory she secretly sent notice of this news though afterward herself perhaps was sorry to rodomont and sharply him incited to venge her rape as i before recited the messenger arrived then by hap when from the stream the pagan did ascend and told him all the tale of her mishap and how another did possess his friend cold jealousy straight entered in his lap and pride with discord to the matter mend alleging if he put up this disgrace then let him ne'er look lady in the face like as a tiger that her young hath lost surprised by hunter's hand and borne away doth follow on the foot through every cost no dikes nor waters wide can make her stay so rodomont with love and anger most and flamed would endure no more delay and though he want his horse that did not boot to cause him stay he rather goes on foot he means whatever horseman next he spied to take his horse of friend or else of foe at this his discord pleased and said to pride that she was glad their business cotton so i will quoth she a horse for him provide and horse shall cost him dear enough i trow and what of him and of that horse befell another time uh, not now i mean to tell this while the most renowned christian king that had expulsed the pagan from the town his valiant men of arms about doth bring and on the sudden lets the drawbridge down and with a fresh assault their foes so sting while fortune smiled on him on them did frown that they had run away like men dismayed had not for all courageously them stayed my mates in arms quoth he brethren and friends proved valiant heretofore now hold your place more happy far is he his life that spends in honour than that keeps it in disgrace lo me your general that here attends no way to stain the blood of spanish race the pattern follow that i show you first and then i care not let them do their worst thus in that part for all the fight renewed and draws with him the chosen spanish band that oft in christian blood their hands imbrued and none almost but they did now withstand but destiny can never be eschewed and may by their success be rightly scanned behold rinaldo comes and as he came it seemed he carried lightning fierce or flame not long before almonte's valiant son hight dardanel had slain a christian knight and proud of that his glory lately won and of his good success he had in fight about the field he carelessly did run until he happed to see a woeful sight he saw alfeo yielding up the ghost a youth whom he esteemed and loved most lurcanio was the man that did the deed and dardanel to venge it doth intend lurcanio followed on and took no heed the other all on him his force doth bend and with a weighty spear him and his steed unto the earth together he doth send and pierced his thigh and put him in such pain as scant he able was to rise again but ariodant that dear his brother loved and sees him in such pain and danger lie was therewithal in wrath so greatly moved he meaneth to avenge his hurt or die but though that he attempted oft and proved yet could he not to dardanel come nigh for still of other men the throng and number did him in this attempt molest and cumber 
no doubt the heavens had dardanelle ordained to perish by a more victorious hand rinaldo's blade must with his blood be stained and was as after you shall understand by him this praise and glory must be gained the fame whereof must fill both sea and land but let these western wars a while remain and of griffino talk we now again who taught those of damasco to their harms what wrong they did to cart him in such sort they fill the town with uproars and alarms men's mouths and ears were full of this report the king brings forth five hundred men in arms and sends five more to fortify the fort for why this tumult brought him in persuasion that sure some host of men did make invasion but when he saw no men no host no band no troops of horse the city to invade only one man well known that there did stand and of his people such a slaughter made moved with remorse he stretcheth out his hand naked in show of peace as is the trade and openly his rashness he lamented that such a knight to harm he had consented and griffin when to find he now begun the king was of so good an inclination and that the wrong to him before was done not of his own but others instigation to make a friendly concord doth not shun because hereby he lost no reputation and there he tarried at the king's request to cure his wounds and take a little rest this while his brother aquilant the black that with astolfo still in jewry stayed and sees his brother now so long did lack was in his mind all sad and ill apaid they heard no news of him they found no track though wait about in every part was laid until the greekish pilgrim they had met by whom of him some inkling they did get he told them how a certain wanton dame hight oregilla with a ruffian knave that kept her openly without all shame yet going in apparel fine and brave these two the pilgrim said together came from antioch as forth in speech they gave and to damasco then they meant to go but what became of them he did not know and further unto aquilante told how he griffino met this other day and did to him the matter all unfold and how forthwith griffino went his way with chaff enough and swearing that he would kill the same vile adulterer if he may no sooner had his speech the pilgrim ended in post to follow aquilante intended in post he followed to damasco word and when he travelled had a day or twain behold that god that ever doth reward the good with blessings and the bad with pain that graceless couple that before you heard betrayed griffino with that devilish train into the hands of aquilant did give while they in pleasure most securely live i say that aquilant by god's permission doth meet the vile martano on the way his horse his coat and outward apparition so like unto griffino every way that aquilant at first without suspicion went to embrace him and began to say brother well met i joy of your welfare your absence bred in me much fear and care but when he saw the t'other not replied but shrunk away like one that were afraid ah traitor villain yield thyself he cried thou hast my brother spoiled and betrayed tell me thou wretch doth he in life abide to whom in humble sort martano said with fainting heart and quaking voice and trembling yet in the midst of all his fear dissembling oh pardon sir your brother is alive and like to live and hath no hurt nor shall the truth is this i being loath to strive with him because i found him stout and tall did with no ill intent this drift contrive to save myself and do him hurt but small for this same woman's sake that is my sister with open force not daring to assist her it grieved me to see how he by lust did her abuse whom nature made me love and for i thought it was both meet and just her from this wicked custom to remove and sith i did his value great mistrust i thought it best by policy to prove i stale his horse and coat while he was sleeping and so conveyed her quite out of his keeping well might martano bear away the bell or else a whetstone challenge for his due that on the sudden such a tale could tell and not a word of all his tale was true but yet in show it all agreed well save one which aquilant most certain knew was false and he in vain did seek to smother he was her bedfellow and not her brother 
with hand and tongue at once he doth reply and in one instant he both strake and spake i know quoth he vile villain thou dost lie and on the face so fiercely he him strake he makes two teeth into his throat to fly then with great violence he doth him take and him and her he binds in bitter bands like captives carried into foreign lands and thus in haste unto damasco riding he swears that he these bands would not unbind till of his brother he do hear some tiding whom in damasco after he did find who now with cunning physic and good guiding was almost healed in body and in mind and when he saw his unexpected brother they both saluted and embraced each other. And after they had made in speech some sport, about full many a foolish accident, for Aquilant had heard a large report of Griffin's carting and his punishment, at last he asketh Griffin in what sort they should this couple worthily torment. To hang and draw and burn their privy parts was not too much for their two foul desarts. The king and all his council thought it good, because their fault was such so open known, that they should publicly dispill their blood, and their desarts might publicly be shown. But yet that motion Griffin straight withstood, pretending private causes of his own. Only he wished Martano should be stripped, and at a cart drawn through the street and whipped. And as for her, although she had deserved a punishment as great as he, or more, yet was the sentence of her doom reserved until lucina came and not before so that by griffin's mean she was preserved so great a sway love in his fancy bore here aquilant by griffin was procured to bide with him until his wounds were cured now norandin that all his power still bends to honor griffin all the means he may and with great courtesy to make amends for that disgrace he did him the other day to make another triumph he intends set forth with pomp and state and rich array and that the fame may fly to foreign nations he notifies it straight by proclamations at four weeks end the triumph should begin the fame whereof about so far was blown without the land of jewry and within at last unto astolfo it was known who asking sansonet's advice herein whose wisdom he preferred before his own at last for company they both agree to go together these same justs to see now as they went upon their way behold they met a gallant and a stately dame with whom the duke acquainted was of old marfisa was this noble lady's name she travelled like a knight her heart was bold her body passing strong unto the same and when she knew both why and where they went to go with them she quickly did consent and thus these three their journey so contrive as just against the day and solemn feast together at damasco they arrive each one well mounted on a stately beast the king that specially did care and strive to honor griffin more than all the rest by all the means and ways he could devise augmented much the value of the prize and where it was as i before declared a single armor rich and finely wrought now norandino at this time prepared to send it out with things not lightly bought to this he adds a horse most richly barbed by rider skill to great perfection brought well shaped well marked strong limbed and passing swift the beast alone fit for a prince's gift all this he did because great hope he saw that griffin once again the prize would win but then was verified the old said saw much falls between the chalice and the chin for when marfisa void of fear or awe without had viewed this armor and within and finds it had been hers by marks well known she seizeth straight upon it as her own the king that ill so great disgrace could brook did show himself therewith much discontent and with a princely frown and angry look his silence threatened that she should repent and in so great despite the thing he took that straight some sergeants unto her he sent with soldiers some on foot and some on horse deceived much in her sex more in her force for never did a child take more delight with gaudy flowers in time of spring to play nor never did young lady brave and bright like dancing better on a solemn day than did marfisa in the sound and sight of glittering blades and spears delight to stay and this did cause her take therein more pleasure because her strength was great beyond all measure 
those few that were to apprehend her sent and punish her for this unlawful deed were caused their coming quickly to repent and others by their harms took better heed the armed knights most diversely were bent some standing still to mark what this would breed some to the sergeants thought to bring relief of whom were griffin and his brother chief the english duke doth deem it were a shame to leave marphise in this dangerous case sith chiefly for his company she came and sansonet doth deem it like disgrace wherefore they mean howe'er the matter frame not leave her unassisted in the place astolfo had a charmed spear all gilt with which he used it oft to run a tilt the virtue of this charmed spear was such besides the gilding bright and fair of hue that whomsoe'er the head thereof did touch straight him from off his horse it overthrew Griffino first although disdaining much he quite unhorsed nor who it was he knew then aquilent that to revenge it meant unto the ground in manner like was sent thus did these warriors three themselves behave but chief marphisa who would never rest but would in spite of all the armor have nor once vouchsafe to ask it or request she doth the king and all his nobles brave and when the best of them had done his best on every side she beat the people down and from them all made way out of the town Sansonet and Astolfo did the like, King Noradino's men of arms pursue. The foolish people cry, stop, kill, and strike, but none comes near, but stand aloof to view. A narrow bridge there was, this place they pike, and do defend it against all the crew till Griffin came, having his horse recovered, and by some marks the English duke discovered, and straight his brother Aquilante came, and of Astolfo both acquaintance take, and then in civil terms they somewhat blame her little count she of the king did make astolfo friendly told them her name and in defence of her some words he spake the rest that came marvelled to what it tends to hear them talk together now like friends but when that norandino's soldiers hard her name so dreaded over all the east they surely thought that they should all be marred and that the city would be ta'en at least therefore they pray the king to have regard but now marphisa moved by request of those two brothers friendly doth consent herself before the prince for to present and thus without much reverence she spake sir king i marvel what your highness meant a prize and gift of such a thing to make as is not yours without i give consent the arms this armour hath plain proof do make namely a crown into three pieces rent I once put off this armor in a way to chase a thief that stale from me a prey. Then said the king, Fair dame, the truth is so. Of one Armenian merchant I them bought, I make no question, be they yours or no, nor needs for proof more witness to be brought. For though they were not, I would them bestow on you, if so the same by you were sought. As for Griffino, unto whom I gave them, he shall be pleased, I hope, and not to have them. I will him recompense some other way, and give him gifts of as great worth or more. Thanks to your highness, Griffin straight doth say, preserve me in your grace, I ask no more. But when Marphisa saw that every way they honoured her, she changed her mind before. To show magnificence she used this drift, that he must take this armour as her gift. And thus good friends all turn it back again and then with double joy the feast they hold in which chief praise did sansonet obtain the other four did then themselves withhold wishing the praise should unto him remain and then with greater cheer than can be told by norandino they were nobly feasted and there themselves they well reposed and rested seven days or eight the king them entertained and those once passed of him their leave they take the which with gifts and honour great obtained unto the town of tripoli they make and in one company these five remained and mind not one the other to forsake as long as one of them was left alive until in france they safely should arrive and straight they get a vessel for their hire a merchant's ship new laden from the west the master of the ship an ancient sire consented to their wills with small request the wind as then served fit for their desire and blows a gentle gale all from the east so that 
with filled sails in little while they came as far as cyprus venus isle here every place was full of odors sweet of gardens fair of spice of pleasant taste the people lustful of a dame venus meet from tender years to doting age do last with wanton damsels walking in each street inviting men to pleasure and repast from hence again they lucid at what time don phoebus chariot unto the east did climb the weather still was temperate and clear a pleasant gale their swelling sails did fill no sign of storm or tempest did appear to such as in the weather had best skill but lo the weather oft doth change her cheer even as a woman oft doth change her will for suddenly they had such storms of weather as if that heaven and earth would come together the air doth on the sudden grow obscure but lightened oft with lightning's dreadful light and save their hour-glass kept them reckoning sure twas hard for to discern the day from night the desperate mariners do all endure as men inured to the water's spite the heavens above the waves beneath do roar yet are not they dismayed one whit therefore one with a whistle hanged about his neck shows by the sound which cord must be undone and straight the ship-boy ready at a beck unto the tops with nimble slight doth run the other mariners upon the deck or at the steer the coming waves do shun and then by turns they pump the water out by pain and care preventing every doubt now while this noble crew with tempest tossed went in the sea as wind and weather drave and look each minute to be drowned and lost the christians with a fresh assault and brave set on the pagans sorely to their cost who now began the worser side to have but chiefly then their courage gan to quail when noble dardanello's life did fail rinaldo him had noted from the rest full proud of slaughter of so many foes and to himself he said tis surely best to crop this weed before it higher grows therewith he sets his fatal spear in rest and cries to dardanello as he goes alas poor boy much woe to thee they bred that left to thee that shield of white and red i'll try if you defend those colors well he saith which if with me you cannot do against orlando fierce i can you tell for to defend them will be great ado thus said rinald and noble dardanel in valiant wise thus answered thereunto know this quoth he that these my colors i will bravely here defend or bravely die with that he spurred his horse as this he spake and with great force rinaldo did assail but lo the staff upon his armor break so is his blow but little did avail but straight rinaldo's spear away did make and pierced the double folds of plate and mail and went so deep into the tender skin the life went out there where the staff went in look how a purple flower doth fade and dry that painful ploughman cutteth up with shear or as the poppy's head aside do lie when it the body can no longer bear so did the noble dardanello die and with his death filled all his men with fear as waters run abroad that break their bay so fled his soldiers breaking their array they fly unto their tents with full persuasion that of the field the masonry was lost wherefore to fortify against invasion they spare no time no travel nor no cost now charles by forehead means to take occasion and follows them full close with all his host and coming to their tents so bravely ventured that he with them themselves almost had entered had not his valiant attempt been stayed by over hasty coming of the night so that of force as then it was delayed and either side was driven to leave the fight but with this difference all the turks dismayed and newly gathered from their fearful flight the christians on the t'other side pursuing and day by day their hope and power renewing the number of the turks that day were slain was more than fourscore thousand as they say their blood did fat the ground of all that plain and makes the ground more fertile to this day among the dead some men half dead remain left there for thieves and robbers as a prey within the pagan camp great moan they make some for their friends some for their kinfolk's sake 
two youths there were among so many more whose friendship fast and firm whose faithful hearts deserved to be placed the rest before and to be praised for their good desarts their names were cloridano and midor both born far hence about the eastern parts their parents poor and not of our belief yet for true love they may be praised chief the elder of the two hight cloridan an hunter wild in all his life had been of active limbs and eke an hardy man as in a thousand men might well be seen medoro was but young and now began to enter to of youth the pleasant green fair-skinned black-eyed and yellow curled hair that hanged in lovely locks by either ear these two among the rest kept watch that night and while the time in sundry speech they spent medoro oftentime most sadly sight his master's death did cause him to lament oh said medoro what a woeful spite what cruel scourge to me this fortune sent that dardanel amante's worthy son so suddenly should unto death be done behold his noble course is left a prey to be devoured by the wolf and crow a food too fine to be so borne away but i shall remedy that hap i trow i'll find the mean his course thence to convey i am resolved myself will thither go that for the good he did me when he lived at least his course by me may be relieved when cloridano heard this saying out he stood amazed and musing in his mind in tender years to find a heart so stout unto so dangerous attempt inclined and straight dissuades him casting many a doubt to make him change the thing he had assigned but still medoro doth resolve to try to bury dardanelle or else to die when cloridan so resolute him found of his own frank accord he vow doth make to follow him in broken state and sound and never him to leave or to forsake and straight they two do leave this fenced ground and pointing new supplies their rooms to take they find the christian camp lie all neglected like those that fear no harm nor none suspected i say those christians that the watch should keep lay as they carried not for foe nor friend their senses so possessed with wine and sleep that none of them their office did attend but cloridan that saw them drown so deep said thus medoro now i do intend to get for our great loss this small amends to kill some foes that kill it all our friends stand thou and watch and hearken every way and for the rest let me alone to try this said he goes where one alfeo lay that took upon him knowledge in the sky by which he dreamt he should live many a day and in his wife's beloved bosom die but all was false his cunning him deceived for now this pagan him of life bereaved and many more whom here i do not name that sleep on boards or making straw their bed at last where wretched grillo lay he came that on an empty barrel couched his head himself had emptied late before the same a deadly sleep the wine in him had bred the turk his sword within his bowels fixed out came the blood and wine together mixed near grillo slept a dutchman and a greek that all the night had plied the dice and drink to both of them at once he did the leak that dreamt perhaps of seven or of six ink they had been better watched all the week than at so bad a time as this to wink death certain is to all the proverb saith uncertain is to all the hour of death look how a lion fierce with famine pined that comes unto a flock of silly sheep where neither fence nor people he doth find doth spoil the flock the while the shepherds sleep so cloridano with his bloody mind that found those hushed that watch and ward should keep could not his cruel rage and malice bridle nor was this while medoro's weapon idle for he that did disdain to make to die those of the common and the baser sort came there where duke labretto then did lie embracing of his lady in such sort as ivy doth the wall they lay so nigh now soundly sleeping after venus sport so close the air could not have come between medor their heads at one blow cuts off clean o oh, happy state o oh, life o oh, death most sweet 
for sure I think their souls embracing so in heavenly seat do oft together meet, and in good peace and love did thither go. Then next a captain of the Flemish fleet, and the Earl of Flanders' son, with other Mo Medoro killed, and so far forward went he came but little from the Emperor's tent. But lo, they both with shedding blood now tired, and fearing lest at length some few might wake, ere long time passed, both by accord retired, and mind their first attempt in hand to take, as both, but as Medoro chief desired most secretly under the field they make they mean although they both were faint and weary the noble dardanello's course to bury the heaps of men that in the field remain some dead and some between alive and dead had made their labor to have been in vain had not the moon showed out her horned head so bright as clear discovered all the plain that then was covered with vermilion red were it a chance, or else his earnest prayer, that made the moon at that time shine so fair. Now after search by Phoebe's friendly light, the good Medora spied him on the ground, who, when he saw that grievous woeful sight, he was for sorrow ready there to sound. And out he cries, Alas, O worthy wight, not worthy in this sort to have been found, now my last duty do I mean to pay and then to say farewell to you for a thus spake medoro shedding many a tear and minding now no longer time to tarry the loved course doth on his shoulders bear and cloridano hope the same to carry and they that erst were stout and void of fear were waxen now so timorous and wary not for their own but this dear burden's sake that every little noise did cause them quake this while the noble Zerban, having chased his fearful foes while others were asleep, that had his heart on virtue's lore so placed as did to noble deeds him waking keep, came with his troop where these two made great haste, by hills, by dales, by stony ways and steep, the carcass of their lord to bear away, when much it wanted not a break of day. The Scots that were of noble Zerban's band, and saw two men go loaden down the plain, make after them a gallop out of hand, in hope to light upon some prey or gain. When Cloridano, spying o'er the land, did say twas best to let the course remain, alleging that it was a foolish trick in saving one dead man to lose too quick, and herewithal his hold he letteth slide, and thinks Medoro would the same have done. He means himself in the next wood to hide, and toward it in great haste he doth run. But good Medoro, that could not abide to leave the office he so late begun, although with double pain and duller pace, with all the burden fled away in chase, and to the wood the nearest way he went in hope to get it ere the horsemen came. But now his breath and strength were so far spent, as they had very near him overtain, yet in his deed he doth no whit relent. To leave his lord he counts it such a shame but they that think this story worth the reading must take a little respite in proceeding end of book eighteen the nineteenth book of orlando furioso this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by thomas copeland Orlando Furioso by Ludovico Ariosto, translated by Sir John Harrington. Book 19. The Argument. Angelica doth heal and wed Medor. Marphisa, with that other worthy crew, lands after travel long upon the shore of Amazons, where, when the law they knew, stout Guidon, that came thither late before, fought with Marphisa, who his nine men slew. But when the combat ceased for want of light, then Guidon prayeth them lodge with him that night. None can deem right who faithful friends do rest while they bear sway and rule in great degree. For then both fast and feigned friends are pressed whose faith seem both of one effect to be. But then revolts the faint and feigned guest when wealth unwinds and fortune seems to flee. But he that loves indeed remaineth fast, and loves and serves when life and all is past. If all men's thoughts were written in their face, 
some one that now the rest doth overcrow some other eke that wants his sovereign's grace when as their prince their inward thoughts should know the meaner man should take the better's place the greater man might stoop and sit below but tell we now how poor medoro sped that loved his master both alive and dead in vain he sought to get him to the wood by blind and narrow paths to him unknown their swift and his slow pace the same withstood forced by the burden that he bare alone but now when cloridano understood medoro's case he made for him great moan and cursed himself and was full ill apaid that he had left his friend devoid of aid medoro all about so straight beset to leave his loved load was then constrained but all in vain he sought for thence to get his master's carcass that behind remained was unto him so fierce and strong a let it stayed his weary steps and him retained even as a bear that would defend her whelp about doth hover though she cannot help so good medor about the course did hover the while that cloridano cometh back and for the day was dawned he might discover how greatly his medor his help did lack wherefore to do his best him to recover he takes his bow and quiver from his back and at a scot he took his aim so well he strake him in the brain that down he fell the fall and death so sudden of the scot amated much the courage of the rest and much they marvelled whence should come this shot and sore this accident did them molest but cloridan for this forbear them not but shot another in about the breast the which inflamed zerbino's mind so sore that for revenge he would have slain medor and fastening in his golden curled hair his warlike hand thou shalt said he abide thou shalt the penance and the burthen bear of him that here hath made my men to die yet for all this zerbino did forbear to kill him when he saw with gracious eye his sweet sad look and hearkened to his speech that in this sort for pardon did beseech sir knight he said for thy messiah's sake i thee do pray and earnestly conjure so much compassion now on me to take to let me give my lord his sepulchre i little care what spoil of me ye make what pains or tortures i myself endure i only sue so long my life to save as i may lay my master in his grave now while medoro spake these words and such whereby zerbino was to mercy moved and to his favor was inclined much as one that gratefulness had ever loved a vile base swain so rudely did him touch as him not only from his place removed but with his staff most rudely overthrew him that every one do deem him dead that view him this fact did so zerbino's mind offend that presently the villain he did chase and to have killed him he did intend and had but that the other fled apace but when that cloridano saw his friend with bleeding wound lie prostrate in the place he means himself no longer now to hide but even to die by dear medoro's side and as he purposed so he did indeed for fighting manfully he there was slain the scots do onward on their way proceed medoro half alive doth now remain and still his breast in woeful sort doth bleed the staff had cut therein so large a vein and sure he had bled out his life and all but for one rare good hap did him befall for lo a damsel came though meanly clad in shepherd's weeds yet fresh and fair of favor and such a one as in those base clothes had a show of princely birth and high behavior she finding him lie there in case so bad did think it charity to be his savior this was if you forget the lady fair that of cataya was undoubted heir i showed you by what hap she gat the ring and how the same had filled her with such pride and her into so high conceit did bring that all her suitors now she flat denied she careth not for earl nor duke nor king orlando she and sacrapent defied but chiefly she would blush and be ashamed if she but happed to hear rinaldo named so great her folly grew so vain her pride as she esteemed all the world at naught the which 
when once the blind boy had espied not blind when any mischief may be wrought he will no longer this presumption bide and for a fit occasion long he sought and finding this he thought himself now sped and up he draws his arrow to the head now when this indian queen did there behold a lovely youth lie dying in the place his body feeble in a mortal cold a deadly pale amid his lively face a kind of passion straight on her took hold that moved her mind to pity this is case and much the rather when he did declare the woeful cause that bred him all this care she having learned of surgery the art an art which still the indians greatly prize which fathers to their children do impart whose knowledge and tradition chiefly lies which without books the children learn by heart i say angelica doth then devise by skill she had in juice of herbs and flowers for to renew medoro's lively powers and calling to her mind she late had seen an herb whose virtue was to stanch the blood as ditomy or some such herb i ween that for such purpose wholesome was and good straightway she seeks this herb upon the green with all the haste and diligence she could and finding it she takes thereof a branch, whose virtue was the course of blood to staunch. Then, coming back again, she met by hap a silly shepherd seeking of his cow, that brake out of his ground at some small gap, and now was strayed he knew not where nor how. She prays him, take the herbs were in her lap, a servitor more fit to serve a sow, and bear her company unto the place where poor Medoro lay in dangerous case then from their horse she and the shepherd light and straight between two tiles those herbs she bruised and took the juice between her fingers bright and so into the wound the same infused whose virtue great revived medoro's sprite to find himself so well and kindly used that doubt it was which most his wound did salve the precious surgeon or the precious salve and now he had recovered so much force as what with hers and with the shepherd's aid he clambered up upon the shepherd's horse albeit in the place so long he stayed until he saw his loved master's course into a grave with cloridanos laid and then and not before he did agree to do as he by her should pointed be from thence unto the shepherd's house she went and made her patient eke with her to go and there to bide with him she was content till he were clearly rid of all his woe but in this while she felt her heart relent with sundry qualms that wanted not be so and when his comely personage she saw a secret heat she felt her heart to gnaw for while she healed his wound another dart did wound her thoughts and high conceits so deep as now therewith was ravished her proud heart possessing it although she wake or sleep her wound to heal there was no herb nor art for more and more like flame the same doth creep yet her chief care is him to help and cure that all this torment doth to her procure thus while medoro better grows and better she feels herself tormented more and more and he that for his life to her was debtor is he alone that plagueth her so sore wherefore though modesty a while did let her yet now perforce no further she forbore but plainly to medoro told her grief and at his hands as plainly asked relief o stout orlando valiant sacripant o fierce ferrah o hundreds more beside where are those valiant acts of which you vaunt where is your pomp your glory and your pride one poor medor all your desires doth daunt one poor medor doth all your power deride and she whom all of you have wooed in vain to woo medoro doth not now disdain she suffers poor medoro take the flower which many sought but none had yet obtained that fragrant rose that to that present hour ungathered was behold medoro gained and over her to give him perfect power with sacred rites a marriage was ordained and with the veil of this so sacred order she covers this her folly and disorder 
Now when the solemn marriage was done, Of which God Cupid asked the bands, I trow, She going forward as she hath begun, Continued there with him a month or mo, From rising to the setting of the sun, With him she doth sit, talk, lie, stand, and go, Forgetting so all maidenly sobriety, That she of him could never have satiety. If in the house she stayed, Then would she crave Medoro in the house with her to stay, if in the field she walk, then must she have Medoro lead or guide her in the way. And by a river in the shady cave they oft did use to spend the heat of day, like to that cave where, shunning stormy weather, the Trojan duke and Dido met together. Amid these joys, as great as joys might be, their manner was on every wall within, without on every stone or shady tree, to grave their names with bodkin, knife, or pin. Angelica and Medor you plain might see, so great a glory had they both therein. Angelica and Medor in every place with sundry knots and wreaths they interlace. Now when she thought in this well-pleasing place she had already made sufficient stay, and for she longed to do Medor that grace to give to him her kingdom of Catay, from when she had been absent so long space, from this poor house she means to go away, yet mind she ere she go her host to please, with whom she found such pleasure and such ease. Angelica had, since she was a girl, worn on her arm, as for Orlando's sake, a bracelet rich of precious stone and pearl, which as a token she of him did take. And, though she had it of this worthy earl, yet did she thereof chiefest reckoning make, not that the giver she did much esteem, but for the gift was rich, and so did seem. By her this bracelet many years was worn, not only in her time of peace and joy, but even when she remained most forlorn, and subject to each danger and annoy. Even then, when naked as ever she was born, the Orho came in hope her to enjoy. This bracelet, wanting store of coin and pence, she gives her host as for a recompense. Next day be time she getteth on her way, And makes Medoro soul her lord and guide. He kept her company both night and day, And none but he with her did go and ride. Their meaning is at Bursalon to stay, A port in Spain, until they may provide a vessel, That with help of oar and wind May them transport from Spanish seas to Ind. But ere they were arrived at this port, they met a madman of his wit bestraught, besmeared with dirt and mire in filthy sort, his outward sense expelled with inward thought. This madman made them but ill-favored sport, and had made worse had he them rightly caught. But as it was, he put them in great danger, and flies at them as dogs do at a stranger. But how she scaped and awaited get, with her new love, Hereafter I declare, for why, Marphisa I may not forget, and those with her that in the tempest are, with Griffin, Aquilant, and Sansonet, and English Duke that hath the horn so rare, which five I left in danger and disease, tossed terribly in the tempestuous seas. Now while the wind continued blowing hard, and of his rage did small or nothing bait, the master sets his compass and his card, And calls to counsel first the master's mate, And then the mariners of best regard, Consulting of the weather and their state, And every one doth tell his guess and thought Near to what coast the tempest hath them brought. Some say Lemiso, Tripoli some say, Some say Satilla, full of rocks and sands, And swear that all of them were cast away, Except they keep aloof from off those lands. This causeth some to curse, and some to pray, And lift to heaven their woeful hearts and hands. Their stuff nor merchandise none care to save, But hurl the same into the greedy wave. Well might they boast of iron heart and breast That could at such a time be void of fear. The stout Marphisa at that time confessed She wished with all her heart not to be there. So sore the swelling seas did them molest, as though it would the ship in pieces tear, nor was there any sign the wind would cease, and that the sea would grant them any peace. 
one vows a journey to the holy tomb another to galicia vows to go unto st james some others unto room or other hallowed places that they know the mariners fear naught but want of room see room they wish then care they for no mo at four days end it cleared and waxed fair or worth the season or their earnest prayer and as the weather grew more clear and clear they did discover plain a goodly coast and to the port as they drew near and near borne in by tide their sails and tackles lost behold a goodly city did appear with towers and stately buildings of great cost of which when once the master was aware it bred in him no little fear and care to cast his anchor straight he doth provide for vain it was to labor to go back the vessel wanted sails to stem the tide the tempest had put all things so to rack and yet he feared on the other side they of the town would sure be on his jack in fine so full his mind was of confusion he knew not whereupon to make conclusion now while he stood confused in this sort the english duke demands what cause of doubt made him refuse so fair and safe a port and strive against the stream to keep still out sir quoth the master briefly to report to you the cause know this that hereabout and namely in that city dwells a nation that use a barbarous and cruel fashion they call them amazons that here do dwell here women guide and rule and govern all the men from government they do expel some they do kill the rest keep bond and thrall he soul shall scape that runs at tilt so well as first to make ten men of theirs to fall and next in venery and flesh delight can satisfy ten women in one night and if a man perform the first of these and have such hap to overthrow the men and yet at night his force do fail to please in act of generation damsels ten he must be killed or drowned in the seas or kept a prisoner in some cave or den but they that both perform shall have their lives and those ten damsels ever for their wives when as the pilot out his tale had told of women that delight in spoil and murder the english duke could hard his laughter hold to hear of so fantastical an order and all the five affirmed straight they wold land at this place and go by sea no further each place to them was safe and out of fear where they might have the use of sword and spear but all the shipmen carried other minds as men that better were to storms in yored and would have thought their lives in waves and winds more than in conflicts and in fights assured but whether reason leads or causes binds or that the better part the same procured the ship with broken mast and tackle torn by force of tide into the haven was borne no sooner was the vessel in the port but straight a galley ready for such need stored with artillery of every sort and one that could both row and sail with speed did board them and to make the matter short a woman clad in grave and ancient weed as old as sibyl or as hector's mother spake in effect these words with many other my friends quoth she or yield or look to die for hope is none to scape away by flight but thus if any of you mean to try if he alone can vanquish ten in fight and afterward with twice five maidens lie and of them maids make women in one night then such a one shall rule among us chief and save his friends from punishment and grief but if that any shall the fact attempt and fail but in the first or in the last then he shall die because of his contempt and into prison ye shall all be cast they made her answer all they were content not one man there was there with all aghast for in both kinds the knights had so been proved as with the danger they were nothing moved the english duke with those three youths of france straight for this enterprise themselves prepare the chief the duke that doubted no mischance by virtue of his book and horn most rare marphisa eke though for the second dance she was not fit so manly mind she bare as she would needs her force and fortune try and swear her sword all weapons should supply 
and straight they all agreed some lots to draw and to conclude on her the hazard fell but she that quite was void of fear and awe did promise to perform her office well this sword quoth she shall abrogate this law and plague them all that in this city dwell and to undo these doubts i will provide as alexander gordius knots untied no foreigner hereafter shall bewail the wicked law of this ungodly land this said she putteth on her coat of mail in hope alone against ten men to stand then came the ten were pointed to assail but he that was the foremost of the band as far as by appearance might be guessed was one that far surpassed all the rest his horse was black as pitch or polished jeet save in one foot and in his brow a star a shining spot of white not very great a lofty rein an eye that threatened war such as the horse such was his own conceit his sorrows did exceed his joys so far and deadly care so drowned his small delight as did the black the little spot of white this knight that ever vantage did eschew would not accompany those other nine but standeth still on horseback taking view which way the victory did most incline marphisa rode a horse of dainty hue given unto her of late by norandine his color pied powdered with many a spot small head fierce look clean limbed and lofty trot now when that given of battle was the sign on her alone all nine at once did fly and she alone sustained the force of nine the tenth i said was quiet standing by as one that did against that use repine when more than one should seek to make one die and with the first encounter thus she sped she laid down four of them on ground for dead the fifth she jostles and by force unhorses and with a trunch the sixth she gave a blow that to the ground both man and horse enforces with mazed head and faltering feet to go the standers by admire her passing forces and chief their wives that saw them kill it so for as a chain shot sweeps all in the way so with those nine marphisa then did play she bathed her blade in blood up to the hilt and with the same their bodies all she mangled all that abode her blows their blood was spilt they scape at best that here and thither wrangled or those whose horses overthrown at tilt lay with their masters on the earth entangled thus of nine enemies remained none for all were killed or maimed or overthrown the knight that was arrayed in black attire and stood aside and saw this hardy fight to show that he for fear did not retire but to make known his curtsy shining bright straight steppeth out and first he doth desire to speak with her whom he esteemed a knight for he could not imagine nor suppose a woman could have given such manly blows and thus he saith meseems the odds too great that i of you should take to fight straightway sith both your horse and you are in a sweat mine offer is to respite you a day till you may be refreshed with rest and meat that with mine honour fight with you i may for i should think myself disgraced sore to vanquish one wearied and spent before wearied and spent quoth she alas the while think you i am so wearied and so spent your courteous offer causeth me to smile to think how quickly you will it repent you do deceive yourself and much beguile to think that i to pause would be content i doubt not you shall find but little cause when you have tried to offer me to pause well said the knight if you will try it straight that you accept i cannot well refuse forthwith two spears of mighty strength and weight were brought and he doth bid marphisa choose now was the sun four hours past his height when as these two began their spears to use the trumpets sound they set their spears in rest and each determining to do their best the spears in spells and sundry pieces flew as if they had been little sticks or cane yet of the blows to both did hurt ensue their steeds were well nigh brought unto their bane quite overthrown in all the people's view as though their legs had quite for them been tain 
so both their horses tumbled on the ground yet both themselves from hurt were safe and sound an hundred and an hundred knights and more mafiza has subdued it was well known yet such a chance she never had before to have her horse so strangely overthrown also the knight that black apparel wore doth marvel whence this great mishap was grown and not a little wondered at her force that had so stoutly overthrown his horse forthwith on foot the combat they apply in which the ton the t'other doth not spare and either thinks to make the other die and either of the other doth beware but all the while among the standers by appeared great attentiveness and care for never could they guess from the beginning which of the two was in best hope of winning now gan marfiza to herself to say it happy was that he before stood still for had he hoped the t'other nine to-day no doubt with me it could have been but ill that now alone so hard doth hold me play as scant i save myself with all my skill thus to herself the stout marfiza thought and all the while courageously she fought contrary to himself the knight thus saith twas well for me that he before was spent for had he been but fresh in perfect breath i doubt me that ere this i had been shent surely thought he i scant had scaped death if he to rest himself had given consent no question i did great advantage take that he refused that offer i did make thus did the combat long twixt them endure and neither party boasted of their gain until the night's dark shadow and obscure did cover city wood and vale and plain but that that rest to all thing doth procure did force them to to respite this their pain and first the night thus said what can we do behold how night is come to part us two you may said he one night prolong your life and longer not such is the cursed law against my will god knows i hold this strife and now i fear and have no little awe lest every one that was to them a wife whom late you killed will from your beds you draw for every one of those unhappy men whom erst you slew was husband unto ten so that for those same nine that you have slain nine times ten women seek revenge to take wherefore i wish that you and all your train within my roof this night abode do make for so perhaps from wrong they will abstain if not for right at least for reverence sake i'll take your offer sir marfiza saith so that hereof to me you give your faith that as in fight you show your value great as i have proved it in this present place so i may find your words without deceit lest falsehood should your noble deeds deface i will accept your lodging and your meat and will persuade my fellows in like case but rather than for fear you should it think let's fight it out by light of torch and link and thus in fine they all of them agreed that unto him that night they would be guest straight to a sumptuous palace they proceed by torchlight brought to chambers richly dressed but when that each put off their warlike weed then each of them with wonder was possessed she that the knight did by his face appear to be a boy of age but eighteen year and he when by her hair her sex he knew wondered to see a woman of such might as namely that in sight nine tall men slew and after had with him prolonged the fight and either pleased with the other's view behold the one the other with delight then each desired the other's name to learn as in the ensuing book you shall discern End of book 19The twentieth book of Orlando Furioso. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland. Orlando Furioso by Ludovico Ariosto. Translated by Sir John Harrington. Book 20. The Argument. With Guidon, all his worthy guests agree to break from the Amazons the morrow morn. Astolfo, doubting lest it would not be, doth drive them thence, and scares them with his horn. Zerbino laughs, Cabrina gay to see. Marfiza seems to take it in great scorn, 
and against his will commits her to his guiding, by whom he hears of Isabella tiding. Right wondrous deeds by diverse dames were done in times of old, as well by sword as pen, whereby their glory shined like the sun, and famous was, both far and near, as then the fame, Harpology and battle won. Camilla's worth is eke well known to men, Corinna's praise and Sappho's are discerned above the rest, because they both were learned. What art so deep, what science is so high, but worthy women have thereto attained? Who list in stories old to look, may try and find my speech herein not false nor feigned. And though of late they seem not to come nigh the praise their sex in former times have gained, no doubt the fault is either in backbiters or want of skill and judgment in the writers. For sure I see in this our present age such virtuous parts in their sweet sex to grow, the young so sober and the rest so sage, and all so chaste as writers shall, I know, have work enough to fill full many a page with their great praise that from their worth will flow. To win the fame their ancestors did lease, and pass Marphisa not in few degrees. But now to turn my speech to her again, I say that when the knight did ask her name, she made him answer, and did not disdain to tell both what she was and when she came, yet as her fashion was, both brief and plain. She saith thus to the knight, I call it am Marphisa, and she need to say no more, for all the world had heard the rest before. The t'other, when his turn to speak came in, first making long and farther circumstance, in such like manner doth his tale begin, and sighing deep. You all have heard, perchance, both of my father's house and of my kin, of fame in Italy, in Spain, and France, who sure I am the house of Claremont in all the world is known and of account. He that Carello and Membrino slew, and did their kingdoms ruin and deface, out of one stock with me together grew, although we were not all born in one place. For why at Ister flood, to tell you true, my father me begat, and in that case my mother great with child he left behind, and went to France by help of sail and wine. Thus seventeen years I lived like one exiled, until I able was to break a lance, and for that place me seemed too base and viled, I mean to seek my friends and kin in France. They name me Guidon, savage of a child. As yet I could not much my name advance, for hither by a tempest I was born, as you were now, with ship and tackle torn. Here first Argillon with nine men I killed, eleven months since, and that same day, at night, the office of an husband I fulfilled unto ten Amazons in flesh delight. This done, to take my choice, then was I willed, of any ten that pleased best my sight and these remain my wives, and must until one come that me with other nine can kill. Unto the knights this seemed a marvellous story, and much they wondered at this government. They marvel that so great a territory for want of men was not consumed and spent. They thought no less the women would be sorry for want of men to live so continent. T'was strange one man sufficed ten of these, Sith one with us can scant one woman, please. And straight they were inquisitive to know when first this foolish order there began, and upon what occasion it grow that women in that country ruled man. Then Guiden answered thus, I shall you show the whole discourse as briefly as I can, according as myself have heard the same, since, by mishap, into this realm I came. When as the Greeks had quite defaced Troy, and after twice ten years returned home, for ten whole years in danger and annoy of surging seas they up and down did roam, they found their wives, that had but little joy so long a time to live and lie alone, each one a lusty lover to have chosen, lest with the cold they might be starved and frozen. Their houses full of bastard brats they see. In fine, they purpose, after consultation, to pardon all their wives and set them free. But for these boys that bred some alteration, to drive them out a door they do agree, and make them seek a foreign habitation. It was contrary much to their desires that others' brats should warm them at their fires, thus some thrown out, 
some close their mothers keep in corners from their angry husband's sight and when as elder years on them do creep each one betakes him to his most delight some plough some get them herds of goats and sheep some sciences and some do learn to fight thus every one betook him to some trade as he assigns that all the world hath made among the rest that art of war ensue Philanto, son of Clytemnestra, queen, but eighteen years of age and fresh of hue, and in the flower of youth's well-pleasing green, this one to him an hundred gallons drew, and getting ships and things that needful been, with writs of mart, a thing that breeds much sorrow, he gets him to the sea in mind to borrow. Now, while Philanto with his cursed fleet abode at sea, with that more cursed train, it fortuned at that time that they of Crete had Idumeo driven out of his reign, wherefore, for better strength, they thought it meet Phelanto and his men to entertain. They give to him great hire and great reward, the city of Detea for to guard. Detea was a town of great estate, rich and frequented with no small resort, and yields in plenty large, betimes and late, of sundry kinds of pleasure and of sport. And as they all men use, so in like rate they used their soldiers in so friendly sort as though they had agreed by sound accords to make them all their masters and their lords but chief they found with women so great grace as they wan most of them unto their lure but when the wars were ended in short space and that their pay no longer did endure they all prepared to leave this pleasant place which to the damsels did great grief procure to lease their husbands brother or their father than these new lovers every one had rather and when they saw they could not make them stay by no device of theirs nor no request they do agree with them to steal away and take such things as were of value best thus came these damsels loaden with their prey and thence to sea and were now gone at less than hundred leagues with these new lawless lovers before detea this their flight discovers the wind so good then for their purpose blew, Philanto quickly landed in this coast, and here the amorous and wanton crew unto their loves of this their lewdness boast. But now that saying was confirmed true that pleasant things do often cloy the most, and there can be a greater clog to no man than to be weary of a wanton woman. Wherefore, like men that were and had been ever of gain most greedy, sparing of expense, they secretly consulting do endeavor to take the goods and then to steal from thence thus while the women still in love persever they that regard not pleasure more than pence load with their wealth of which there was good store stale to the sea and left them on the shore sore were the damsels daunted and dismayed when once they saw their loves of them forsaken for what more spite can be than be betrayed of him to whom one hath herself taken and if they find that weeping doth not aid they mean the time some order shall be taken what they shall do and how hereafter live and every one doth straight her verdict give one home to turn again doth think it best and to their kin and friends them to submit and with repentance pardon to request and vow the like fault never to commit another that good motion doth detest and swears it showed the mover had no wit and that with greater honesty or ease they might go drown them headlong in the seas among the rest one orantea hight that lineally of minos was descended and passed the rest in beauty and good sprite and had less grievously than they offended for to philanto she her troth did plight and to have been his honest spouse intended this one declareth thus her resolution and makes the rest put it in execution she wishes them to tarry in this land that had both fruitful earth and pleasant air, and fountains sweet and woods on every hand, and meadows green and pastures fresh and fair, beside large havens where ships at ease might stand, to which the merchants often made repair, by tempests driven well loaden with good traffic of things that come from Egypt and from Africa. Wherefore this place she minds not to forsake, but that they may, as chiefly they desire, a sharp revenge on men for ever take. They vow to put to sack, to sword and fire, such ships as to their haven repair do make, and kill the men, 
and this they all conspire, and still, when any come, this trade they use, nor left a man alive to carry news. But when this cruel law some years had lasted, which they had meant to have confirmed for A, they find that they so fast consumed and wasted, that this their barren kingdom would decay, except to find some remedy they hasted. And having long consulted on the way, they mean of this their law to bait some rigor, yet leave the substance still in strength and vigor. And thus they do, they choose among such men as tempests drive to this their wicked nation, some few, as were so lusty, as with ten they could perform the act of generation all in one night. The rest into a den they cast and kill them in most cruel fashion, and build unto revenge a solemn altar, and over this they make them stretch and halter. Such men as live are to this order sworn to kill all such as heather shall repair, and all men children that to them are born they sell or change as in an open fair. So when some die with age and weakness worn, then other women do the want repair. Their power and number thus doth still increase, their wealth and pomp augmented with long peace. But after many years it thus befell, Elbanio, one of Hercules' noble race, a comely, tall, strong man, and favored well, and in his speech and manners passing grace, arrived where these homicides do dwell, and ere he knew the fashion of the place, the cruel sergeants took him as they found him, and like a felon hand and foot they bound him. It fortuned, as they carried him to slaughter, among the rest that did the same behold, was Alessandra, Orantea's daughter, a fine young girl, about twice eight year old. Elbanio, humbly as he went, besought her to be a mean this foul death to withhold, that like a man he might be killed at least, and not be drawn to slaughter like a beast. To beg my life, quoth he, it were a vanity, which in your service I would gladly spend, where human hearts be void of all humanity, but all the suit that I to make intend, which to deny were too, too much humanity, is this, that thus my life I may not end, but with my sword in hand, to fight with men, with seven at once, or eight, or nine, or ten. This he to her. Thus she to him replies, Though to mankind we all profess hostility, yet think not, this she spake with watery eyes, that all our hearts are void of all gentility. What progne or Medea could despise your passing beauty, courage, and nobility? And were my fellows all so ill-inclined, yet I myself would bear a better mind. And though the rigor of our law be such that no man can obtain a pardon free, and even this small you ask to grant is much, if our law strictly should observe it be, yet such remorse I feel my heart has touched to grant thy suit, if others will agree although I fear thou wilt in such a strife prolong thy pain, and not preserve thy life. O, oh, said Albanio, blessed were such a day, that in the field my manhood I might try. Could but your credit carry such a sway, not ten, but ten times ten I would defy. This said, she caused the execution stay, and to her mother goes she by and by with thousand stings of Cupid in her breast, and unto her expoundeth his request. Straight Orantea doth her counsel call, and in such sort thereof to them she spake. In guarding of our haven and city wall tis good that of the strongest men we take. Therefore, to know who be most stout and tall, I think it very good some proof to make. For else we shall unto ourselves do wrong, to save the weaker man and kill the strong. And who can wish to make a better trial than for one man to fight with five and five? And if he vanquish them and make them die all, to assert his meat he should be kept alive. Thus Orantea said, and they reply all, that in this point with her they cannot strive, save old Artemia carron withered jade misliked the motion and this answer made the cause that first we did some men admit was not to keep our havens or city wall for we ourselves have strength enough and wit to keep our town i trust and ever shall were we as well for procreation fit without man's help not one should live at all 
now for necessity some few we spare such as most able for that service are this motion quite gainsayeth our ancient law to keep one man as strong as half a score how many women would he keep in awe had we ten such we should bear rule no more and further tis an old and certain saw both used and proved many years before that they that give a weapon to their stronger are like themselves to carry rule no longer but put the case this one by our consent and his good hap ten of the others kill how shall an hundred widows then lament that long must lie alone against their will if he an hundred women would content then him to save i should not think it ill then were he to be loved admired and wondered if he alone could satisfy an hundred this cruel speech did all the rest displease and loath they were albanio should be slain his comely shape their sharpness did appease and chiefly she that over all did reign doth seek herein her daughter's mind to please with many reasons answering her again and point by point did all her speech confute and in the end obtained her daughter's suit thus to albanio pardon they impart provided if he overcome the men and after bravely play the husband's part not with an hundred women but with ten albanio thanketh them with cheerful heart then was he freely loosed from the den in fine when all things ready were ordained in both exploits the conquest he obtained then alessandra in whose tender mind love had already made so deep impression with other nine were unto him assigned and princely mace was put in his possession but first by solemn vow they do him bind to hold this law for ever by succession to sacrifice all men save such as tried to kill ten men and with ten women lie and though that many have in ages past attempted both yet few have had success to scape the first exploit and try the last in which to fail the danger were no less but he that both performs forthwith is placed in princely seat and free from all distress and this their law as by records appears already lasted has two thousand years the last but i that held this cursed place argillon height whom i in combat killed and him and his thereby I did displace and then their rooms with me and mine i fill it where we have tarried now a twelve months space among these whites of goodness all unskilled and lead a life full of disdain and scorn as better had been never to be born for why these dallyings and wanton toys that wanted are to please our foolish youth with costly fair gay clothes and venus toys of which repentance is the fruit and youth doth breed to me but anguish and noise and pensive cares and ever during ruth and chiefly when unto my mind i call my liberty is lost and i a thrall to lose my lusty time in this vile place removed from kin and friends and country far a woeful and remediless disgrace moved by some ill aspect of angry star even as a stallion kept for breed and race whom some mishap hath made unfit for war by loss of sight and foundering of his feet for service quite unable and unmeet the while this tale the savage guide untold the english duke that all this while stood by and heard his speech and did his face behold and noted all his grace with watchful eye and made by all these observations bold he runneth to embrace him by and by and said dear cousin i were much to blame except i loved the house from whence you came your mother could not tie a better lace about your neck to make your lineage known than this your value in this present place against marfisa in the battle shown i am of stolfo one of ammon's race friend to your house and kinsman of your own i much rejoice to find by this mischance so near a kinsman so far off from france but he that otherwise would have been glad to meet a friend a prince of kin so near now on the other side he was full sad and showed the same in countenance and cheer for every way the sequel must be bad 
for if he win they die the case is clear and if he do not win he is but dead thus by one's good the t'other's harm is bred on the other side his years and tender age did all of them so far with pity move and did marphisa's heat so much assuage her enmity was well nigh turned to love at last she makes a motion wise and sage which was that all to escape by force should prove she swears if he would take part with his cousin not all the town could vanquish that half dozen most glad said guiden i would take your part though vain it is against so great a number to enterprise by force hence to depart their very multitude will us so cumber for often to the terror of mine heart ten thousand armed women i do number here in the streets and with as many more they do defend the port the haven and shore tush quoth marphisa this i not regard were they in number as the sands of seas to valiant hearts no enterprise is hard take you but part and join with me in these yes answered guiden be i made or marred or beat with pain with danger or dis-ease i will take part with you but if i may i would advise you to a safer way if we this matter wisely take in hand this is the safest way that i do know they let no man to touch the salt sea sand lest any should attempt from hence to go and sith tis hard their forces to withstand i'll try a better way than that i trow among my ten i have one special wife upon whose trust i venture dare my life she shall a bark provide in secret sort and other needful things for us prepare and when as to the tilt yard they resort and of our fight in expectation are we suddenly will make unto the port and ship ourselves ere any be aware to lead the way myself i am content so you and yours to follow will consent marphisa straight and all the rest agreed that guiden for that time should be their guide and that accordingly they would proceed as he for them had promised to provide though said marphisa saving this my weed my shape and sex from all of them to hide i know myself from harm could be excused and of them all both welcome and well used but now said she such part i mind to take as you shall taste how good or bad it prove that night with his alaria guide and spake so was her name that bare him chiefest love and points that she provision good should make for things that needful were for their remove and she no time nor pain nor travel spared but out of hand a galley straight prepared and that her fellows might no fraud suspect to go to seek a prize she doth pretend and with great diligence she doth direct all means to serve their passage to defend and they within no time nor mean neglect to bring their stout designment to an end thus every one their charge so well attended that ere the morning all was done and ended no sooner came the dawning of the day but that those amazons like bees in swarms that seek new dwellings in the month of may so came they well appointed all in arms to see an end of that unended fray not looking for such new and strange alarms for straight those six i named and all their train came with intent to scape or else be slain first guiden breaks the way to all the rest soon after him marphisa doth ensue then sansonet and the english duke were pressed and next two brothers came then all the crew but yet with numbers they were so oppressed both with the shafts they shot and darts they threw that notwithstanding all they had devised they were in danger great to be surprised but when the english duke the danger saw unto himself these words or such he said i see our foes in troops together draw i see our friends are weakened and dismayed now will i strike our enemies in awe now will i bring our friends unlooked for aid with this he took his horn and blew a blast that made the hearers every one aghast 
so great a terror in their minds was bred that straight as if with spirits they had been scared this way and that confusedly they fled and left the gates without defence or guard as tumults often are at stage plays bred when false reports of sudden fires are heard or when the overloaden seats do crack one tumbling down upon another's back one breaks a leg another breaks an arm and some are choked and stifled in the press some kill themselves for fear of further harm, and whence the danger comes they cannot guess. But all of them in haste themselves unarm, and unto fearful flight themselves address. Nor women only with this fear are punished, but even the men themselves are all astonished. Yea, even Marphisa's courage late so fierce, so great a virtue this enchantment had, that strange and sudden fear the same did pierce, and she by flight to save herself was glad. The knights likewise, whom late I did rehearse, and all the men, as if they had been mad, to seaward fled, as doth a fearful dove, when any noise doth scare her from above. Thus doth the blast annoy both friends and foes, yet so as all the men to shipboard went. Astolfo still about the city goes, for them to terrify is his intent, and more and more in all the streets he blows, and chiefly those where they do most frequent the whiles his friends were now to shipboard gotten and launched out and him had quite forgotten the ship alaria did before provide and guiden taking ship with all the rest would not consent near to the shore to bide but stale away with dreadful fear possessed now came the duke unto the water side and seeing all were gone he thought it best some other mean and way to take in hand by which he might convey him home by land but how he got him home, and there did speed, when from those countries he was come to France, and how his horn did stand him in great need, defending him from danger and mischance, hereafter I will show. Now I proceed to her whose deeds do still her name advance, I mean Marphisa stout, that made great haste to shun the hearing of the fearful blast. But when they were removed from the shore by help of sails and oars so great a space, and now the fearful sound was heard no more, each thought them guilty of a great disgrace, and of their fear they were ashamed so sore, one shunned to look another in the face, the while their bark had so good wind and weather, as all arrived a tyrant seas together. And to Marsilia thence by sea they went, where Bradamant bare all the rule and sway, who late as governess was thither sent, though late she had been absent many a day, for had she present been, by her assent unentertained they should not go away. Here, when they were refreshed with meat and rest, Marphisa took her leave of all the rest, and said she thought it great disgrace and shame so many in one company to see. For crows, quoth she, and pigeons do the same, and deer and sheep and beasts that fearful be, but falcons that do fly at stately game, with other birds and beasts in their degree, that fear not others' force, and trust their own, shun company, and love to go alone. But yet the rest that were of other mind, together kept and bade the dame farewell, until by hap a castle they did find, wherein a lord of great estate did dwell, that in appearance courteous seemed and kind, but not in acts, as after I shall tell. For he surprised them all that night asleep, and made them swear a cruel law to keep. The while Marphisa on her way doth ride, apparelled like a knight of some renown, and as she passed by the riverside she met a woman in a tawny gown, ill-favoured, crooked, old, and hollow-eyed, her forehead furrowed with continual frown, her body tired with travel and ill-fare, her guilty mind afflicted more with care. This filthy hag, this Karen withered jade, was she whom in the cave Orlando found, when of the thieves such massacre he made, that kept fair Isabella underground. This wretch that hoped them in that wicked trade, and feared the plague that might on her redound, fled from all company for fear of danger, until she happed to light upon this stranger. And, for she saw her clad in strange array, though graceless, yet she gathers heart of grace, and at the ford her coming she doth stay, and when Marphisa came unto the place, Sir Knight, for so she seemed, I shall you pray, said this old hag, to do me so much grace, that on your horse behind you I may ride, 
till I be past the stream on the other side. Marphisa, that was ever from her cradle of courteous kind, doth grant her her desire, and made her clamour up behind her saddle to pass the river, and a filthy mire that to her horse had almost been a stable. And when they were ascended somewhat higher, they met a fair young lady with a knight, both richly clad, both comely to the sight, but both their minds were false, their manners bad, and therefore matched together very fit. For he was Pinabel that lately had fair Bradamant deceived at Merlin's pit. She was his love, for whom he was so sad, when Bradamant on him did hap to hit, till after, by this noble damsel's mean, that strange enchantment was dissolved clean. This lady that was Pinabello's love, and was both proud and scornful of behavior, and sees this hag, did straight her laughter move to scorn her rithled skin and evil favor for which Marphisa stout doth her reprove, and with a sharp reply she straight doth brave her. Because, quoth she, I find thou dost disdain her, against thy knight and thee I will maintain her. I say this woman fairer is than thou. Now let thy knight come fight in thy defence, for I by force my saying will avow, and if that I prevail, ere thou go hence, thou shalt thy horse and garments all allow to this old woman for a recompense. Then Pinabel to fight doth him address, because in manhood he could do no less. But when they met, Marphisa's passing force was such, she quickly vanquished the knight and overthrew him quite beside his horse. This done, she makes the stately dame to light, and with the aged woman's clothes to scorse, at which the ton took sport, the t'other spite. She took likewise the lady's ambling nag, and thereupon she sets the trotting hag who in this youthful tire and rich array doth look in show more ugly than before thus three days with marphisa she did stay before they happed to meet with any more the fourth they met sir bino on the way the scottish prince that would have saved medore and now in anger great the scot pursued that in his presence proved himself so rude now though sir bino were but ill apaid Yet was he straight with laughter great surprised to see an aged woman so arrayed in youthful clothes, as though she were disguised. And to Marphisa merrily he said, Sir Knight, it seemeth you are well advised to get so fair a piece to carry by you, as you are sure that no man will envy you. The woman seemed some hundred years of age, her withered skin such store of wrinkles had and like an ape or monkey in a cage, so looked she in this apparel clad. But now she looked worse, when with new rage her eyes inflamed were, and she half mad. For what more spite can be a woman told, than if one say she looketh foul and old? Marphisa seemeth wroth to make some sport, and thus she said, Sir, cease your slanderous tongue, your virtue of her beauty cometh short she is in spite of you both fair and young and if you dare contrary my report or that hereby you feel your courage stung i will maintain against you every word on horse or foot by spear or else by sword so bino at this challenge did but laugh and said he would not lease their friendship so tis fit quoth he that swine should feed on draught i am not i so mad and fond i trow for her to draw a sword or break a staff, but as you came you may together go. No doubt you are a fitly matched pair, if you as lusty be as she is fair, wherefore I list not pain and travel take to get a conquest better lost than one. Then, answered stout Marphisa, I will make another offer which you may not shun. On this condition let us for her sake a course at field one with the other run that if you win then i will keep her still if i then you shall serve her while she will content quoth zurban and with that they ran with couched spears and met amid the plain but zurban had the worse marphisa wan as better horsed and stronger of the twain who seeing zurban down she then began to talk with him and jest with him again behold quoth she I here to you present this lovely damsel for your more content. Now see you keep your promise and your troth to this fair dame to be a champion true, and do not break the bands of sacred oath. 
And so, quoth she, for now I bid adieu. Zerban was moved with shame and anger both, shame for his foil, a thing most strange and new, and wrath for her whom he thereby did gain, which he might deem the greater loss of twain. Then of his mistress knew he doth inquire what knight it was that did him overthrow. She willingly did grant him his desire, supposing so his grief might greater grow. It was a lady in a knight's attire, Marfisa hight, quoth she, that laid you low. The which strange news I think not much did lack to make his armor blush upon his back. Upon his horse in anger great he gets and cursed himself he had not set more sure he bites his lips and inwardly he frets and she in him more anger to procure with biting words his discontentment wets yet he doth for his oath's sake all endure like tired horse he quiet all abides that hath the bit in mouth and spurs in sides at last into this bitter plaint he burst on thee, O fortune, well I may complain, and call myself unhappy and accursed, that dost at once two plagues for me ordain, two plagues, that of all plagues I count the worst. At first this foil, my former fame to stain, and having lost a lady of rare features, to have this mistress foulest of all creatures. She who surpassing beauty well deserved all worldly bliss, whose match was never found, she from misfortune could not be preserved, but that by cruel storms she must be drowned. And this, who, if she had been rightly served, ought long ere this have fed worms underground, thou hast these many years, and still dost save, that I by her at last this plague might have. By these and such like words as Urban spake, that aged woman gives a sure guess that this was he to whom and for whose sake fair Isabel, kept erst in great distress there where Orlando did from thieves her take, was wont so great affection to profess, and to describe his parts and shape so true as every one might know him at a view. And now that by his word she plainly found that this was Zerban, and that he believed fair isabella was in tempest drowned with which conceit she saw he sore was grieved she that did know her to be safe and sound yet meaning not his grief should be relieved she telleth only that that would disease him and doth conceal that which she thought would please him you sir quoth she that me so greatly scorn if you but knew what tidings I could tell of her whom you lament as dead and lorn, you would both speak me fair and use me well. But first I will with horses wild be torn and suffer all the pains of earth and hell before that I will condescend to show it, or then by me you ever come to know it. Look how a gentle ground that doth assail and flies upon a stranger at the first will on the sudden fawn and wag his tail, if so of bread one proffer him across. So Zerban, that before on her did rail, and bitterly unto her face her cursed, now he entreats her, and doth pray and flatter, to give him farther notice of the matter. At last with long entreaty she replies, and saith, Fair Isabella is not dead, but so she lives, that sure she death envies, and never hope to have her maidenhead for i have seen quoth she with these mine eyes how twenty lawless men her captive led and every one might have her at their pleasure as having liberty and lust and leisure ah wicked hag thou know'st it is a lie and yet behold how thou canst paint it out thou know'st that none of them with her did lie thou know'st orlando thence did fetch her out and made the malefactors all to die that of her danger now there was no doubt but now alas this lying story bred a thousand jealousies in zerbin's head he asked her where and when his love she saw he speaks her oftentimes both foul and fair but not a word more could he from her draw neither by threatening words nor yet by prayer he feels a corsy cold his heart to gnaw, his little hope he turned to great despair, and thus this old ill-favoured spiteful callot gave good Zerbino such a choking salad. What patience thus provoked could have borne at such a woman's hand so vile a spite? And, save he was unto her service sworn, no doubt he would have done her then her right. 
thus she of malice full and he of scorn went on their way until they met a knight but what became hereof if you will know the book ensuing shall the sequel show end of book twenty the twenty-first book of orlando furioso this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by thomas copeland orlando furioso by ludovico ariosto translated by sir john harrington book twenty one the argument most worthy zurban by his promise bound defends gabrina most unworthy wight and for her sake he overthrows to ground hermonida unlucky flemish knight who doth to him her most lewd life expound increasing by his speech her cruel spite yet still the good zerbino travels with her and many a weary mile they rode together nor iron nails make fast a plank or board more firm nor cords a burden surer bind than faith once given by promise or by word ties most assuredly the virtuous mind old times to us good store of samples ford how praise divine was unto faith assigned and how in garments white she still was painted that each small spot or stain might show her tainted faith ever should be kept in sacred sort although to one or whether given to more although in deserts far from all resort or else a judge or multitude before what though the witness wants to make report yet must we keep our covenant evermore as well by word and private protestation as by record and public obligation and so did zerpin as before i told his promise firm unviolate preserve and though gabrina was both foul and old though her misdeeds all rigor did deserve yet he his faith and promise firm doth hold and left his former business her to serve till as they travelled on the way by chance they met a flemish knight late come to france this knight of stature comely was and tall and in his shield he bare an azure bend his name Hermonida they used to call it seemed he was not this old woman's friend for straight his sight her heart did so appall unto her guide her life she doth commend and prayed him as he promised to vouchsafe from this her enemy to keep her safe this man quoth she my guiltless father killed for malice only that to me he bare this man my only brother's blood hath spilled because he wished my safety and welfare yet with revenge his rage cannot be filled but still he seeks to work my farther care well quoth zerbino be of better cheer for none shall do thee harm whilst i am here now when the knight of flanders saw that face that of all faces he did most detest with me to combat in this present place you must prepare quoth he and try your best or yield to me this woman void of grace that as she hath deserved she may be dressed if you resistance make you will be slain for so it falls to such as wrong maintain zerbino courteously doth thus reply bethink yourself with more consideration to make a woman of your hand to die what stain it is to knightly reputation as for the combat if you needs will try her to defend is my determination for i am sworn to fight in her defence and therefore cannot with mine oath dispense this and to this effect much more in vain he spake him from his purpose to persuade at last they were so kindled with disdain that one the other fiercely did invade zerbino was the stronger of the twain and strake the t'other through the shoulder blade so as he fell half dead and half alive not able any more with him to strive but zerban doubting lest he had been dead with much compassion from his horse did light and first he loosed his helmet from his head and seeketh to revive him if he might who looking firmly on zerbino said i cannot much lament that such a knight hath hurt me in this fight and overthrown in whom such value and such worth is shown in this alone my hap i do lament that it should be for such a woman's sake and much i marvel that you would consent to your protection such a one to take which i am sure you would full sore repent 
if I to you her deed should open make, and that you should so greatly damage me for such a wicked caitiff as is she, and, save my voice and strength will fail, I doubt, before my tale can come to perfect end, I will declare, if you will hear me out, the wicked life of this ungracious fend. I had a brother, valorous and stout, in Holland born, who, for he did intend to win by service, honor, and renown, Heracleo served that bear of Greece the crown. A noble gentleman, Argeo hight, near the confines of Servia to dwell, who in my brother took so great delight that in short space they were acquainted well. Argeo married had this cursed wight, of whom the present story I do tell, and took in her unworthy so great pleasure as passed the bands of reason and of measure. But she, more light than leaves in autumn season, that every blast doth blow about and change, against all wifely care, all cause and reason, because she doth delight herself in change, with wicked heart and head full fraught with treason, so far she lets her raging love to range, she sues to have my brother to her lover, and doth to him the foul desire uncover. But neither doth a rock more firmly stand upon the shore against the surging wave, nor doth the cedar more upon the land resist the tempest, that doth rage and rave, than doth my brother her desire withstand, though she at sundry times the same doth crave. And though she seeketh many a mean and trial, yet still she turneth with a flat denial. At last it fell, as oft it doth befall to valiant men that love to fight and quarrel, my brother was sore wounded in a brawl, so that it seemed his life was in some peril. Wherefore he gets within the castle wall, both that his friend might know and venge his quarrel, and other needful things may be procured, by which his hurt might be the sooner cured. Now, while my brother stayed in this ill state, his friend Argeo, some time absent thence, this woman early visits him and late, and offers him good store of pounds and pence. But he, that always villainy did hate, and would not do his friend so great offence, thought, as in evil cases is the best, of two great mischiefs to choose out the less. He means to leave our jail's friendship quite, and get him home again from whence he came, or hide himself where this most wicked wight shall never see his face nor hear his name. This, though it grieved him, as it ought of right, he chooseth as a way less worthy blame than yielding to her lust, for to abuse her, or to her loving husband to accuse her. Wherefore, though of his wound both faint and weak, he doth resolve to part with constant mind. He gets him thence, and not a word doth speak, and leaves this filthy-minded beast behind. But fortune ill his purpose good doth break, and altered quite the course he had designed. Home came her husband, finding her alone, complaining grievously and making moan. Her cheeks with tears all blubbered were and red, her looks did show her mind was ill apaid, her locks all torn did hang about her head, with which her loving husband, sore afraid, did ask her oft what chance such change had bred, till at the length the wicked wretch thus said with spiteful heart and fearful voice and trembling, and feigned a cause, the cause itself dissembling. Alas, quoth she, what should I seek to hide my wicked act and heinous deadly sin, which, though from you and all the world beside I could conceal, yet doth the soul within and conscience grudge a burden such to bide, so as the inward torment I am in doth pass the plague or penance far away that mortal man upon my sin can lay if so a sin of right you may have named, that one is forced unto against her will. But thus it is, your friend that hither came, I thinking he had thought nor meant none ill, enforced me to my perpetual shame against all laws, all honesty and skill, and doubting that I would the fact bewray, forthwith he gate him hence and fled away. But though my body he have so defiled, Yet is my mind from sin devoid and clear, Although from sight of men I am exiled, Nor dare I once in public place appear. 
This said, with thousand names she him reviled, So that Argeo, that the tale did hear, Believed it, and straight with all intended To punish him that never had offended. He taketh horse forthwith, and followeth post, All on revenge his mind was wholly bent, And for he perfectly did know the coast, And for my brother fair and softly went, He met him in an hour at the most, Bidding him stand, or else he should be shent. My brother would dissuade him if he might, but all in vain. Our jail needs would fight. The tongue was strong and full of fresh disdain, the t'other weak and loath to hurt his friend, so that himself defending long in vain, my brother was constrained to yield in the end. And thus, at last, he prisoner doth remain, and yields himself unable to defend. Which scene, our jail doth surcease to strike, but speaketh unto him these words or like. God, never let my heart so far be moved with rightful wrath that I thy blood should spill, since once I thee esteemed well and louved. Whom once I louved, I will never kill. And, though thy act may justly be reproved, the world shall see my goodness by thine ill. For, be it love or be it in disdain, I will be found the better of the twain. Another mean than death to use I mind in punishing this sin and foul misdeed. This said, with willow bands he there did find, he makes a hurdle fit to serve such need, on which my brother's body he doth bind, that with old hurts and new did freshly bleed, and to his castle he doth him convey, in mind to keep him there a prisoner a. Yet, though with him a prisoner he remained, in other things he felt no lack nor want, save that his liberty was him restrained. But lo, this wretch that late did him supplant, and to her husband so of him complained, thought she would try if he would yet recant, and, for at her command she had the case, she goes to him, and thus to him she says, Now, sir, quoth she, I trust you feel the fruit that this your foolish constancy hath wrought. Had you not better been to grant the suit that I in friendly sort so often sought? You see, tis vain to argue or dispute. Say what you can. You are a traitor thought, and he to whom you showed so great fidelity imputes to you treason and infidelity. I think, both for your ease and reputation, you had been better granted my request. You see, you have a sorry habitation, and in the same for ever look to rest, except you change your first determination and mollify your stony-hearted breast, which, if you yet will do, I do assure you, both liberty and credit to procure you. No, never hope, no, said Philandro, never so my unhappy brother's name they call, in vain to change my mind you do endeavor, and though Archeo causeless keep me thrall, yet I in faith and troth will still persever. Sufficeth me that he that seeth all doth know mine innocency, and doth see me, and when he list can both reward and free me. I care not though the world of me think ill, I hope another world will make amends. Yet let Archeo slay me if he will, or let him, as it seemeth he intends, though wrongfully, in prison hold me still. Yet one day he will find he hurts his friends, and know by proof how he hath been beguiled when truth appears and time brings forth her child. Yet for all this, this woman, void of shame, did cease no whit Philandro still to tempt and oftentimes in vain to him she came, and ever turns repulsed and with contempt. And in this frantic fancy she doth frame a thousand slights to further her attempt, and many things in mind she doth revolve before on any one she do resolve. Six months entire she doth herself absent, nor ever came Philandro to entice which made him hope that she was now content to cease her suit and follow his advice. But lo, how fortune that is ever bent to further wicked persons in their vice doth unto her a fit occasion lend to bring her wicked lust to woeful end. 
There had been hate and enmity of old between her husband and another knight, Mirando called, who often would be bold, if so Argeo absent were a knight, to come with force and to assault his hold, or thereabout to do him some despite. But if he were at home, then all that whiles he came not near him by a dozen miles. Wherefore to be revenged on this his foe, that often did him wrong and great outrage, Argeo gives it out that he will go unto Jerusalem on pilgrimage, and from his house disguised he parted so in secret sort, without or man or page, and every knight comes in at the postern, that none but she his coming might discern. Thus all the day he wanders all about, in woods, in groves, in pastures here and thither, to see if he could find Morando out, that in his absence used to come hither and far he keeps himself from any rout until the darkness doth obscure the weather. Then would he get him home a secret way of which his wife did keep a privy kay. Thus all but she Argeo absent thought, by which his wicked wife with wanted skill another means and new occasion sought to bring to pass her foul unbridled will. With weeping eyes, her eyes to weep she taught, and all with tears her bosom she doth fill. Then came she to my brother, and complained that, but he help, her honor would be stained. Nor mine alone, but mine Argeo's too. Who were he here, quoth she, I would not care. You know what harm Miranda wants to do, when as mine husband's absence makes him dare, and now, behold, the caitiff me doth woo and to entrap me sets full many a snare, and offered servants great reward and hire, so they would help to further his desire. And hearing that our jail was away, and would continue so no little space, he came within the castle wall to-day. His absence gave him so much heart of grace, where had my husband been but in the way, he durst not only not have showed his face, but sure he would not have presumed at all to come within a kenning of the wall and what by message he before had done now face to face by mouth he doth the same so as i hardly know which way to shun that which to do would breed my endless blame had not my sugared speech his favor won by feigning i my will to his would frame he would perforce have had his foul intent which now he hopes to got by my assent i promised him but promise made for fear is void and i performance never meant but so that act I made him to forbear, which he to do by force was fully bent. Now if you be a friend, or ever were unto our jail, you may this prevent, nor only save mine honor thus distressed, but his, to whom such love you have professed. Which if you me deny, then I may say not honesty, of which your boast you make, but cruelty did cause you say me nay, and of my suit so small regard to take, and that you were not moved any way with friendship's rule or for our Jeo's sake, although twixt us it might have secret been, but now my shame must needs be known and seen. Tush, quoth Philandro, this is more than need to use such circumstance in such a case. As I began, so mean I to proceed, and though our Jeo hold me in disgrace, yet unto him I not impute this deed, but ready will be still in time and place to do him service any way I may. So you but show to me the mean and way. Sir, then, said she, the way were this, to kill him that doth seek my husband's shame and mine, which you may easily do, if so you will, a while unto my words your ear incline. I have put off his coming hither till it be betwixt the hours of ten and nine. What time I promised him so to provide, to let him in so as he were not spied. Now then my counsel is that you do stay here in my chamber until I procure him to disarm himself, so as you may slay him with small ado and make him sure. This is, quoth she, the only ready way and safest for yourself, I do assure. To this device Philandro doth assent, thinking hereby his friends hurt to prevent. Now more and more approached the cursed knight, when, as his wife, 
if I a wife may call, this hellish hag and foul infernal sprite did place my brother armed behind a wall, and as she wished, even so it fell aright, for ill device a miss doth seldom fall. Her husband, in the evening somewhat late, entered his castle at the postern gate. Philandro, at one blow, cuts off his head, taking him for Morando in exchange. She stands fast by that him had thither led, nor shows in word or gesture any change. Argeo there remaineth slain and dead and killed by him, O oh, chance most hard and strange, that while he friendly thought to do him good, most cruel and unfriendly shed his blood. Now when this feat had thus been brought to pass, Gabrina, so is this good woman's name, that doth in craft the fiends of hell surpass, unto my brother for his weapon came, which he delivered as his promise was. And that once done, then she without all shame prays him to take in hand a lighted candle, and view him well, whom he so ill did handle. There first he saw how he had killed his friend, a sight that made him at the heart repent. And she afresh the matter to amend, doth threat, except he would to her assent, that she should bring his life to shameful end, for to accuse him of this fact she meant, wishing him, though his life he did despise, to shun a shameful death, if he be wise. Philandro, mazed, and full of fear did stand, when of his error he was first aware, he thought at first to kill her out of hand, by whom he was entrapped in such a snare, but she had got his weapon in her hand, and to defend herself did straight prepare. But sure he could have found it in his heart, by piecemeal to have torn her every part. Like as a ship, in midst of seas oppressed, between two winds that do together strive, can have no time of respite or of rest, but goes what way the stronger wind doth drive, so now Philandro, doubting which was best, to die or in such sort, to bide alive, stood long in doubt, and neither way did bend, yet chose the worser bargain in the end. His reason open lays before his face the danger great, if once the fact were known, beside the infamy and great disgrace that would about the world of him be blown. Beside to choose he had but little space, so as his wit and sense was scant his own. At last he doth conclude, whatever come, to swallow this unsavory choking plum. Wherefore, against his will, and forced by fear, he promiseth to take her for his wife, and unto her he solemnly doth swear to marry her, if now she save his life. And, for it was not safe to tarry there, when once the murder should be published rife, he turns unto the place where he was born, and leaves behind him infamy and scorn. And still he carried in his pensive heart his friend's mishap, lamenting it in vain, how for a just reward of such desart a progne and Medea he did gain. And, save his oath restraineth him in part, no doubt he would the wicked hag have slain. But yet he hated her like toad or snake, and in her company small joy did take. From that to this, to laugh or once to smile he was not seen. His words and looks were sad with often sighs, and in a little while he grew much like Orestes when he had first slain his father by his mother's guile, then her, and last of all fell raging mad with spirits vexed. So was my brother's head still vexed till sickness made him keep his bed. But when this cursed strumpet plainly saw how small delight in her my brother took, she doth her fervent love from him withdraw, and in short space that fancy she forsook. And lastly she resolves against all law, so soon as she can fit occasion look, to bring Philandro's life to woeful end, and after her first husband him to send. An old physician full of false deceit she findeth out, most fit for such a feat, that better knew to give a poisoned bait than for to cure with herbs or wholesome meat. Him that for gain most greedily doth wait by proffers large, she quickly doth entreat to take upon him this ungracious cure with poisoned cup to make her husband sure. 
now while myself was by and others more this old physician came to him ere long and brought a cup in which was poison store and said it cordial was to make him strong but lo cabrina that devised before even in the prize of wrong to do some wrong before philandro of the cup did taste stepped twixt the leech and him in no small haste and taking in her hand against his will the cup in which the poisoned drink was placed she said good doctor do not take it ill that i require you first the drink to taste i will not have my husband drink until you have yourself before him tain the taste i will said she be certain by the rude that this you give him wholesome is and good now in what pickle think you was the leech the time was short to take a sound advice he might not use persuasion now nor speech he durst not tell how she did him entice nor could he guess what was here in her reach to make him taste first of the poison spice wherefore to take a taste he thought it best and then he gives my brother all the rest even as a hawk that hath a partridge trust in gripping talent sits and plumes the same oft by a dog whom she doth not mistrust is killed herself and reaved of her game so this physician graceless and unjust while he to greedy gain his mind doth frame was used by her even as he well deserved and so i wish all such physicians served the poor old man that felt his stomach ache began to take his leave and homeward hasted he thinks some strong antidotum to take against the poisoned cup he lately tasted she swears his home return he may not make while the operation of the potion lasted and that she will see plainly ere he go if so it do her husband good or no by humble suit and offers he doth try that with her license he may thence depart but all in vain his suit she doth deny now had the liquor well nigh touched his heart wherefore perceiving plainly he must die he doth the secret to us all impart thus to himself he did the same at last which oft he did to others in time past and straight in little space my brother died and after him died this same false physician we that had heard and seen the matter tried of which myself before had some suspicion both hand and foot we then this monster tied and bring her unto such as had commission where her confession and our accusation made them pronounce her doom of condemnation thus in the jail in fetters she was laid a judge to be burned at a stake thus said the knight and more he would have said how she escaped and how she prison break but so he fainted as they were afraid he would have sounded as those words he spake wherefore his page him to his horse doth lift and then to bind his wounds they make a shift then zerbin took his leave and made excuse that he had hurt the knight in her defence affirming he had done as is the use to save his charge from damage and offence and that thenceforth with him he would have truce this said he took his leave and parted thence and promised him with words of great civility to further him unto his best ability sir said the knight for this i do you thank and wish you of that woman to beware lest that she serve you some such slipper prank as may procure your farther woe and care for hard shall any scape from danger frank that in her company long season are gabrina silent all the while stands by for hard it is to prove the truth a lie thus hence they part and for his promise sake at her commandment zerbin doth attend and wished in heart the divil might her take though with his hand he must her still defend and those last words the knight of holland spake to give him warning of the cursed fend to fill his mind with so great grief and spite that now he scant could well abide her sight and this same old and weather-beaten trot perceiving how zerbino was inclined would not once yield or be behind a jot in spiteful wishing nor in evil mind her eye and tongue and look conceal it not nor yet her deeds as after he did find thus 
In this harmony of concord good It was their hap to travel through the wood. Now when the time approached near the night, They heard a noise of bustling and of blows, Caused, as they guessed, by some brawl or fight. But where it was, yet neither of them knows. Zerbino longed much to see the sight, And thitherwards in no small haste he goes, And in no less Gabrina maketh after, As shall be showed you more at large hereafter. End of Book 21The twenty-second book of Orlando Furioso. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland. Orlando Furioso by Ludovico Ariosto. Translated by Sir John Harrington. Book 22. The Argument. Astolfo doth dissolve the charmed place, and spite of Atlant sets his prisoners free. Then Bradamant doth see Rogero's face. To help an unknown knight they craved be, but by the way Rogero in short space subdued four knights of worth and good degree, that were by Pinabel in prison hilled, whom Bradamant with just revengement killed. Ye courtly dames that are both kind and true unto your loves, if kind and true be any, as sure I am in all your lovely crew of so chaste mind there are not over many, be not displeased with this that doth ensue, for neither must I leave it, neither can I, and bear with me, for that I said before, when on Gabrina I did rail so sore. Mine earnest words, nor yet her great offence, cannot obscure in honour and clear fame those few whose spotless lives want no defence, whom hate nor envy no way can defame. He that his master sold for thirty pence to John nor Peter breeds no blot nor blame, no men of Hypermestra worse have thought, although her sisters were unchaste and not. For one that in this verse I shall dispraise, as driven by course of this my present story, whole hundreds are whom I intend to praise and magnify their well-deserved glory. If this then be offensive any ways, to all or any, I can be but sorry. Now of the Scottish prince a word or two, that heard a noise, and went forth with thereto. Between two mountains in a shady dale he doth descend that way the noise him led. But when he came, he saw upon the vale a baron lately slain and newly dead. But ere I enter further in this tale, I first must tell you how Astolfo sped, whom late I left in that most cursed city, where women murder men without all pity. I told you how his horn, with mighty blast, not only all his foes had driven away, but also made his friends so sore aghast, as not the stoutest of them there durst stay. Therefore, I said, he was constrained at last, alone to get him homeward on his way. Forthwith, on Rubicano he doth mount, an horse of which he makes no small account. His horn that serves him still at all assays he carries with him, and his learned book. First by Armenia he goes his ways, then Drusia and the way of Thrace he took, so that within the space of twenty days the stream Danubio he quite forsook. Then from Bohemia word he doth decline unto Franconia and the stream of Rhine. Then through Ardenna's woods to Aquis' grave, and thence to Flanders, where he shipping found, what time a northeast wind did blow so brave as set him soon in sight of English ground, so that no whit annoyed with wind nor wave, his native soil received him safe and sound. He taketh horse, and ere the sun was down, at London he arrived, the chiefest town. Here, at his first arrival, straight he hears how that the Turks fair Paris did besiege, and how his sire, a man well struck in years, was there and sent for aid to raise the siege, and how of late the lords and chiefest peers were gone with new supplies to help their liege. But little stay he makes, these words once hard, but taketh ship again to callous word. And for the wind served then not very well, they were by force thereof borne quite aside, so that the master scant himself could tell what course he held, they were borne down so wide. Yet at the last, so lucky it befell, within a kenning they some land had spied, and drawing near they found the town of Rhone, where presently the duke took land alone. 
and crossing through a wood when time drew near that neither day could well be called nor night he happed to find a crystal spring and clear and by the side thereof he did alight with mind to quench his thirst and rest him here as in a place of pleasure and delight he ties his horse unto a tree and thinketh to have him tarry safe there while he drinketh strange things may fall between the lip and cup for scant astolfo yet had wet his lip but from a bush a villain started up untied the horse and on his back doth skip the duke that scant had tasted yet a sop and finds himself thus tain in such a trip forgets to drink and follows in a rage for wrath not water doth his thirst assuage the little villain that the horse had got like one that did in knavish pranks delight although he might have run yet did it not because astolfo should not lease his sight but with false gallop or a gentle trot he leads the duke unto that place aright where many knights and lords of high degree without a prison more than prisoners be astolfo though his armor doth him cumber yet fearing lest he might arrive too late in following the villain doth not slumber until he came within the palace gate where as i said of lords no little number were wandering up and down in strange estate astolfo of their presence doth not force but runneth up and down to find his horse the crafty villain was in no place found though many a homely place for him was sought yet still the duke doth search the palace round and for his beast he takes no little thought at last he guessed it was enchanted ground and as by logestilla he was taught he took his book and searcheth in the table how to dissolve the place he might be able and straight in the index for it he doth look of palaces framed by such strange illusion among the rest of this so saith the book that it should never come unto confusion until a certain stone away were took in which a sprite was kept by strange inclusion and if he did but lift the threshold stone the goodly house would vanish and be gone the duke not doubting now of good success goeth to the threshold where the stone was laid and which it was he presently doth guess and then by force to move it he essayed but atlant that expected nothing less and sees his bold attempt was sore afraid and straight an hundred means he doth devise to hinder him from this bold enterprise he makes the duke by this his devilish skill to seem of divers shapes unto the rest to one a dwarf of face and favor ill to one a giant to a third a beast and all their hearts with hatred he doth fill he thinks by them the duke should be distressed by seeming unto every one the same for which each one into the palace came behold rogero stout and brandemart presildo bradamant and others mow upon astolfo set with cruel heart as to revenge themselves upon their foe but with his horn the duke them played his part and brought their lofty stomachs somewhat low but had not horn procured him this exemption no doubt the duke had died without redemption for when they heard the strange and fearful blast they forced were for fear away to run as fearful pigeons fly away aghast when men do ring a bell or shoot a gun the sorcerer himself was not the last that sought by flight the fearful noise to shun yea such it was that neither rat nor mouse durst tarry in the circuit of the house among the horses that did break their bands was rabican of whom before i told who by good hap came to astolfo's hands who was full glad when of him he had hold also rogero's griffith horse there stands fast tied to a chain of beaten gold the duke as by his book he had been taught destroyed quite the house by magic rot i do not doubt but you can call to mind how good rogero lost this stately beast what time angelica his eyes did blind denying most unkindly his request the horse that soared swifter than the wind went back to atlant whom he loved best by whom he had been of a young one bred and diligently taught and costly fed this english duke was glad of such a prey as one that was to travel greatly bent and in the world was not a better way for him to serve his purpose and intent wherefore he meaneth not to let him stray but takes him as a thing from heaven him sent for long ere this he had of him such proof 
as well he knew what was for his behoof. Now being full resolved to take in hand to travel round about the world so wide, and visit many a sea and many a land, as none had done, nor ever should beside, one only care his purpose did withstand, which caused him yet a little time to bide. He doth bethink him oft, yet doth not know, on whom his rabbicano to bestow. He would be loath that such a stately steed should by a peasant be possessed or found, and though of him he stood then in no need, yet had he care to have him safe and sound in hands of such as would him keep and feed. While thus he thought and looked about him round, next day a while before the sun was set, a champion all in arms unwares he met. But first, I mean to tell you what became of good Ruggiero and his bradamant, who, when again unto themselves they came, the palace quite destroyed of old Atlant, each knew and called the other by their name, and of all courtesies they were not scant, lamenting much that this enchanted palace had hindered them so long, such joy and solace. The noble maid, to show herself as kind as might become a virgin wise and sage, doth in plain terms as plain declare her mind, as thus, that she his love's heat will assuage, and unto him herself in wedlock bind and spend with him all her ensuing age, if to be christened first he were content, and afterwards to ask her friend's consent. But he, that would not only not refuse to change his life for his beloved's sake, but also, if the choice were his to choose, to lease his life and all the world forsake, did answer thus, My dear, whate'er ensues, I will perform whate'er I undertake. To be baptized in water or in fire I will consent, if it be your desire. This said, he goes from thence with full intent to take upon him Christen's state of life, which done, he most sincerely after meant to ask her of her father for a wife. Unto an abbey straight their course they bent, as in those days were in those places rife, where men devout did live with great frugality, and yet for strangers kept good hospitality. But ere they came to that religious place, they met a damsel, full of heavy cheer, that had with tears bedewed all her face. Yet in those tears great beauty did appear. Rogero, that had ever special grace in courteous acts and speech, when she came near, doth ask of her what dangers or what fears did move her so to make her shed such tears. She thus replies, The cause of this my grief is not for fear or danger of mine own, but for good will and for compassion chief of one young knight whose name is yet unknown, who, if he have not great and quick relief, is judged into the fire to be thrown, so great a fault they say he hath committed, that doubt it is, it will not be remitted. The fault was this. There was good will between him and the daughter of the king of Spain, and lest his love should be descried and seen, he finally doth himself a woman feign, and went and spake as if he had so been. And thus he played, to tell the matter plain, the maid in show, the man indeed, so well, that in a while he made her belly swell. But out, alas, what can so secret be, but out it will when we do least expect. For posts have ears, and walls have eyes to see, Dumb beasts and birds have tongues ill to detect. First one had found it out, then two or three, And look how fire doth creep that men neglect, So this report from mouth to mouth did spring, Till at the last it came unto the king. The king straight sends a trusty servant thither, Who, making search, when they two were in bed, Found out the troth and took them both together, found him a man, and found her belly's bed. Away they carried her, I know not whether, away unto the prison he was led, and must be burned this day, or else to-morrow, the thought whereof doth move my mind to sorrow. This made me purposely to come from thence, and not to see one of so comely shape, so sharply punished for this small offence, as if it were for murder or for rape nor any hope could sink into my sense how possible it were for him to scape. And who could see or think without compassion a fine young youth tormented in such fashion? T'was strange to think how nigh this tale did touch the noble Bradamant's most tender heart, 
it seemed she pitied this man's state as much as if her brother had played such a part some cause there was to make her fancy such as afterwards at large i shall impart and straight she makes this motion that they twain might save this woeful youth from being slain rogero much commends her noble mind and to the mourning damsel thus they said we both are to this enterprise inclined if fortune serve we will the young man aid but when they saw that still she mourned and whined tush quoth rogero cease to be afraid tis more than time that we were going hence not tears but force must serve for his defence these comfortable words rogero spake with that his warlike look and manly show did cause her heart of grace forthwith to take yet still she doubts which way were best to go not that she feared the right way to mistake for all the ways she perfectly did know to turn the way she came she was afraid lest in the way they haply might be stayed there are quoth she two ways unto the place of which the tone is easy fair and plain the t'other foul and far the greater space yet at this time the safer of the twain but yet i fear except god send more grace that ere we thither come he may be slain thus stood this damsel still not little musing between the nearer way and safer choosing rogero that was resolute and stout did ask what reason moved her to persuade them two to take the farther way about and straightway she to them this answer made forsooth said she the cause that moves my doubt is this i fear that some will you invade by means that pinabel and selma's son hath here of late a custom lewd begun as namely that whoever that way ride of what estate soever or degree must lease their horses first and then beside must of their clothes and raiment spoil it be four valiant youths of strength and courage tried are sworn to this so that no he nor she can pass that way without this evil payment that he must weapons lease and she her raiment the custom is as yet but three days old by pinabello and his wife devised who meeting haply as i heard it told a knight or one in knightly clothes disguised with whom a woman ugly to behold and by this couple scorned and despised this pinabel the worse had of the quarrel his wife was spoiled of horse and of apparel this spite enraged so the woman's mind that wishing to revenge not knowing how yet wrath and folly so her sense doth blind that straight she makes a foolish solemn vow and he that was to evil deeds inclined no less than she doth of the same allow the vow was this for anger of this foil a thousand others in like sort to spoil that very night came to that house by chance four valiant knights as ever armor bear to fight on horse or foot with sword or lance but few may with the worst of them compare these four i say were first that led this dance by night surprised ere they were aware both griffin aquilant and sansonet and guidon savage scant a man as yet these four in show he gently entertained and makes them friendly countenance and cheer with courteous speech and friendly manner feigned as if he loved them well and held them dear but while secure they in their beds remained and when sun rising now approached near he did beset the lodging where they lay and took their armor and their clothes away and further bound them in that present place both hand and foot as if they prisoners were and ere he did those causeless bonds unlace he makes them solemnly to vow and swear to keep this order for a twelvemonth's space that whosoever happened to come there they four endeavour should with all their forces to take away their raiment and their horses to this by solemn oath are sworn they four constrained thereto by this their cruel host and though herewith they were offended sore yet must they swear for fear of farther cost already not so few as twice a score their horses and their furniture have lost and none as yet so able have been found but one of these have laid him on the ground but if some one do hap so strong to be to make his party good with one of those then straight the order is the other three must him assist thus none unconquered goes wherefore if you will be advised by me tis best to shun this way as i suppose sith each of these is such as i recited 
how great think you will be their force united but presuppose that you their force withstand as your great courage makes me think you might yet needs it hinder must the cause in hand and make you tarry hereabout all night sith then this case so dangerously doth stand i would persuade you now to shun this fight lest while you in this enterprise remain the poor young man may fortune to be slain hush quoth rogero have no doubt at all let us endeavor still to do our best and then good hap or ill fall what may fall let god and fortune govern all the rest i hope this enterprise i finish shall so well as i shall eke do your request and there arrive to save him in good time that should be burned for so small a crime this said he gets him on the nearest way fast by the place where pinabel doth dwell and at the bridge they forced were to stay and straight a man whose name i know not well came out in haste and stand to them doth say and then begins their order them to tell persuading them if they will shun the peril to yield in peace their horses and apparel peace quoth rogero leave thy foolish prating a tale already known thou dost repeat children with bugs and dogs are scared with rating with me it small avails to brag or threat i lease but time with thee to stand debating show me the men that mind to do this feat my haste is such that long i may not stay wherefore i pray you bid them come away lo here comes one of them this old man said and as he spake the word out came a knight a tall strong man all armed from foot to head his armor like a furnace shined bright his colors that he wear were white and red this was the first and sansonet he hight and for he was a man of mighty strength two massy spears he brought of mighty length the one of these he to rogero gave the other to himself he doth reserve then each in hope the victory to have do spur their steady steeds that will not swerve rogero's shield from wounding doth him save the others did him not so well preserve the spear both pierced his shield and pricked his arm and overthrew him to his further harm you do not sure nor cannot yet forget what of rogero's shield before i told that made the fiends of hell with toil to sweat and shine so bright as none could it behold no marvel then though valiant sansonet although his hands were strong and heart were bold could not prevail so strong a shield to purse of so great force as late i did rehearse this while was pinabel approached nigh to bradamant and asked of her his name that in their fight his force so great did try to overthrow a knight of so great fame lo how the mighty god that sits on high can punish sin when least men look the same now pinabel fell in his enemy's hands when in his own conceit most safe he stands it was his hap that self-same horse to ride which eight months past from bradamant he stale then when he falsely let the pole to slide at merlin's cave if you did mark the tale but now when she that traitor vile had spied that thought by treachery to work her bail she stepped forthwith between him and his castle and swears that she with him a pull would wrestle look how a fox with dogs and hunters chased that to come back unto her hold did ween is utterly discouraged and aghast when in her way she nets and dogs hath seen so he that no such peril did forecast and sees his foe stepped him and home between with word him threatening and with sword assailing doth take the wood his heart and courage failing thus now on flight his only hope relying he spurred that horse the chief his trouble bred no hope of help and yet for help still crying for doubt of death almost already dead sometime the fact excusing or denying but she believing not a word he said none in the castle were of this aware about rogero also busied are this while forth of the gate came the other three that to this law so solemnly had sworn among the rest that came was also she that caused this law full of disdain and scorn and none of these but sooner would agree with horses wild to be in pieces torn than to disdain their honour and good name with any act that might be worthy shame 
wherefore it grieved them to the very gall that more than one at once should one assail save they were sworn to run together all if so the first of victory did fail and she uncessantly on them did call what mean you sirs quoth she what do you ail do you forget the cause i brought you hither are you not sworn to take part altogether fie answered guidon what a shame is this let rather me alone my fortune try and if a victory i have to miss at my returning back then let me die not so quoth she my meaning other is and you i trust will not your word deny i brought you hither for another cause not now to make new orders and new laws thus were they urged by this scornful dame to that which all their hearts abhorred sore and which they thought to them so great a shame as never like had chanced them before also rogero's words increased the same upbraiding them and egging more and more and asking why they made so long delay to take his armor and his horse away and thus in manner forced and by constraint they came all three rogero to invade which act they thought would soar their honor's taint though full account of victory they made rogero at their coming doth not faint as one well used through dangers great to wade and first the worthy olivero's sons with all their force against rogero runs rogero turned his horse to take the field with that same staff that lately overthrew stout sansonet and with that passing shield that atlant made by help of hellish crew that shield whose aid he used very sealed some unexpected danger to eschew twice when alcina's kingdom he forsook once when the indian queen from thork he took save these three times he never used the aid of this his shield but left it covered still if he abroad or if within he stayed he never left it open by his will as for these three he was no more afraid of all their strength their number nor their skill nor made no more account with them to fight than if they had seemed children in his sight and first he met the younger of the twain that griffin hight who had so great a blow as in the saddle he could scant remain but quite amazed reeled to and fro he strake rogero but it was in vain for why the stroke fell overthwartly so that quite beside rogero's shield it slipped but yet the case it all to tear and ripped now when the renting of the silken case in which rogero used the shield to hide had cast out such a light in each man's face that none of them the force thereof could bide they fell down all amazed in the place admit they sit or stand or go or ride rogero with the cause not yet acquainted did marvel how his foes so soon had fainted but when he once was of the cause aware and how the cover of his shield was rent by means whereof it open lay and bare and then such light unto the looker sent he looks about where his companions are because forthwith to get him thence he meant i mean his bradamant and that same maid that for the youth did erst demand his aid but his beloved as then he found not where he erst had left her when he went to just and when he plainly saw she was not there and that that happened he could not mistrust he parted thence and with him he doth bear the maid that made to him the suit so just who lay that time amazed with the rest with sudden blazing of the light distressed he takes her kirtle and with it doth hide the light that did so dazzle all their eyes that light on which to look none could abide as if two suns had shone at once in skies forthwith himself all malcontent doth ride to have this combat ended in such wise as might imputed be to magic art and not his prowess or his valiant heart now while this thought such passions did him yield that though he had indeed most bravely done yet men would think the glory of the field not by his valiantness to have been won but by the force of that enchanted shield that cast a light more piercing than the sun I say, as thus he thought, he passed by a large deep well that by the way did lie, a well at which the beasts in summer's heat did use their thirsty drought to quench and cool, and chew again their undigested meat, and walk about the shadows of the pool. Here did Rogero oft these words repeat, 
thou shield that late didst make me such a fool to cause me get a conquest with such shame lie there quoth he with thee go all my blame with that he threw the shield into the well the well was deep the shield of mighty weight that to the bottom suddenly it fell the water over it a monstrous height but lo dame fame the thing abroad doth tell how he because he would not win by slight but by mere value had his target drowned where it should never afterward be found yet many that had heard the strange report of those that dwelled thence some far some nigher to seek the target thither did resort and to have found it out had great desire but it was cast away in such a sort as none unto their purpose did aspire for why the maid that only did behold it and knew which well it was yet never told it but when the knights came to themselves again and were awake and one the other saw that late were vanquished with so little pain as if to him they had been men of straw they wondered much what troubled had their brain and all of them did thence themselves withdraw and all that day they argue and devise how that same light should dazzle so their eyes this while came notice of the woeful fall of pinabel whom bradamant had killed with which they greatly were displeased at all not knowing why or who his blood had spilled his wife and sire that heard what was befall his son her spouse the place with outcries filled and cursed and chafed with too late repentance that none on pinabel had given attendance now when the damsel justly had him slain and ta'en away his horse some time her own she would have turned the way she came again but that the same was unto her unknown to purpose small she travels with great pain to seek it out as after shall be shown for here to stay is my determination and pause a little for my recreation end of book twenty two the twenty third book of orlando furioso this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland. Orlando Furioso by Ludovico Ariosto. Translated by Sir John Harrington. Book 23. The Argument. Astolfo on the Griffith horse doth mount. To Zerbin, Pinabello's death is laid. Orlando saveth him. Fierce Rodamont, Frontino takes from Bradamante's maid. The Paladin and Mandricard confront. They part by chance, and each from other strayed. Orlando falls stark mad, with sorrow taken, To hear his mistress hath him quite forsaken. Let every one do all the good they can, For seldom cometh harm of doing well, Though just reward it wanteth now and then, Yet shame and evil death it doth expel. But he that mischieveth another man Doth seldom carry it to heaven or hell. Men say it, and we see it come to pass, Good turns in sand, shrewd turns are writ in brass. Sealed mountains meet, but men may often meet, the proverb saith, and whoso sets a trap may catch himself, as here you plainly see it in him that thought this dame in woes to trap, but hurts himself, a punishment most meet, God still defending her from all mishap. God her preserved, and will all those preserve as shun all vice and him sincerely serve, it little did avail to Pinabel to be amid his kinfolk and his friends, and near the castle where his sire did dwell, where every one him honors and attends. Lo, here the end of him doth plainly tell how wicked lives have often wretched ends. But to proceed, I said when he was slain the noble damsel sought her way again, which when she saw she could by no means know, but more and more uncertainly did rove, and sees the sun was now declining low, she means that night to rest her in a grove, and sleep some time, or else some time I trow to look on Mars, on Saturn, or on Jove, but chiefly, whether she awakes or sleeps, Rogero's image in her heart she keeps. Oft times she fretting to herself would say, Lo, hate with me far more prevailed hath than love could do that now have lost my way and left my comfort to avenge my wrath nor had my wit so much forecast or stay to take some mark of my foretrodden path 
I did, quoth she, as fools are one to do, take one shrewd turn to do another too. These words, and many like to these, she spake to pass the rest of that her restless night, till stars gan vanish, and the dawning break, and all the easter parts were full of light. Then, at adventure, she her way doth take, not knowing yet if it were wrong or right, and having travelled in that way some miles, by hap a stolfo came that way the whiles. He rides the winged horse, but in his hand he leads the famous rabican behind. And even as then in great doubt he did stand where to bestow a beast of so good kind. She, knowing him, went to him out of hand with words, with shows, and with embracements kind, and joyed to find this kinsman of her own, and unto him herself she maketh known. Astolfo much rejoiced at this their meeting, then one the other asked of their welfare, and after their long talk and friendly greeting, in which each showed of other loving care, Sith I, quoth he, intend hence to be fleeting, to see what sights in foreign countries are, this horse of me I shall request you take, till I return, and keep him for my sake. Also, he said, this corslet and this spear with you I leave till I return again, this spear the son of Galafron did bear, whom, as you heard before, Farah had slain. With head whereof, if any touch it were, straightways to fall to ground they must be fain. All these he left behind to make him light, before that he begins to take his flight. Thus leave one's tain, away the duke doth soar, first low, and after still more high and high, till at the length she could him see no more. So doth the pilot first with watchful eye guide out his vessel softly by the shore, while he doth think the rocks and shallows nigh. But after, when he dreads no more such doubts, he sails apace and claps on all his clouts. Now when the duke was from the damsel gone, what she might do she mused in her mind, and carefully she meditates thereon how she may take the journey first assigned, and not neglect her kinsman's charge. Anon, a wandering peasant twas her hap to find. To him she doth betake the horses spare, though of the ways they both unskilful are. Her meaning was to go to Valambrose, as her first love and she concluded had, whom there to find she certain doth suppose, whom there to find she would have been full glad. But lo, a quite contrary course she goes, and sees a sight that made her then full sad, her father's house, Montalbany she spied, in which, as then, her mother did abide. If she shall forward go approaching nigher, she shall be stayed there. She stands in doubt, if she stands still or backward to retire. She fears to meet acquaintance thereabout. If she be stayed, she feels such burning fire of longing love as cannot be put out. She chanced amid these thoughts, and many other, to meet Alardo there, her younger brother. This meeting in her mind bred much vexation, when as she found her brother her had spied, and made her alter her determination, which, that she might from him the better hide, she used some common words of salutation, and to Montalban with him she doth ride, whereas her mother, full of care and fear, had wished and waited for her coming there. But all those kind embracings and those kisses she had of parent, kinsman, kind, and friends, she deems of little value to those blisses that she had lost, and thought them small amends. But, sith to meet Rogero now she misses, to send a messenger she now intends, some such to whom she may commit the charge to tell her mind unto her love at large, and, if need were, to pray him in her name, as he had promised her to be baptized and to excuse that thither she not came as they together had before devised. Besides, his horse, Frontino, by the same she sent, a horse of goodness not despised, no horse in France or Spain esteemed more, Bayardo sole except, and Brilliador. Rogero, if you call it well to mind, what time the Griffith horse he first did take, that soared away as swift as western wind, and forced him quickly Europe to forsake, that gallant beast Frontino left behind, whom Bradamant then for his master's sake took home, and with much care and costly feeding, made him by this time fair and fat exceeding. And straight her maids and women servants all that skilful were to sew, to weave, to knit, she doth to work in haste together call, and she herself among them all doth sit, to work a net of art and cost not small for his caparison to make it fit. 
When this was done and finished, straightway after she calls her nurse, Calitrophea's daughter. This maid knew best her mind of all the rest, and oft had heard her praising to the skies Rogero's comely shape and valiant breast, his sugared speech, sweet face, and lovely eyes. This maid, with secrets all she trusted best, on this maid's secrecy she much relies. Hippolca named was this trusty maid, her then she called, and thus to her she said, Hippolca mine, you know of all my crew of women servants I esteem you most, as one that hath been secret, wise, and true, a praise of which we women seld can boast. My meaning is to make a choice of you, to have you to Rogero ride in post, and unto him mine absence to excuse, and show that I could neither will nor choose. Yourself, quoth she, may ride a little nag, and in your hand lead by a frontino spare, and if perhaps some fool will be so brag as that to take the horse from you he dare, to make him that he shall no farther wag, but tell who owes the horse, and do not care. She thought Rogero was of so great fame that every one would quake to hear his name. Thus, when Ipolka was instructed well of all that to her errant did belong, and that no more remained behind to tell, she took the horse, and there she stayed not long. In ten miles' space, so lucky it befell, none offer made to do her any wrong. No traveller, no knight, nor peasant stayed her, nor once with word or deed so much as frayed her. About the time the sun to south did mount, she met, poor soul, a knight unto her cost, that Turk, most terrible, called Rodomount, that followed armed on foot a page in post, who, when he saw an horse of such account, he God blasphemed in all the heavenly host, that such a gallant, serviceable beast in some man's hand he had not found at least. He had before professed by solemn vow, when wanting horse he travelled on his feet, that wert from knight or knave that drives a plough to take perforce the next horse he should meet, yet though he liked the horse, to take this now and rob a maid thereof he thought unmeet. He sees her lead a horse, and he doth lack, and oft he wished his master on his back. I would he were, quoth she, he soon would make you change your mind, and glad to get you hence and you should find how much you do mistake your strength and force to offer him offence. And who, quoth he, is this of whom you crake? Rogero, she replies. Forsooth, and since so great a champion is the horse's owner, I may, said he, then take him with mine honour. To take his horse, quoth he, I now intend, for of a horse, you see, I stand in need. And if I find it true, as you pretend, that he so stout a champion is indeed, I, Rodomount, this action will defend. Now, on my present journey I proceed, and where I go my virtues shine so bright, he soon may find me, if he list to fight. This said with cruel threats, and part with force, he gat his will full sore against her will, and straight he mounteth up upon that horse. She cursing followed him, and banning still, but of those curses he doth little force. Then winners boast when leasers speak their fill. Best pleased was he when as she wished him worst, and still the fox fares best when he is cursed. But what she saith he little doth regard, Suppose she cursed, or prayed, or railed, or cried. He seeks out Doralus and Mandricard, and had the little dwarf to be his guide. No little haste he maketh thitherward, but here a while mine author steps aside, and to that place of purpose makes digression where Pinabel was shriven without confession. The noble dame no sooner left the place where late this caitive by her hand was slain, but Zerbin there arrived in little space with old Gabrina, who, perceiving plain one murdered, straight he followed the trace, lest murder unrevenged should remain. He minds, if fortune be so much his verderer, to be revenged sharply on the murderer. Gabrina, to the quarry straight approacheth, looks all about, searching the course, and prying, as one that still on every gain encroacheth, to win both by the living and the dying, in purses and in pockets all she poacheth of him that murdered on the ground was lying, as having this conjoined to other evils in covetes to pass the very devils. She would have had his coat and armor fain, save that she knew not how them to have hidden, but 
from great part of that desired gain by want of leisure she was then forbidden howbeit she did convey away his chain and ere zerbino back again was written she put it safely where it was not seen her upper gown and petticoat between and sore it grieved her to leave the rest but now zerbino was returned back and for the time drew nigh of taking rest and night came down to spread his mantle black to seek some lodging out they thought it best of which in that wild country was great lack they leave the valley and they came that night unto a castle alta riva height they thither went and long they had not stayed but in came people in great exclamation with woeful news that many hearts dismayed and filled their mouths and eyes with lamentation how pinabel was murdered and betrayed and lost his life and worldly habitation and straight they brought the course with light of torches and led the same through all the courts and porches great were the plaints the sorrow and the grief by kindred made by tenants and his friends but by his father old anselmus chief who though revenge be but a small amends and his son's life was now past all relief by search to find the murderer he intends zerbino hereof makes himself a stranger as well to shun suspicion as danger now when the funerals in stately sort ordained were with pomp and superstition to which great store of people did resort and all that would had frank and free permission straight with oyez a crier doth report thereto assigned by that earl's commission that whoso could the murderer bewray should have a thousand ducats for his pay this news from mouth to mouth from ear to ear as news are wont to do did fly so fast that old gabrina being present there among the rest heard of it at the last who either for the hatred she did bear to good zerbino for some matters past or else for gain of that so great reward straight to destroy zerbino she prepared and that she might more surely him entrap with thurl himself to speak she doth request and probably she tells how this mishap was by zerbino wrought his new-come guest and straight she pulled the chain out of her lap which soul might serve to verify the rest that aged sire that all the tale believed was sore enraged herewith not only grieved and lifting up his hands unto the skies with age now feeble feeble now with woe with fainting voice he spake and watery eyes my son thou shalt not unrevenged go and while in bed secure zerbino lies not thinking he had been betrayed so with armed men his lodging was beset he naked tain as is a bird in net with as great cruelty as could be shown his princely arms were pinioned fast behind him and to a dungeon deep he straight was thrown and that vile place to bide in was assigned him until the sentence of his death were known in fine anselmus so did passion blind him her likely tale his wrath so rashly leading condemned him and never heard him pleading thus was this worthy prince without all cause condemned to die such is the woeful being where hests of lawless lords must stand for laws though from all laws and reason disagreeing now near and near his execution draws and gazing people greedy still of seeing in clusters march and follow all confused on horse on foot as at such time is used but lo how god that ever doth defend those innocents that put in him their trust a help unlooked for did thither send and freed him from this doom of death unjust orlando did even then the hill ascend orlando is the man that save him must and at that time there did with him remain the daughter of gallego king of spain this was that isabel whom he of late recovered from the outlaws in the cave and having brought her out of that ill state yet still he promised care of her to have and whatsoever danger or debate to him befell yet her he still did save orlando all that great assembly saw that did the knight to execution draw he thither went and asked of him the cause why he was drawn unto a death so cruel forsooth zerbino said against all laws i am condemned if you the matter knew well anselmus rage that will admit no pause unto this flame doth kindle all the fuel believing falsely that i slew his son 
whereas by me God knows it was not done. Thus Zerban said, and said it in such sort as made Orlando vow him to relieve, for very apt he was each ill report of any of Maganza to believe. Each house still thought to cut the other short, each house still sought the other how to grieve, each house long time had ta'en a pride and pleasure to work the t'other danger and displeasure. Unloose the night, ye caitiffs, straight he cried, else look for death to be your due reward. What man is this, quoth one, that gapes so wide, and speaks so foolishly without regard? Were he of steel of strength and temper tried, and we of straw, his suit might hap be hard. This said, he taketh up a mighty lance, and runs against the paladin of France. Orlando ran at him with couched spear, and though his armor were both good and sure, as namely that Zerbino erst did wear, yet was the stroke too grievous to endure, for though the beaver did it stiffly bear, yet did the blow a greater hurt procure, for on the cheek it gave him such a check, that though it pierce it not, it break his neck. Nor at that course did all his fury cease. Six other of that spear the force then felt, then with his sword among the thickest press such store of thrusts and deadly blows he dealt that many in the place did straight decease and even as snow against the sun doth melt so melted they and fainted in his sight that in an hour he put them all to flight when they were fled he set Serbino free who would have kissed the ground whereon he trod and done him reverence humbly on his knee but that the earl such curtsy him forbade but yet he thanked him in the highest degree, as one he honored most excepting God. Then did he put his armor on again, which late was worn by him that there was slain. Now when Zerbino there had little stayed, preparing with Orlando to go hence, behold, fair Isabel, that princely maid, that all the while had stayed a little thence, and sees no farther cause to be afraid, came near, and brought great joy and great offense by diverse passions bred of one desire, some cold as ice, and some as hot as fire. For where before Zerbino thought her drowned, now certain he rejoiced very much to see her in his presence safe and sound, and that her misadventure was not such. But weighing in whose hand he had her found, a jealous fear forthwith his heart doth touch, and inwardly a greater anguish bred than late it had to hear that she was dead to see her in the hands of such a knight it greatly did him anger and displease from whom to offer her to take by might it were no honesty nor haply ease but for orlando's sake he ought of right all passions both of love and wrath appease to whom in thankfulness it were but meet to lay his hands under orlando's feet wherefore he makes no words but on he goeth in silent sort till coming to a well to drink they lighted being thirsty both and each his drought with water doth expel but when the damsel saw and knew for troth that was zerbino whom she loved so well for when to drink his beaver he untied straight she her love had through his beaver spied with open arms she runs him to embrace and hangs about his neck a pleasant yoke and speechless she remained a pretty space and with her crystal tears before she spoke surprised with joy she all bedewed his face and long it was ere into speech she broke by which the noble earl did plainly see that this could no man but sir bino be now when she had again her vital sprites, and that she able was her mind to show, first she Orlando's great desarts recites, that rescued her from place of shame and woe, commending him above all other knights, that undefiled had preserved her so, and prayed her dear, when she had made recital of his good deeds, to make him some requital. Great thanks were given, and proffers great there were of recompense and service on each side. But lo, a hap that made them speech forbear, for why an armed knight they had espied, t'was Mandricardo that arrived there, who, as you heard, these many days did ride to seek this earl, till meeting by the way fair Doralis, a while it made him stay. You heard how Mandricard sought out the track, 
moved thereunto by envy and disdain of this fierce knight apparelled all in black by whom the king of tremison was slain and those nourritions all so put to rack as few of them unwounded did remain and now he found him as it came to pass yet knew he not that this orlando was but marking well the signs and tokens leak to those he heard of such as thence were fled you are quoth he the self-same man i seek by whom so many of my friends are dead i have he said travelled above a week to find you out and now at last am sped you are the man that i have sought i guess and sure your manly look doth show no less sir quoth orlando though i want your name a noble knight you are it may be guessed for sure a heart so thirsting after fame is seldom bred in base unnoble breast but if to see me only now you came i straight herein will grant you your request and that you may behold me to your fill i will put off mine armour if you will but when you well have viewed me all about if yet you have a farther mind to try which of us two can prove himself most stout and first in field can make the t'other fly attempt it when you list and make no doubt but hereunto right soon agree shall i that quoth the pagan is my mind indeed and thus to fight together they agreed but when orlando viewed the pagan king and saw no polax at his saddle bow no sword by side no bow nor dart nor sling but even a spear he needs of him would know when that were burst unto what other thing he then would trust to give or bear a blow tush quoth the pagan prince you need not fear but i will match you only with the spear i have quoth he an oath most solemn sworn since first the noble hector's arms i wan that by my side should never sword be worn nor other iron weapon till i can get durindana by orlando born though how he gate it well i cannot scan but since he gat it great reports do fly that noble deeds of arms he doth thereby no less quoth he i fain on him would wreak my father's death whom falsely he betrayed for well i wot my sire was not so weak with any christen to be overlaid at this orlando could not choose but speak it is a lie quoth he that thou hast said i am orlando and i will not bear it this sword is durandan win it and wear it and though this sword is justly wholly mine yet for this time i frankly do agree a while it shall be neither mine nor thine and if in combat you can vanquish me then take it and thereat i shall not repine this said he hanged the sword upon a tree indifferently between them both to stand until the strife by combat might be scanned now one at the other ran with couched spear and on the headpiece each the other strake the staves in sundry pieces rend and tear but by the blows the men small hurt do take and now the truncheons only left them were and at four blows the truncheons likewise break thus when they saw all other weapons missed at last they were enforced to fight with fist so have i seen two clowns fall at debate about some water-course or mark of land and either clap the t'other on the pate with crab-tree staff or with his crabbed hand such of this conflict was the present state and each of them doth to his tackle stand and being tired with giving fruitless stripes at last they flatly fell to handy gripes the pagan part by slight and part by force thought to have done as hercules in time past to fierce antaeus did and thurl in force to yield himself or leave his horse at last orlando that could surely sit his horse with all his strength bestrides the saddle fast yet did the pagan heave him with such strength that all his gurses broken were at length down came the earl yet kept his saddle still nor what had happened was he well aware but as he fell intending by his will unto the pagan king to work some care he meant but his attempt succeeded ill to overthrow the horse the pagan bare but missing hold the horse unhurt remains yet off he pulled his headstall and his reins the horse that had at liberty his head runs over ditch and valley hedge and wood as partly fear and partly courage led 
for nothing was that his mad course withstood, but Mandricard still beats him on his head, and even as if he speech had understood, he threatens him, except he stay to beat him, and with fair speech some time he doth entreat him. But all was one. Three mile outright he rode, ere he could make the harebrain horse to stay, or cause him once to make a small abode. But more and more he galloped still away. At last, with haste, the horse and eke the load fell down into a ditch, and there they lay, both horse and man all soiled and rayed with dirt, yet neither horse nor man had any hurt. This while Dame Doralice, that saw her guide thus post away against his will amain, she thought it were not safe behind to bide, and therefore followed him, though with great pain, and seeing that he could no farther ride because his willful horse did want a rein, she prays him take her horse's rein and bit, for mine, quoth she, will go though wanting it. Much did the pagan praise her gentle offer, yet did refuse it as a part too base. To let her want and take her bridle of her, he thought it were to him a great disgrace. But lo, good chance a better mean did proffer. Cabrina came unwares unto the place, she that betrayed of late the Scottish prince, and heard of like of his delivery since and therefore fearing punishment and blame and clogged with guilty conscience fled the light until by hap unwares she thither came and on this couple fortunate to light they could not choose but make great sport and game to see so strange and unagreeing sight as such a withered old ill-favoured hag to ride in purple on an ambling nag he that of right or wrong did little pass means with her store his lack there to supply nor once demanded who or what she was, but takes away her bridle by and by. She screecheth out and weeps and cries, alas, even ready fearing hurt, unhurt, to die. Hereafter shall I tell you what became on her. Now for a farewell do I wish a shame on her. This while Orlando had his gerses mended, and knew provided what before did lack, and mounting on his horse a while attended to see if so the pagan would come back. But seeing that he came not, he intended to follow him and find him by the track. But first, as one that well good manners knew, he bade Zerbino and his spouse adieu. Fain would Zerbino with this earl have gone, and take such part of every hap as he, but that the noble earl hereof would none, and said there could not more dishonour be than for a knight to shun to fight alone. Wherefore he would not thereunto agree. Thus Zerben loath doth from this earl depart, poor Isbel shedding tears for tender heart. But ere they went, this earl, Zerbino prayed, if first he happed on Mandricard to light, to tell him how long time he for him stayed, and meant to seek him out again to fight, now that his coming was so long delayed. He meant to Parisward to go that night to Charles's camp, and if he sought him there, he should assured be of him to hear. Thus much he prayed, and thence away he went to seek out Mandricard but found him not. And for the day now more than half was spent, the sun and season waxing somewhat hot, a shady grove he found, and there he meant to take some ease, but found small ease, God wot. He thinks his thirst and heat a while dissuage, but found that set him in worse heat and rage. For looking all about the grove, behold, in sundry places fair engraven he sees her name whose love he more esteems than gold, by her own hand in barks of diverse trees. This was the place wherein before I told Medoro used to pay his surgeon's fees, where she, to boast of that that was her shame, used oft to write hers and Medoro's name, and then, with true love-knots and pretty poses, to show how she to him by love was knit, her inward thoughts by outward words discloses, in her much love, to show her little wit. Orlando knew the hand, and yet supposes it was not she that had such posies writ, and to beguile himself, Tush, tush, quoth he, there may be more angelicas than she. Yea, but I know too well that pretty hand. Oft hath she sent me letters of her writing. Then he bethinks how she might understand his name and love by that same new inditing, and how it might be done, long time he scanned, with this fond thought so fondly him delighting. Thus with small hope, much fear, all malcontent, in these and such conceits the time he spent. 
and a the more he seeks out of his thought to drive this fancy still it doth increase even as a bird that is with bird lime caught doth beat her wings and strives and doth not cease until she hath herself all overwrought and quite entangled in the slimy grease thus on went he till him the way did bring unto a shady cave and pleasant spring this was a place wherein above the rest this loving pair leaving their homely host spent time in sports that may not be expressed here in the parching heat they tarried most and here medor that thought himself most blessed wrote certain verses as in way of boast which in his language doubtless sounded pretty and thus i turn them to an english ditty ye pleasant plants green herbs and waters fair and cave with smell and grateful shadow mixed where sweet angelica daughter and heir of galafrone on whom in vain were fixed full many hearts with me did oft repair alone and naked lay mine arms betwixt i poor medor can yield but praise and thanks for these great pleasures found amid your banks and pray each lord whom cupid holds in pay each knight each dame and every one beside or gentle or mean sort that pass this way as fancy or his fortune shall him guide that to the plants herbs spring and cave he say long may the sun and moon maintain your pride and the fair crew of nymphs make such purveyance as hither come no herds to your annoyance it written was there in the arabian tongue which tongue orlando perfect understood as having learned it when he was but young and oft the skill thereof had done him good but at this time it him so deeply stung it had been well that he it never could and yet we see to know men still are glad and yet we see much knowledge makes men mad twice thrice yea five times he doth read the rhyme and though he saw and knew the meaning plain yet that his love was guilty of such crime he will not let it sink into his brain oft he peruses it and every time it doth increase his sharp tormenting pain and aye the more he on the matter mused the more his wits and senses were confused even then was he of wit well nigh bestraught so quite he was given over unto grief and sure if we believe as proof hath taught this torture is of all the rest the chief his sprite was dead his courage quailed with thought he doth despair and look for no relief and sorrow did his senses so surprise that words his tongue and tears forsook his eyes the raging pang remained still within that would have burst out all at once too fast even so we see the water tarry in a bottle little mouthed and big in waist that though you topsy-turvy turn the brim the liquor bides behind with too much haste and with the striving oft is in such taking as scant a man can get it out with shaking at last he comes unto himself anew and in his mind another way doth frame that that which there was written was not true but writ of spite his lady to defame or to that end that he the same might view and so his heart with jealousy inflame well be to list quoth he i see this clearly he hath her hand resembled passing nearly with this small hope with this poor little spark he doth some deal revive his troubled sprite and for it now was late and waxed dark he seeks some place where he may lie that night at last he hears a noise of dogs that bark he smells some smoke and sees some candlelight he takes his inn with will to sleep not eat as filled with grief and with none other meat but lo his hap was at that house to host where fair angelica had lain before and where her name on every door and post with true love knots was joined to medor that knot his name whom he detested most was in his eye and thought still evermore he dares not ask nor once the matter touch for knowing more of that he knows too much but vain it was himself so to beguile for why his host unasked by and by that saw his guest sit there so sad the while and thinks to put him from his dumps thereby beginneth plain without all fraud or guile without concealing truth or adding lie to tell that tale to him without regard which divers had before with pleasure hard as thus 
how at angelica's request he holp unto his house to bring medor who then was sorely wounded in his breast and she with surgery did heal his sore but while with her own hands the wound she dressed blind cupid wounded her as much or more that when her skill and herbs had cured her patient her cureless wound in love made her unpatient so that admit she were the greatest queen of fame and living in those easter parts yet so with fancy she was overseen to marry with a page of mean desarts thus love quoth he will have his godhead seen in famous queens and highest princes hearts this said to end the tale he showed the jewel that she had given him which orlando knew well this tale and chiefly this same last conclusion was even a hatchet to cut off all hope when love had after many a vain collusion now for his farewell lent him such a rope to hang himself and drown him in confusion yet fain he would deny his sorrow scope and though a while to show it he forbears it breaketh out at last in sighs and tears and as it were enforced he gives the rein to raging grief upon his bed alone his eyes do shed a very shower of rain with many a scalding sigh and bitter groan he slept as much as if he had then lain upon a bed of thorns and stuffed with stone and as he lay thereon and could not rest him the bed itself gave matter to molest him ah oh, wretch i am thus to himself he said shall i once hope to take repose and rest me in that same house yea even in that same bed where my ungrateful love so lewdly dressed me nay let me first an hundred times be dead first wolves devour and vultures shall digest me straight up he starts and on he puts his clothes and leaves the house so much the bed he loathes he leaves his host nor once doth take his leave he fared so ill he bids not them farewell he leaves the town his servants he doth leave he rides but where he rides he cannot tell and when alone himself he doth perceive to weep and wail nay even to howl and yell he doth not cease to give his grief a vent that inwardly so sore did him torment the day the night to him were both a leak abroad upon the cold bare earth he lies no sleep no food he takes nor none would seek all sustenance he to himself denies thus he began and ended half the week and he himself doth marvel whence his eyes are fed so long with such a spring of water and to himself thus reasons on the matter no no these be no tears that now i shed these be no tears nor can tears run so rife but fire of frenzy draweth up to my head my vital humour that should keep my life this stream will never cease till i be dead then welcome death and end my fatal strife no comfort in this life my woe can minish but thou who canst both life and sorrow finish these are not sighs for sighs some respite have my gripes my pangs no respite to permit the blindfold boy made me a seeing slave when from my eyes my heart he first did hit now all inflamed i burn i rage and rave and in the midst of flame consume no whit love sitting in my heart a master cruel blows with his wings feeds with his will the fuel i am not i the man that erst i was orlando he is buried and dead his most ungrateful love our foolish lass hath killed orlando and cut off his head i am his ghost that up and down must pass in this tormenting hell for ever led to be a fearful sample and a just to all such fools as put in love their trust thus wandering still in ways that have no way he happed again to light upon the cave where in remembrance of their pleasant play medoro did that epigram engrave to see the stones again his woes display and her ill name and his ill hap deprave did on the sudden all his sense and rage with hate with fury with revenge and rage straightways he draweth forth his fatal blade and hews the stones to heaven the shivers flee accursed was that fountain cave and shade the arbor and the flowers and every tree orlando of all places havoc made where he those names together joined may see yea to the spring he did perpetual hurt by filling it with leaves boughs stones and dirt 
and having done this foolish frantic feat, he lays him down all weary on the ground, distempered in his body with much heat, in mind with pains that no tongue can expound. Three days he doth not sleep, nor drink, nor eat, but lay with open eyes as in a sound. The fourth, with rage and not with reason waked, he rents his clothes and runs about stark naked. His helmet here he flings, his pauldrons there, he casts away his curates and his shield. His sword he throws away, he cares not where, he scatters all his armor in the field. No rag about his body he doth bear, as might from cold or might from shame him shield. And, save he left behind his fatal blade, no doubt he had therewith great havoc made. But his surpassing force did so exceed all common men, that neither sword nor bill nor any other weapon he did need. Mere strength sufficed him to do what he will. He roots up trees as one would root a weed. And even as birders laying nets with skill pare slender thorns away with easy strokes, so he did play with ashes, elms, and oaks. The herdmen and the shepherds that did hear the hideous noise and unacquainted sound with fear and wonder great approached near to see and know what was here of the ground. But now I must cut off this treatise here, lest this my book do grow beyond his bound. And if you take some pleasure in this text, I will go forward with it in the next. End of book 23The twenty fourth book of Orlando Furioso. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland. Orlando Furioso by Ludovico Ariosto. Translated by Sir John Harrington. Book twenty four. The argument. The noble Zerbin pardon doth afford to Audric and Gabrina a graceless pair. A Turk with him fights for Orlando's sword. He dies in arms of Isabella fair. Fierce Rodomont, with sundry passions stirred, doth fight with cruel Agrican his heir. But them, in their chief rage, their mistress parted, from whence to aid their prince they both departed. Whoso shall set on Cupid's snares his foot, must seek to draw it back, lest it be caught. And madness mere in love to overshoot, the fool hath felt, the wise hath ever taught. And though in all alike it take not root, yet all shall find that love's a thing of naught. For sure, it is an open sign of madness to have another's pleasure breed thy sadness. Now though effects prove not in all alike, yet all are mad in sort, all go astray, as in a wilderness where men do seek, and more and more in seeking lose their way. Wherefore let no man this my wish mislike, in whom fond love shall carry long the sway, I wish for due reward such doting dolts, like willful prisoners, store of iron bolts. Some man perhaps will say, What, soft, my friend, you spy our faults, in your own errors blind. And true it is, yet speak I to this end, to bring us both into a better mind. As for myself, I hope ere long to mend, and from these bands in time myself unwind. Though it hath ta'en in me such root, I prove it, And hard tis on the sudden to remove it. I showed you in the book that went before By what mishap Orlando waxed mad, And lost not only care of virtue's lore, But reason, wit, and all the sense he had. His armor he dispersed, his clothes he tore, The very clothes wherewith his corpse was clad, And though he wandered all unarmed and naked, Yet at his presence all the country quaked, the countrymen that heard the noise aloof of trees that with their fall made no small crack came near and saw by plain and open proof his monstrous strength by their so monstrous rack and straight they found it best for their behoof with all the haste they could to get them back for those he caught he did this lesson teach to keep aloof from out a madman's reach away they fled but he pursued so fast that some he caught, and some, surprised with fear, stood still, as oft it happens, all aghast, not knowing how to hide themselves nor where. Some other plowmen, seeing what had passed, thought it but little wit to tarry there, but climbed for fear their houses and their churches, not trusting strength of elms, of beech, and birches. Among the rest he takes one by his heel, and with his head knocks out another's brain, which caused both of them such pain to feel, as till doomsday they never shall complain. 
another with his fist he made to reel till pain itself made him past sense of pain and when the men fled all away afeard then with like rage he set upon their herd the voice of man the bellowings of beast about the country raised so great a sound as might have well been heard five leagues at least and all the people straight were raised round each man providing as he could the best and for the present time might then be found with bows with bills with staves and pikes and prongs to be revenged on these outrageous wrongs look how the waves are driven by western blast and one by one do rise still more and more until their force so great be at the last they sprinkle all the banks and beat the shore so now these country folk came in so fast by two and three a dozen and a score till at the last they grew so great a number their very multitude themselves did cumber but when they saw their force could do no good and that his skin so strange protection had that though they smote thereon they drew no blood they thought that they might worse be thought than mad to fight with one that all them so withstood wherefore they parted home dismayed and sad the madman went unto the nearest village although he cared not for spoil or pillage and finding no man there nor small nor great for all were fled away from thence for awe as famine forced him he sought out some meat and were it fine or coarse the first he saw in greedy sort he doth devour and eat not caring if it roasted were or raw and when thus homely he had ta'en repast about the country bedlam like he passed he scares both man and beast without regard he takes swift goats and fallow deer in chase sometimes a lion fierce a boar a pard he kills by strength and swiftness of his pace at last he came whereas a knight did guard the passage of a bridge and by the place had built a tower of no small work and charge as shall be showed hereafter more at large now i must tell what hap sir bino had who with fair isabel together rode along that place where this good earl fell mad but by the way these two made some abode where they beheld two men in armor clad that drive a horse that bear a woeful load a knight a prisoner to sir bino known that had been once a servant of his own this prisoner odoric of bisky height in whom the prince had put so great a trust he made chief choice of him as of a knight that of his promise would be firm and just but he fond beast esteeming small delight and fruitless hope of his unbridled lust above his sacred oath and promised fealty would have deflowered her against all lealty fair isabel by hap even then was telling how in the boat she desperately was saved and having scaped the stormy seas and swelling how treacherously this wretch himself behaved that had not outlaws thereabout been dwelling he would have forced her unto that he craved and even as these or some such words she said she saw the man she spake of captive led those two that led the wicked odric tide well knew their lord when as they came in view both by the lady that was by his side and by the rampant lion red of hue borne by the prince not for a show of pride but his as from his predecessors due they light and with a curtsy to the ground and cap in hand salute their lord thus found sir bino knew and called them both by name corebo tone almonio t'other height which too with isabel from bion came in conduct of that most unworthy white and straight almonio thus his speech doth frame my lord said he i shall to you recite some little part of that unpleasant story that till this hour has made my heart full sorry sith thank be god this lady here doth live who felt these storms and therein chiefly smarted i know that she thereof could notice give and hath ere this to you the same imparted i only shall declare what did me grieve and what had happened since from her i parted what time by this vile wretch's lewd intent for horse and men to rochelle i was sent and as i went so back i turned in haste with men and horse as good as i could get to seek them out mine eyes about i cast but yet mine eyes on them i could not set their track i found and following that full fast it brought me to a wood whereas i met my fellow coreb panting there and groaning this caitiff cursing and himself bemoaning 
he told me how he fighting in defence of isabella was so sorely wounded that from that place he had not stirred since and how with bleeding much he oft had sounded at which report i took so great offence that in my wits i was well nigh confounded and to revenge my heart so sharp was wet that corab's danger quite i did forget but when in vain this wretch i long had sought to corab i returned back again who was so weak and low by bleeding brought that scant the life did in his limbs remain for which his woeful state i took great thought as one that deemed it fitter to ordain some priests and friars burial to procure him than surgeons or physicians that might cure him yet him unto the town at last i carried whereby such help our friendly host procured it pleased god corebo not miscarried but of his grievous hurts was soundly cured which done no longer in those parts we tarried but being there by sundry men assured that odric in alfonso's court was biding we thither went to hear of him some tiding and there i challenged odric face to face and by the noble justice of the king and chiefly as i deem by god's great grace that only rules and governs everything i took him prisoner in the present place from whence alive i did him hither bring for why that king that heard his great offence did grant us liberty to bring him thence i might have slain him as he well deserved but yet i choose it rather of the twain unto your doom to have his life reserved that you might point him death with worthy pain and much i joy that luck so well hath served that we so safe have found your grace again and much more i rejoice if much more may be at health and welfare of this noble lady thus much almonio said and then did cease expecting what Zerbina would reply who all the while stood still and held his peace and viewed the prisoner with an heedful eye and much it did his grief of mind increase to think a friend could stray so far awry then sighing deep what odric is this true wherewith quoth he almonio chargeth you the caitiff humbly prostrate on the ground forgive my lord said he your servant's crime what white on earth can void of fault be found? What saint is such as doth not sin some time? Tween good and bad this different soul is found, That good men sinned but sealed, and mend be time. The bad men, making scruple none or question, Yields willfully to every lewd suggestion. If you to me some fortress had committed, And I the same had wittingly betrayed, I grant such fault were not to be remitted, But if I had with force been overlaid, Then sure I am my case would have been pitied, At least no sin should to my charge be laid. For when the enemy is once the stronger, Tis vain to make resistance any longer. Even so, my lord, my faith I ought to guard No other than a fortress or a hold, put in my charge with careful watch and ward as long as strength will serve me to hold and so i kept my faith with due regard nor was i any way to be controlled until at last i was so strong assailed that faith gave place and fancy then prevailed thus odric said and what he said beside i doubt it somewhat tedious were to tell as namely none so great assault could bide that love all other passions doth excel but sure if it were ever plainly tried that humble speech doth often wrath expel now odric found of lowly words the fruit that hope him to obtain so hard a suit Zerbino stood a while in mind confused to punish or to pardon his offence Sometime his thoughts all clemency refused. Sometime the love and service done long since assuaged his wrath, and t'other's fault excused, and moved him with his folly to dispense. And still, as rage did kindle fire of wrath, to quench it, mercy, store of water hath. Now, while in this same doubt Zerbino stayed, behold, by hap Cabrina there was brought, she that of late had this good prince betrayed, and had to him so great a danger wrought. Her horse, that heard where other horses neighed, came to the noise as nature had them taught, against her will, she wanting force to sway him, and having lost the reins wherewith to stay him. The beastly wretch cried help, and out, alas, while thus her horse ran over fields and lands, 
But when the Scottish prince saw who she was, and how she thither came he understands, he gave God thanks that so had brought to pass, to give those two at once into his hands, which two, for their misdeeds above the rest, he had great cause to malice and detest. And after he had made a little pause, unto his servants turning, thus he said, Sirs, Odric shall not die, although by laws his fact deserves no less, uprightly weighed, for sith he, saith affection, was the cause, content I am on love the fault be laid. The sin to which a man by love is driven, so much the rather ought to be forgiven. The force of strong affection hath ere this distempered, yea, and sometime overthrown, a wiser and a staider head than his, as is to me by mine experience known, and that herein he did his duty miss, I must confess the fault was part mine own that gave to him such charge, and did not know how quickly flaming heat can kindle tow. Then to the caitiff Odric thus he spake, Here I forgive thee, and do thee enlarge, but yet the penance I will have thee take is this, to take this woman in thy charge, and swear to me thou shalt her not forsake for one whole year. But this thine oath discharge, and that thou shalt, if any would offend her, do thy devoir, and unto death defend her. This was the punishment on him he laid, and certainly the same had been enow, if so the circumstance were duly weighed, and Odoric had right performed his vow, for why so many men she had betrayed and done such sins, even from her youth till now, that wheresoe'er they had together travelled, in her defence he must at last be gravelled. Thus Zerbin let this wicked couple go, and thinks sufficiently to plague them both, but swears if ever he did hap to know that he therein should violate his troth, his flesh should serve as feeding for the crow, a fit reward for such as break their oath. Thus went this honest couple thence together, lurking in corners, wandering here and thither. But what in the end of these same two became, I know not, and mine author doth not write. I only heard a speech or flying fame, that when they once were quite from Zerbin's sight, Odric, to shun the quarrels and the shame that by her company on him might light, did hang her up, and after, in short space, Almonio made him run the selfsame race. The prince, that fain some tidings would have heard of that Earl Paladine, who t'other day fought hand to hand with lofty Mandricard, until his reinless horse bare him away, doth travel on his way to Parisward, though fair and soft and lingering by the way, and his two servants he doth send before, and kept with him his lady, and no more. They rode not far, but that they found the cave, and that same pleasant arbour, and the spring at which Medoro used such sport to have with that fair daughter of the Indian king, where she their names together did engrave all tied in true love knots a wondrous thing. They look and see the stones, the words and letters all cut and mangled in a thousand fitters. And as they mused hereon, they might espy Orlando's armour and his famous blade high Durindana on the ground to lie, that sword that first for Hector had been made. They saw where Brigliador was feeding by upon the grass amid the pleasant shade. This sight did make them both exceeding sad, yet little did they deem that the Earl was mad. Had they but seen one little drop of blood, they would have surely thought he had been slain. But while in this most careful doubt they stood, Behold, there came a country silly swain, that with no little speed ran through the wood, and scaped the madman's fury with great pain. He told them how a man bestraught of senses had done these outrages and great offences, and further gave them perfect information, and told each circumstance at their request. Sir Bino standeth still in admiration, and, as the manner is, himself he blessed and with great grief of mind and lamentation he takes the sword and armor and the rest, and Isabella helpeth them to gather, and so they lay them on an heap together. This while by hap came by fair Fjordelege, who, as I told before, with pensive heart went to seek out her loved lord and liege, I mean Orlando's friend, King Brandemart, who, leaving Paris in the woeful siege, to seek Orlando did from thence depart, till Atlant, to that cage him did entice, which he had framed by magical device. 
the which enchantment being now defeated by good astolfo's value and his skill and all the knights as i before repeated at liberty to go which way they will king brandemart though much in mind he freeted to think how long in vain he had stood still back unto paris where his course he turned yet missing her the way that he returned thus as i said fair fjordelege by chance saw much of that which happed and heard the rest how that same worthy paladin of france with inward grief of mind and thought oppressed or by some other great and strange mischance went like a man with some ill sprite possessed and she likewise inquiring of the peasant heard all the circumstance a tale unpleasant zerbino being far from any town hangs all orlando's armor on a pine like to a pennon and lest any clown or peasant vile should take a thing so fine he writes upon the tree let none take down this armor of orlando paladin as who should say if any man attempt it orlando would ere long cause him repent it and having brought this worthy work to end and ready now to take his journey hence fierce mandricard happed thither to descend and when he saw the tree he asked of whence those weapons were which known he doth intend to take away good durindana thence he steps under the tree and takes the sword nor so content he adds this spiteful word ah sir quoth he this hap doth make me glad my claim unto this sword is not unknown and though before i no possession had yet now i lawfully seize on mine own alas poor fool and doth he feign him mad and hath away his sword and armor thrown because he was not able to maintain it and was afeard that i by force would gain it zerbino crieth out what peace for shame take not his sword or think not i will bear it if by the coat of hector so you came you stale it and unworthy are to wear it tush quoth the pagan i will bear that blame as for your threatening do not think i fear it thus tones sharp answers t'other sharp replying made them to fall to terms of flat defying and either showing signs of plain hostility prepares the t'other fiercely to invade zerbino with his skill and great agility his party good against the pagan maid and voided all the blows with much facility though having great disvantage in the blade and in that armor massy so and strong that in times past to hector did belong look how a ground that finds a sturdy boar amid the field far straying from the herd doth run about behind him and before because of his sharp tusks he is afeard so zerban that had seen oft heretofore that blade and of the force thereof had heard with heedful eye to shun the blows he watched because he was in weapons overmatched thus warily this worthy prince did fight and though by heedful skill he scaped oft the furious blows of this tartarian knight yet lo at last one blow came from aloft and durindan so heavy did alight as pierced through the hard unto the soft a finger deep and went in length a span down from the place where first the wound began the prince so earnest was he felt no smart yet ran the blood out of the breast amain and of his curates all the former part with crimson stream of blood it did disdain so have i seen her hand that to mine heart hath been a cause of anguish and much pain when she a purple seam or flower hath drawn in silver kirtle or in sleeve of lawn the wound was great but yet did greater show which sight fair isabella much amated the prince that seemed not the same to know with force increased rather than abated upon the pagan's brow gave such a blow as would no doubt have made him checked and mated save that as i to you before rehearsed his armor was not easy to be pierced the blow was such as caused him to reel and on his stirrups staggeringly he stood had not his armor been of passing steel the blow would sure have entered to the blood the grievous pain that he thereof did feel did put him in so fierce a raging mood so that for all zerbino's skill and slight he wounded him in places seven or eight which when his loving isabella saw she went to dorilus and her doth pray the fury of her husband to withdraw and join with her to part the bloody fray who both because she was in fear and awe lest yet the prince her spouse in danger may 
and for of nature kind she was and meek of that good motion she doth not mislike thus those two ladies this fierce battle parted in which the prince received many a wound though being as he was most valiant hearted he never gave the pagan inch of ground from thence each couple presently departed fierce mandricard to pagan camp was bound to paris word the prince but driven to stay by reason of his bleeding by the way dame fjordelege that stood this while aloof and saw how mandricard prevailed had and how the prince had fought with evil proof departed thence all sorrowful and sad reviling mandricard with just reproof that of this evil gotten sword was glad and wished that her husband brandemart had present been to take sir bino's part but as she travelled homeward to the camp she saw the noble paladine of france not like himself but of another stamp besmeared and naked as antics wont to dance quite was extinguished the shining lamp of virtue bright that did his name advance this sight in fjordelege much sorrow bred but tell we now how good zerbino sped who on his way with painful steps proceeding with isabella only and no more his former taken hurt still freshly bleeding which now with cold was stiff and waxed sore and yet this grief in him the rest exceeding to think that sword of which i spake before should maugre him be by a turk possessed i say this grieved him more than all the rest now gan the dreadful pangs of death assail him so great a stream of blood his wound had drained his eyes were dim his speech began to fail him strong heart to yield to weak limbs was constrained what can poor isabella do but wail him she blamed the heavens and fates that had ordained her to escape such dangers and such harms and now to have her dear die in her arms zerbino though he scant could draw his breath yet hearing her lamenting in such fashion doth ope his closed lips and thus he saith both showing then and moving much compassion so mought i my dear love even after death be dear to thee as i do feel great passion to think when as my death from hence shall reave me alone in woe and danger i shall leave thee might i have left thee in some safer place i should esteem my death a blessed hap and that the heavens had given me special grace to end my life in thy beloved lap now grieves it me to think of thy hard case in what a world of woes i thee shall wrap when i must die and leave thee here alone and none to help thy harm or hear thy moan to this the woeful isabel replies with watered eyes and heart surprised with anguish her face to his and joining her fair eyes to his that like a withered rose did languish no thought said she my dear in thee arise for me for no i neither do nor can wish thee to survive i will be thine for ever life could not and death shall not us dissever no sooner shall thy breath thy breast forsake but i will follow thee i care not whether grief or this sword of me an end shall make and if some stranger after shall come hither i hope of us such pity he will take to lay our bodies in one grave together this said about his neck her arms she clasped and draws the fainting breath that oft he gasped the prince enforcing his forfeebled voice said thus i thee conjure my soul delight by that dear love that made me first thy choice and thee from native soil to take thy flight if ever in my love thou didst rejoice if to command thee i have any right that thou still live as long as god shall grant thee and not despair however fortune daunt thee the almighty god from danger and from ill hath hitherto and will i trust thee save even as he sent that noble earl to kill those caitiffs that did keep thee in their cave and save thee from the biskin's wicked will first having thee preserved from salt sea wave live then my dear and trust in him above and while you live be mindful of my love these latter words his lips had scantly passed when death unto his heart was softly crept and as the lamp goeth out when oil doth waste, so quietly the noble Zerbin slept.
what tongue can tell how sore she was aghast how she lamented wailed mourned and wept to her own eyes and fair hair doing force when as she saw her dear a senseless course and grief had set her in so great a rage with zurbin's sword she thinks an end to make of her own life her sorrow to assuage neglecting those last words zurbino spake but lo a certain saint-like personage that sword from hand that thought from heart doth take a certain godly hermit and devout that was by hap abiding thereabout who came and said o oh, damsel leave despair man's nature weak and women's sex is frail fear him that rules both heaven and earth and air who saith the word and his word cannot fail that those that unto him for help repair and put their trust in him shall never quail then showed he her to prove his saying true examples out of scriptures old and new of saint-like women that in time of old their lives in prayer and chastity had spent and further to the damsel fair he told and proved and showed by reasons evident that worldly things are vain and have no hold alone in god is joy and true content in fine he makes to her this godly motion her future life to spend in true devotion his godly speech by help of heavenly grace poured in her heart by high divine infusion wrought such effect and found so great a place she ceased to seek or work her own confusion but leaving the profession of her race professed herself a christian in conclusion she gave herself to prayer and pure divinity and vowed to god her life and her virginity yet did she not remove out of her thought the fervent love zerbino had her born but by the hermit's help the course she brought and thinks it sin to leave it so forlorn and in some village thereabout she bought sweet balms to fill the flesh all cut and torn then in a cypress coffin she doth close it not being yet resolved where to dispose it that aged sire though being wise and staid yet would not trust in his own stay so well to carry such a fair and goodly maid to sojourn with him in his little cell twere peril great thus to himself he said that fire and straw should nigh together dwell wherefore he means to province her to carry and there to place her in a monastery but as he thitherward with isbel went and by the way devoutly did her teach all things unto religion pertinent and of the same most learnedly did preach behold a pagan fierce with foul intent this purpose and their journey doth impeach as i shall show more largely afterward now back i must return to mandricard who having ended that same cruel fight in which the worthest prince alive was slain soon after by a shady bank did light and turned his horse to grazing on the plain dame dorilus in whom he took delight alone with him in that place did remain when looking suddenly by chance aside an armed knight come toward them she spied she guessed but yet she knew not by the view who it might be until she spied her page that came with him then certainly she knew twas rodomont full of revenge and rage wherefore unto her knight she nearer drew and said my lord mine honor i dare gauge that yon is rodomont mine ancient lover who thinks by fight from you me to recover look how the falcon in the air doth mount when she espies a bitter or a hern so when this prince espied rodomont and by his haste his fury did discern like one that made of conquest full account he starteth up with visage grim and stern straight armed and horsed he is his foe to meet in hand the reins in stirrups are his feet when as the tone the t'other came so near as each might hearken what the other said fierce rodomont spake loud as he might hear with threatening gesture both of hand and head and said be sure i'll make thee buy it dear that with a short vain pleasure hast been led to do to one so foul and open wrong that can and will it wreak on thee ere long the tartar prince that for him little carried made answer thus in vain you do me threat poor boys with words or women may be scared not i that fight as willingly as eat prove when you please i am not unprepared at any time for any warlike feat on horse on foot in field or in the list 
I shall be ready, try me when you list. Thus words bred wrath, and wrath engendered blows, and blows increased their sharp avenging will. Even as the wind that first but calmly blows, but after more and more increasing still, at last it trees and houses overthrows, and seas and lands with tempest it doth fill, so cruel grew the fight, them two between, whose match might hardly in the world be seen. Their hearts were stout, so were their bodies strong, desire to win in both alike was great. One doth maintain, t'other would venge his wrong, and love their fury equally doth whet. In equal pays the fight endured long, nor each of t'other any gain could get. But each of them so firmly kept his ground, as if each inch thereof had cost a pound. Among an hundred blows the tartar smit, of which small hurt to Rodamount did rise, yet one at last so heavily did hit upon his helmet over both his eyes, his senses all were so amazed with it he thought he saw more stars than are in skies, and almost down he was even in her sight for whom he first began this cruel fight. But as a strong and justly tempered bow of Pymount steel, the more you do it bend, upon recoil doth give the bigger blow, and doth with greater force the quarrel send, even so the Sarsen king that stooped so low, as highly to revenge it doth intend, and to acquite himself of this disgrace he striketh at the Tartar prince's face. So fierce he strake, in this so furious mood, an inch or little more above his sight, that save those arms of Hector were so good, no doubt that blow had finished all the fight. But so astonned therewith the Tartar stood, he could not tell if it were noon or night. And while in this amazement he abode, the t'other ceaseth not to lay on load. The tartar's horse, that saw the glittering blade that rode amount about his head so tossed, did start aside, and with a turn he made, rescued his master, sore to his own cost. Down with the blow falls this unlucky jade, and with his starting he his life hath lost. To ward his head he wanted Hector's shield, and therefore dead he tumbleth on the field. Now came his master to himself again, inflamed with greater anger than before to see his horse so pitifully slain. But Rodamount forbears him ne'er the more, but spurs on him and thinks with fury main to bear him down. But he so strongly bore the push, and thrust with all Frontino back, he made his master glad to leave his back. Thus now, with minds more alien from all peace, in eager sort the combat is renewed, to strike, to thrust each other doth not cease, in hope with blood their swords to have embrued. Fell rancor, wrath, and pride do still increase, and death of one or both must have ensued, ere either of them would from thence have started, had not a certain messenger them parted. One that had travelled all about the coast to seek them out, to ask their help and aid, to raise the siege that by the Christian host unto the camp of Agrament was laid. Yet though he came in peace and eke in post, to speak to them at first he was afraid, and though his office were a sufficient warrant, yet to themselves he dares not do his errand. But seeing Dorilus, to her he told how Agrament, Marsilio, Stordelan, and others more, like men pent up in hold, were in great danger to be killed or ta'en. Wherefore he wisheth her for to unfold thus much to them that sought each other's bane, and to persuade them to so good accord as they might go and help their sovereign lord. She, that a woman was of passing sprite, and knew that neither of them would offend her, stepped them between, and charged them stay the fight, as they their honour and her love did tender, and help their king that is in woeful plight, and end this fray begun of cause so slender, at least defer so long to try this quarrel, till Agrament their king were out of peril. When she thus much to them declare it had, then doth the messenger declare the rest, and other strong persuasions he doth add, and doth expound to them their king's request, alleging that their absence made him sad, that but they help the camp would be distressed, and that if they to rescue him neglected, a present ruin were to be expected. With his report, and with her strong persuasion, the hardy knights the combat do defar, till agrament be freed from this invasion, and all the Christian forces moved are. Thus, of this friendly truce, she is occasion that first was causer of their deadly war. To her they bind themselves by solemn oath, 
that until then they will be quiet both. Their discord was in pride, and what they may they do this league to interrupt and break, but at that time love bear so great a sway that to withstand him they were both too weak. In vain it was to argue and gainsay when once Dame Doralus the word did speak. By her persuasion firmly they agreed, like friends, upon their journey to proceed. One only want there was that let them soar, which was that Mandricardo's horse was dead. But lo, even then came thither Brilliador, that since his master's madness there had fed. Full glad the prince of Tartar was, therefore, of such a horse so quickly to be sped. But, lest my tale with tediousness molest you, I wish you lay aside the book and rest you. End of book 24The twenty-fifth book of Orlando Furioso. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland. Orlando Furioso by Ludovico Ariosto. Translated by Sir John Harrington. Book twenty-five. The Argument. Rogero saveth to his fame and glory his spouse's brother that had else been dead, who doth recount to him the woeful story that so great danger unto him had bred. His cousin cheers them, though himself were sorry. Next morn they arm them all from foot to head, good Malagage and Vivian to relieve, whose thraldom did their kinsmen greatly grieve. The strife is great that grows in youthful mind when honour falls at variance with affection. Nor could it yet be known or well defined which passion keeps the t'other in subjection. For both allure, both do our judgments blind and both corrupt the heart with strong infection yet lo sometimes these hurts procure our weal even as one poison doth another heal for here you see these princes that of late strave fiercely ton the t'other to subdue agreed to respite this their sharp debate and to repair unto the turkish crew to succour agramant's distressed state to whom they ought in duty to be true and yet herein love claimeth half the praise for she commanded them to go their ways. And on they went without more disagreeing, fair Doralus with these her servants twain, the tone in suit, one in possession being, and yet as then in concord they remain. At last they came unto a place, where seeing four knights themselves did solace on a plain, of which two were unarmed, two armor bare, with them a lady was of beauty rare. With these a while they stayed, but who these were, and what they did, and whither then they went, a little while to tell I do forbear. For to Rogero now my tale is meant, who would no more the shield enchanted bear, but in the well did drown it, with intent that men might know his valiant deeds of arms were done by force of virtue, not of charms. He scant had gone a mile or little more from this same well, but that he met a post from agrament, of which there went good store the captains to recall unto the host. He told him how the king, besieged sore, and like if succour come not to be lost, commanded him as his true lord and liege to come without delay to raise the siege. Much was Rogero with the message moved, and diverse passions strave within his mind. He fain would have his prince's siege removed, yet loath he was to leave his love behind but be his doing praised or reproved he was so to the present cause inclined first with his guide he goes to stay the slaughter of him that had deflowered marsilio's daughter they came unto the place an hour ere night where this same execution should be done a castle that belonged to charles of right but late the spanish king the same had won and kept it in the midst of france by might by countenance of the great Trojano's son. Rogero cometh in, and none denied him, because they knew the damsel that did guide him. There first he saw prepared a flaming fire, in which they meant to burn the woeful youth. He thought so small a sin did not require such punishment, no more it doth in truth. But when he marked his face and his attire, and heard and saw the manner of his ruth, no, sure I know, quoth he, I am not I, or this is Bradamant that here should die. 
"'Tis certain she. I see which way it went. Belike, while I at yonder castle stayed, she hither came afore me with intent to bring unto the prisoner some aid, for which, poor soul, herself should now be shent. Yet I am glad and very well appaid that I am hither come in so good season to save her that should die against all reason. And even with that, most furiously he flies with naked sword upon the gazing rout. Whoever standeth in his way, he dies. With so great force he hurls his blade about. Then straight the prisoner's fetters he unties, nor was there one so hardy or so stout that once durst make resistance or forbid it. No, not so much as ask him why he did it. As fearful fowl that in the sunshine bright sit pruning of themselves upon a bank, when as the falcon doth among them light, fly without care of order or of rank, so when these caitiffs saw this noble knight, forthwith they from his manly presence shrank. So did their fearful hearts and courage fail them, when as they felt Rogero once assail them. No marvel, though, for why Rogero's force was not as men's that now born later are. The strength of lion, bear, or bull, or horse were nothing, if with his they do compare, and chief, sith now he doth himself in force to do as much as he or can or dare, hereby from danger thinking to recover her unto whom he was professed lover. Now, when the youth from danger quite was freed, and all that sought his death away were fled, he thanks the author of this worthy deed, and thanketh her that had him thither led, then when of help he stood in greatest need, when otherwise he doubtless had been dead and executed like a malefactor, agnizing him his lord and benefactor. And furthermore he doth Rogero pray to let him understand his name and nation. Rogero, musing to himself, doth say, What meaneth this so strange congratulation? In face, in shape, in gesture, in array, this is my love. I see no alteration. Yet strange it is, her voice should be so changed, more strange that she from me is so estranged. It doubtless is not she, for if it were, could she within three hours my name forget? Wherefore to tell his name he doth forbear until he may more perfect notice get. And thus he said, I have, I know not where, seen you ere this, and I bethink me yet where it might be, for sure I know your face though now I have forgot the time and place. Most noble sir, said t'other, I agree, you may have seen me, though I know not when, I rather judge it should my sister be that fights and carries arms as well as men. My mother at one birth bear her and me, and we be both so like that now and then our servants, yea, our father and our mother, have ta'en us in exchange the ton for t'other chiefly since in her head she had a wound for which she was constrained to cut her hair twere long the circumstances to expound how she was hurt and healed by whom and where since that between us difference none is found save sex and names that from our birth we bear she bradamant i richardet am called she sister and i brother to rinald and further, if you please, I shall you tell, as we do onward on our journey go, a strange mishap that under me befell, by being ta'en for her not long ago, a hap that at the first I like it well, but after wrought my danger great and woe. Yes, with good will, Rogero said, and then, young Richardetto, thus his tale began. It happened, as in part I touched before, my valiant sister, passing through a wood, was hurt with certain Saracens, so sore as had her cost almost her vital blood, which wound to cure her tresses short she wore, for so as then her surgeon thought it good. The wound once cured, for which her head was polled, abroad to go again she waxed bold, and having travelled till the heat of day, all clad in armour as her manner was, at noon she took occasion to make stay fast by a watery stream as clear as glass, and putting off her helmet, down she lay upon a pleasant bank well clothed with grass, and sleep at last her heavy eyes did close, the place inviting her to take repose. Now while she did there fast asleep remain, there happened to arrive unto that place the daughter of Marsilio, king of Spain, that there by chance was hunting in the chase and seeing signs of manhood very plain, with that her sweet and amiable face, as horse and sword and target all of steel, a little amorous passion she doth feel, 
and taking then my sister for a man, as by all circumstances well she might, she offers her all curtsy that she can, and asked her if in hunting she delight. And then to choose a standing they began, and finding one far off from other's sight, she opened more plainly that affection that had her heart already in subjection. And save her maiden modesty forbade, she would the same in words have plainly told, howbeit with sighs, with rueful looks and sad, and silent signs, she doth her grief unfold. And when she thus long time discourse it had, surprised with hope, she could no longer hold but steps unto her, and gives her such a kiss, as that alone shows what her meaning is. My sister at the first doth think it strange that such a suit should unto her be made, and finding she had ta'en her in exchange, she thinks it best, before she further weighed, or let the t'other's humour further range, tell troth. For thus she doth herself persuade, tis better to be known a lady gentle, than to be deemed a base man and ungentle. For what could be more cullen-like, or base, or fitter for a man were made of straw, than standing in a fair young lady's grace, to show himself a cuckoo or a daw, and lee's occasion both of time and place? My sister, therefore, that this ill foresaw, and knew she wanted that that her should aid, told her by circumstance she was a maid. And thus she told her how the worthy fame Hippolyta and stout Camilla won in deeds of arms moved her, her mind to frame to do the like, while others sewed and spun, and that she thought it to her sex no shame to do as women of such worth had done. She told her this in hope this would appease her, but this last did so much more disease her, for why the fancy was so firmly fixed, that in her mind she had before conceived, by means of speech had passed them betwixt, that sore it grieved her to be thus deceived, before her fear with some good hope was mixed, but now even hope itself was her bereaved, and this is one extremest point of grief, still to despair, and hope for no relief. He that had heard her woeful plaint and moan must needs have greatly at the same been grieved. Ah, woe is me, she said, that I alone should live in such despair to be relieved. In passed times I think there hath been none, in time to come it will not be believed, that love should make by such a strong infection one woman bear another such affection. O oh, Cupid, if thou didst my state envy, and that thou hadst a mind me to torment, to send such pains as others more do try at least, methink thou shouldst have been content, shall in so many ages none but I yield of so uncouth love such precedent? The female with the female doth not wish to couple, nor in beast, nor fowl, nor fish. I soul am found in earth, air, sea, or fire, in whom so strange a wonder thou hast done. On me thou show'st the power of thine ire, and what a mighty conquest thou hast won. The wife of Ninus had a strange desire to join in copulation with her son. Fair Myrrha with her sire was made a mother, and made Adonis both her son and brother. Pasiphae, except it be a tale, was bold, enclosed in a wooden cow. Yet in all these the female sought the male, but nature doth my fancy disallow. No Daedalus could remedy my bale, nor art can frame nor sense imagine how. This knot dame nature hath so firmly knit it cannot be dissolved by any wit. Thus Fiordis Bina fair, so was her name, in piteous sort her woeful state doth wail. My sister unto her her speech doth frame as chiefly to her comfort might avail, and wished her this unbridled will to tame, sith nature could not suffer it prevail, and that she would let that desire be daunted, which possibly by no means could be granted. All this, but all in vain, my sister said, to seek that fancy from her mind to rest. She that for comfort cared not, but for aid, doth more and more herself vex and molest. Now night grew on, as they together stayed, what time all creatures seek repose and rest. The lady prays my sister for her sake a lodging at her castle then to take. To this request doth Bradamant assent, and so together to that place they came, where I, but that you did my harm prevent, should have been cast into the burning flame. She that all kindness to my sister meant, 
by many outward curtsies showed the same, and caused her to wear a woman's weed, that men might know that she was one indeed, for why the semblance false she saw before of manly shape to her was so pernicious, she would now see her in those weeds no more, the rather eke lest folk should be suspicious, if she had been as showed the weed she wore, lest that they too did live together vicious. She further was by physic rules assured, that contraries by contraries are cured. But naught could salve the sore, nor swage her woes. That night they lay together in one bed, but sundry and unlike was their repose. One quiet slept, the t'other's troubled head still waking. Or, if she her eyes but close, that little sleep strange dreams and fancies bred, she thought the gods and heaven would so assist her into a better sex to change my sister. As men tormented with a burning fever do dream with drink they swage their grievous thirst, but when they wake they feel their thirst persever, and to be greater than it was at first, so she whose thoughts from love sleep could not sever did dream of that for which she waked did thirst, but waking felt and found it as before her hope still less, and her desire still more. How fervently did she to Macon pray! What vows did she unto her prayer annex, if so by mighty miracle he may her bedfellow turn to a better sex? Now near approached the dawning of the day, when she in vain herself doth grieve and vex, and so much more her passion grew the stronger, because my sister now would stay no longer. When Fiordespina saw she would be gone, she caused a gallant jennet to be brought, all richly barbed and furniture thereon, which with her own hand partly she had wrought. This, frankly, she bestoweth her upon. My sister takes it kindly as she ought, and takes her leave, and on her way doth get. And home she came, that night ere sun was set. We, that long time of her had heard no tiding, I mean her mother, brothers, and her kin, do welcome her, and ask of her abiding, why she so long from us had absent been, who straight from us the troth of nothing hiding, doth tell us how great danger she was in, and opened from the ending to beginning the course of all her leasing and her winning, as namely, first how hardly she had sped, and in a conflict had received a wound for which she was constrained to pole her head before her health she could recover sound. She told how fortune afterwards her led, where that fair huntress had her sleeping found. She told us how the lady did her woo, and all the circumstance that longed thereto. To hear this story I was passing glad, for why at Saragossa I had seen this Fiordespina, and some knowledge had of her likewise when she in France had been, and liked her well. Yet was I not so mad in vain to set my love on such a queen, but now, again, I gave that fancy scope, when by this tale I had conceived some hope. Love was my counsellor that me advised, my meaning, secret, I to none impart. This was the stratagem that we devised, this was the plot, the cunning, and the art, to go in Bradamanta's clothes disguised, and for a while to play the woman's part. I knew my face, my sister so resembling, would be the better help for my dissembling. The day ensuing, ere it yet was light, I took my way, my love and fancy guiding. I there arrived an hour before it was night, such hap I had, such haste I made in riding. No sooner came I in the servant's sight, but well was he of me could carry tiding. They look, as princes oft to give to use, some recompense for bringing so good news. Straight out she came, and met me half the way, and took me fast about the neck, and kissed me, and told me how in this my little stay, in anguish great and sorrow, she had missed me. Then she did cause me alter mine array, in which with her own hands she doth assist me. A cowl of gold she set upon my crown, and put on me a rich and stately gown, and for my part, to help the matter, I did take great heed to all I did or said. With sober cast I carried still mine eye, and bare my hands before me like a maid. My voice did serve me worse, but yet thereby such heed I used, my sex was not berayed. And thus arrayed, my princess led me with her, where many knights and ladies were together. 
my looks and clothes did all them so beguile they all had thought i had a woman been and honor such was done to me that while as if i were a duchess or a queen and that which made me often time to smile some youths there were of years and judgment green that cast upon me many a wanton look my sex and quality they so mistook at last came meat both store of flesh and fish what kinds of both to tell i overslip i maidenly taste here and there a dish and in the wine i scant to wet my lip the time seemed long that stayed my wanton wish and still i doubted taking in some trip when bedtime came she told me i must be her bedfellow the which well pleased me now when the maids and pages all were gone one only lamp upon the cupboard burning and all coasts clear thus i began anon fair dame i think you muse of my returning and cause you have indeed to muse thereon for yesterday when i did leave you mourning i think both you and i did think as then we should not meet again till god knows when first let me tell you why from you i went then why i came hereafter i shall show dear lady thus it was i did lament your fruitless love on me was placed so and though i could have a been well content to wait on you and never part you fro yet since my presence did but make you languish i thought mine absence minish would your anguish but riding on my way i somewhat strayed as fortune and adventure did me guide and lo i heard a voice that cried for aid within the thicket by the riverside a satyr taken had a naked maid and with a twisted cord her hands had tied and in his usage seemed so to threaten her as if that he would kill her straight and eat her i rushed to them with naked sword in hand and death to him and freedom i did give her she diving under water out of hand unrecompensed thou shalt not me deliver quoth she for i will have you understand i am a nymph that dwell here in this river and for this curtsy i do much regard you and am well able richly to reward you ask of me what you list and i will give it for i upon the elements have power i can with charms bring down the moon believe it i can swage storms and make fair weather lower what is so hard but my skill can achieve it to drain the sea or build in air a tower yea even with simple words and if i will i can enforce and make the sun stand still when as the nymph had made me this great offer lo lady what great love to you i bear i neither asked with gold to fill my coffer nor victory of which some greedy are this favor only i demanded of her to make me able to assuage your care nor named i any means for fear of erring the only way and means to her referring no sooner this request to her i told but in the crystal stream again she dived and sprinkled me with drops of water cold which to my skin no sooner were arrived but i was changed from that i was of old and of my former state i was deprived i felt i saw yet scant believe i can that of a woman i was made a man and saving that even now i am so nigh you as you may quickly prove my tale not feigned else you might think i said it but to try you now lo since i for you this wish obtained ask what you please i nothing shall deny you enjoy that which my love for you hath gained when i had pleaded thus and she had heard it on sight of evidence she gave her vaudit as one whose state is overwhelmed with debt by lending or by spending out of measure that looks each hour when prowling shreves will fet himself to ward and of his goods make seizure if some unlooked-for gain he hap to get by some man's death or by some trophy treasure is so surprised with joy he scant doth know if true it be or if he dreamed so so she that now did see and feel and touch that which she long had longed for in vain it overfilled her mind with joy so much it seemed in a trance she did remain therein her incredulity was such as to resolve her i did take much pain if these be dreams quoth she for these dreams sake i ever wish to dream and never wake 
not sound of drum, of trumpet, or of fife, nor warlike instrument of any sort did sound alarum to our friendly strife, but dove-like billing followed lovely sport. This battle hazards neither limb nor life. Without a ladder I did scale the fort, and stoutly plant my standard on the wall, and under me I made my foe to fall. If that same bed were full the night before of tears, of plaints, of anguish and annoys, no doubt but now it had in as great store both smilings, sports, and solaces and joys. No ivy doth embrace the pillar more than she did me, nor apes can find more toys than we young fools did find to make us merry, till joy itself of joy did make us weary. The thing twixt us did secret long remain, and certain months this pleasure did endure till some had found and told it to my pain as you well know that did my life assure yet i confess great grief i still sustain not knowing how her safety to procure this richardetto to rogero told and all the while their journey on they hold by that time richardetto's tale was done they gan up to a little hill to mount and when an hour and more was set the sun, they came unto the castle Agrismount, kept then by Aldiger, the bastard son of Bovo, of the house of Claramount, a wise and sober man, and of good quality, and bountiful in keeping hospitality. And after he had bid them welcome both, one as his kinsman, t'other is his friend, I hear ill news, quoth he, that I am loath to tell to you, lest it should you offend, but thus it is, to let you know the troth, I hear that Bertolage doth sure intend to buy the prisoners that Farrah hath ta'en, as namely Malagige and Vivienne. Lanfusa taketh upon her to sell them, and, as I hear, to-morrow is the day. Unto your brothers I send one to tell them, but they be absent hence so far away, as ere they come, from hence they may expel them. I am too weak to force, too poor to pay. My love is great to wish all good unto them, but power so small as good I can none do them. Young Richard Detto much misliked the news, so did Rogero for the t'other's sake. And when he saw they both were in a muse, nor knew what counsel or what course to take, No fear, quoth he, let me this matter use. On me this enterprise I'll undertake. So I shall handle this affair so handsome, this sword alone shall pay your kinsman's ransom. This spake Rogero, his companions cheering, but notwithstanding, Aldiger, his host, gave to those lofty promises such hearing as if there were great boast and little roast, which unto Richardetto plain appearing, who knew his value greater than his host, good cousin, if you knew him well that said it, you would, said he, unto his word give credit. Then Aldiger, on better information, gave ear and credit to his noble guest, and made him cheer to suit his reputation, and placed him at the board above the rest. And, supper done, he was in seemly fashion in chamber lodged of all the house the best. The master of the house, in nothing scant, his worthy guest will suffer nothing want. Now was the time when all men soundest sleep, Rogero only cannot sleep a wink, for cares and thoughts that him do waking keep, and in his troubled brain profoundly sink. The siege of agrament doth pierce him deep, and what dishonor men of him may think, and deem his heart but faint, his faith but fickle, to leave his sovereign in so woeful pickle. Had he revolted at some other time, men might have thought that true religion moved him. None could have it imputed as a crime, nor no man probably could have reproved him. Now, when his master's fortune did decline, and when to aid him chiefest it behooved him, fear, men will think, his change procured chief, not just remorse, nor zeal of true belief. This troubled him, and little less than this it troubled him to think of his dear heart, whom now by evil fortune he doth miss, nor cannot once salute ere he depart. Wherefore, to write to her his purpose is, and so to her at large his mind impart, both that of him she may have certain news, as that he may his sudden going skews. The chamberlains, both prudent and discreet, upon Rogero quick attendance gave, 
providing him of needful things and meat, ink, paper, light, and what he else would crave. Then, as the manner is, he doth her greet upon the front, as letters used to have, thus after very hearty commendations, or some such phrase of friendly salutations. Then he tells her how that the Turkish prince had for his aid by special message sent, who is besieged, and hath been long time since, and how to rescue him is his intent, lest men of cowardice might him convince that he away in time of danger went, and now would leave his lawful lord and liege, then when his enemies did him besiege. He prayeth her to weigh how foul a deed, how full it were of infamy and shame to yield his prince no aid in such a need, that sent to him a purpose for the same. He wished her for her own sake to take heed that no such stain might spot her spouse's name, that being she, so true and so sincere, she should no blemish in her husband bear. He further doth his zeal to her protest, as erst he had in word, so now in writing, and swears that when his prince were undistressed, the siege quite raised by concord or by fighting, that foolish people might not make a jest to his reproach, that common speech reciting, Rogero loves to take the surer side, and turns his sails as fortune turns her tide. I shall, he writes, when that time doth expire, which in a month, I hope, will be effected, find some occasion from them to retire, and of no breach of honor be suspected. Then shall I full accomplish your desire, and do as I by you shall be directed. This only for my honor I demand thee, and after this thou ever shalt command me. These things, and like to these, Rogero rate, as then by hap came in his troubled head, to certify his love of his estate, and of the cause that his departure bred. By that time he had done, it was full late, and then again he caught him to his bed, and closed his eyes when he had closed the letter, and after took his ease a great deal better. Next day they all arose at break of day with mind to go to set their kinsmen free, and though Rogero earnestly did pray that none might take that enterprise but he, yet both the other stiffly said him nay, and thereunto by no means would agree. Unto the place assigned they ride together, and by the time appointed they came thither. The place they came to was a goodly plain in which no tree nor bush was to be seen. Here Bertolage did point to take them twain, as was agreed, Lanfus and him between. But first they met, while here they did remain, one that a phoenix bare in field all green, with armor fair embossed and gilt with gold, as in the book that follows shall be told. End of book 25The twenty sixth book of Orlando Furioso. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland. Orlando Furioso by Ludovico Ariosto. Translated by Sir John Harrington. Book twenty six. The Argument. The learned Malagage strange riddles shows to his companions out of Merlin's well. With Mandricard the Sarsen thither goes, and each took quarrels new as there befell for discord seed of strife among them sows. But Dorilus's horse, by fiend of hell affrighted, doth his mistress bear away, which caused the pagans both break off the fray. Right worthy dames there were in times of old that more esteemed of virtue than of wealth. But now our iron age is all for gold, for bad and worse in sickness and in health. But she that will that elder custom hold, and leave this new, deserves, where'er she dwelleth, here in this life to have a happy choice, and in the next for ever to rejoice. Such was the noble Bradamantus' mind, who sought not after wealth and rich ability, nor state nor pomp that many women blind, but after virtue pure, the true nobility, and well deserved he to find her kind that showed in him such proofs of high gentility, and took upon him actions for her sake, which time to come for miracles may take. Rogero, as before I did recite, with Aldiger and Ricciardetto came to rescue those two prisoners, if they might, that should be sold with great reproach and shame. 
I told you how they met a gallant knight, Who shield had painted that same bird of fame, That still renews itself and never dies, And only one in all the world there flies. Now when this knight was of these three aware, That stood like men new placed in battle ray, He comes to them, and seeing what they are, Will there, quoth he, some one of you assay, If so his value can with mine compare, With staff, with sword, or any other way? If any will, come then, and let us try it. If none, then say so quickly, and deny it. Sir, answered Aldiger, I were content to try myself with you a bout or two, But we three came not here for this intent. We come a greater feat than this to do, And at this time, a little time misspent may hinder us, and little pleasure you. We three intend, if God do say amen, to take two prisoners from six hundred men. Sure, said the other, if you mind indeed so great an enterprise to take in hand, no doubt it doth a valiant mind proceed, and pity were your purpose to withstand. I rather shall assist you in this deed, if you vouchsafe to make me of your band, and by my service I will quickly show good proof, if I deserve such grace or no. Perhaps that some would know, and if they may, what valiant knight this was that did entreat to take Rogero's part in such a fray, whereas the danger could not be but great. Now she, not he, hereafter I must say, Marfisa was, of whom I did repeat, how she both fought and foiled a little since, and with Gebrina charged the Scottish prince. Rogero stout, and they of Claremont, of her and of her offer well esteemed. She joined with them, they making full account that she had been of that same sex she seemed. Straight ready on their horses' backs they mount. They see a loof, a cornet, as they deemed, of horse and mingled some on foot together, and all of them directly tending thither. Their march, their ensigns, pennons, and their flags did cause for moors they known were and descried. Amid this crew, upon two little nags the prisoners rode, with hands behind them tied, that must be changed for certain golden bags that Bertolage had promised to provide. Come, saith Marfisa, to the other three, now let the feast begin, and follow me. Soft, quoth Rogero, there be wanting some of those that to the banquet must be bidden, and to begin afore the guests become, in reason and good manners is forbidden. By this the t'other crew had overcome the hill that late before from them were hidden. These were the traitorous wretches of Magans, and now was ready to begin the dance. Maganza men of one side, merchant-like, brought laden moils with gold and costly ware. The moors their prisoners brought with sword and pike, environed round about with heed and care. The captains meet with mind a match to strike. The prisoners present at the bargain are, and now are bought and sold for aught they know to Bertolage, their old and mortal foe. Good Aldiger and noble Ammon's son could hold no longer seeing Bertolage, but both together at him they do run, with hearts all set on fierce revenge and rage. His force nor fate their fury could not shun, their spears his armor and his breast did gauge. Down falls the wretch, his wealth him cannot save. Such end I wish all wicked wretches have. Marfisa and Rogero at this sign set out without expecting trumpet's blast, and with two staves of straight well-seasoned pine twice twenty men unto the ground they cast. The captain of the moors doth much repine, they of Maganza murmur it as fast. For each side deemed, as they might in reason, that this had happened by the t'other's treason. Wherefore each side, with wrath and fury kindled, upbraiding ton the t'other with untruth, with swords and bills pell-mell together mingled, do fight, and then a bloody fray ensueth. The Moorish duke was by Rogero singled, a man even then in prime and strength of youth, but youth nor strength nor armor could not save him from such a blow as good Rogero gave him. Marfisa doth as much on t'other side, and in such sort bestirred her with her blade, that look which way soever she did ride, an open lane for her the people made. If any were so stout the brunt to bide, yet soon they found their forces overlaid. Through coats of proof they proved her sword would enter. She sent their souls below the middle center. 
if you have seen the honey-making bees to leave their hives and going out in swarms when as their kings and masters disagrees and they make camps in there like men-at-arms straight in among them all the swallow flees and eats and beats them all unto their harms so think rogero and marfisa then did deal among these bands of armed men now aldiger and richardet no less upon marganza merchants lay on load both free to set their kinsmen from distress and for they hated them like snake or toad they that the cause nor quarrel could not guess and saw their captain dead made short abode their plate their coin and treasure all they yield and were the first that faintly left the field so fly from lions silly herds of goats that have devoured and spoiled them at their list and torn their sides their haunches and their throats yet none of them their fellows dare assist so fled these men and cast away their coats and weapons all and durst no more resist nor marvel if these two had lions hearts that ready find such two to take their parts whose acts at large to tell i do refrain at which that age did not a little wonder and now to tell them men would think i fain yea though my words their actions far were under for at one blow oft horse and man was slain from head to foot whole bodies cloven in sunder and either standing on their reputation bred for their foes a costly emulation still ton of them marked t'other's valiant deed and each of t'other fell in admiration she deems him mars or one of mars's seed and far above all human generation and save he was deceived in her weed he would have given her equal commendation and likened her as well he liken might unto bellona for her valiant fight thus of two bands these four the battle won and all their stuff and carriages they got the prisoners loosed their bands were all undone their foes all foiled such is their happy lot the man was well whose horse could swiftest run small count they make of amble or of trot the tun side leaves their gold on asses loaden the t'other of their captives are forboden the noble vanquishers do seize the prey which was both rich and sumptuous to behold of flanders work and hanging rich and gay to hang a stately room of silk and gold they also found rich clothing and array that should have been unto lanfusa sold and namely among the rest a gallant gown embroidered round with cost of many a crown they further found good victuals and good store wine bottles cool and fresh and good of taste with which not having et that day before they do agree to bait and break their fast and every one prepares himself therefore and to that end their curates they unlaced now when marfisa had put off her beaver to be a woman each one doth perceive her her golden hair trussed up with careless art her forehead fair and full of stately grace her eye her lip and every other part so suiting to her comely shape and face as bred even then in each beholder's heart a reverend love and wonder in like case and straight they asked her name the which she told them and with as great delight she doth behold them but she herself far more than all the rest rogero's shape and person doth regard his value great his unappalled breast before the others all she much preferred to him alone her speeches she addressed of him alone she would her speech were hard thus she in him and he delighted in her the while the other had prepared their dinner the place they dined in was a pleasant cave and one of four that famous merlin wrought where he in milk-white marble did engrave strange stories which things future strangely taught the very images seemed life to have and saving they were dumb you would have thought both by their looks and by their lively features that they had moved and had been living creatures from out a desert wood an ugly beast there seemed to come whose shape was thus defined an ass's ears a wolf in head and breast a carcass all with pinching famine pined a lion's grisly jaw but all the rest to fox-like shape did seem to be inclined in england france in italy and spain yea all the world this monster seemed to reign where ere this cruel monster set his foot he killed and spoiled of every sort and state no height of birth or state with him did boot he conquered kings and clowns all in a rate 
yea this beast's power had tamed so deep a root it entered in christ's vicar's sacred gate and vexed cardinals and bishops chief and bred a scandal even in our belief unto this beast men seemed to bow and bend this beast break through each wall and every fence no city could itself therefrom defend strong castles made from it but weak defence in fine her power did seem so far extend that many were so fond and void of sense to think and to believe this monster fell had power of all things both in heaven and hell but when this beast had ranged a while behold one wearing on his head a laurel crown with three that wore the flower de luce of gold embroidered richly on their purple gown and with these three a stately lion bold did join his force to put the monster down the titles and the names that then concerned might in their garments plainly be discerned one that with sword the beast thrusts in the paunch was he whose praise no time shall ever smother francis the first of that name king of france of austria maximilian is another then charles the fifth that with a mighty lance smites through the beast from toneside to the tother the fourth that in the breast with arrow wounds him was henry the eight the writing so expounds him leo the tenth the lion fierce is called who chased him and fast caught him by the ear and in the chase the beast so tired and galled as others took him while he held him there by this the world seemed freed that erst was thralled by this men seemed secure and void of fear seeing that beast whose look late made them tremble stroyed by the power of this so brave assemble this story so set forth as i have told with costly workmanship great pleasure bred in all their minds that did the same behold and on this sight more than their meat they fed and chief marfisa wished to hear it told what men these were if men already dead or else a prophecy of things ensuing by hidden skill laid ope to each man's viewing then malagigi was by them requested as one in mathematics seen right well and had the method thereof so digested as he all hidden mysteries could tell to show what monster thus the world molested and who be these that him from earth expel for though they saw their names they did not know them but he they knew by his great skill could show them know then quoth he that these whose names appear in marble pure did never live as yet but long time hence after six hundred year to their great praise in princely throne shall sit merlin the english prophet placed them here in arthur's time and by his passing wit set here as yet their unperformed deeds and noted all their names upon their weeds this beast you saw had first her habitation beneath amongst the wicked fiends of hell and stayed there till that wicked generation i mean the iron age on earth did dwell when none durst trust without an obligation when fraud first came tween them that buy and sell and when the mighty to their great reproach first on the poor man's livings did encroach then first this monster cruel got abroad and ever since her power doth still increase and wheresoe'er she maketh her abode there is no friendship firm or godly peace conscience and justice under foot are trod good government and wholesome laws do cease that python phoebus killed with thousand darts was monster less than this by thousand parts thus malagigi said and then he told who those should be that should the monster kill that should come then when as the world were old that should renew each good and mend each ill whose names in sacred style to be enrolled deserve and to be praised and honored still that should in time to come as he did conster with bounty kill that miserable monster those five i named and more by five times five mine author names that hope to slay the beast rogero and the rest the time did drive in such like talk during the present feast and ere they rose behold there did arrive unto this cave unwares another guest by name that maid from whom of late by force fierce rodomont had ta'en rogero's horse she having heard by hap upon the way her mistress brother was at merlin's cave where she had been herself another day not thinking now rogero there to have him when she saw 
she not one word doth say to him nor any show or inkling gave like one that knew so well to do her errand as she durst go some time beside her warrant but unto richard she frames her tale yet so as t'other might her speeches hear how one from her a gallant courser stale which bradamant her mistress held full dear the horse quoth she from tyno she did call and i had led him thirty mile well near marsilia toward where she bade me stay and pointed me to meet me at a day so fond was i i feared no man's force nor doubted no man's will to do me wrong when once i should but show them how the horse unto rinaldo's sister did belong yet one fierce pagan void of all remorse met me and took him from me and ere long did meet a foe with whom i fighting left him that hath i hope by this of life bereft him rogero with this tale was so much moved that scant hereof hippolca made an end but richardetto straight by him was moved yea and conjured as he would be his friend that this attempt might soul by him be proved and but this damsel none might him attend that she may bring him to the pagan sight that took away her horse against all right stout richardet though thinking too much wrong so oft to let another undertake those enterprises that to him belong yet sith so earnestly rogero spake he gives consent and t'other stayed not long but of the company his leave doth take and leaves them all in wonder great to see that such high worth could in a young man be now when ipalca was quite out of sight she opened to rogero all the troth how she that counts him her beloved knight and voweth to be his by solemn oath sent her of purpose to him this last night which she before concealed as being loath her mistress brother should her counsel know how she that horse upon him did bestow she told him how that he that took the steed did add these proud and scornful words beside because it is rogero's horse indeed so much the rather on that horse i ride and if he will be grieved at this my deed tell him i do not mind myself to hide for i am rodomont he said whose name where'er i pass filleth the world with fame one might have seen it in rogero's face in how great dudgeon this great wrong he took both for the gift and giver in like case and gross abuse for which he did not look he thinks what infamy and foul disgrace it were to him so great despite to brook which if he would then justly everybody might take him for a dastard and a noddy wherefore with heart upon revenge full set he followeth forthwith his female guide she that did think the fray unparted yet that rodomont and mandricardo tried by dark blind ways the nearest she could get unto the place directly she did ride but as you heard they had deferred the quarrel and hastened thence to help their liege from peril and as i touched before their hap them brought unto the foresaid merlin's famous cave there where before good malagigi taught what secret meaning all the pictures have now had marfisa by the rest besought put on a woman's garment passing brave which lately for lanfusa had been made and so attired refreshed her in the shade when that tartarian prince had spied this dame straight in his mind he plots this new-found drift i will thought he by conquest win the same and give her rodomonte as my gift as though that love were but a sport and game that might be sold and changed for a shift for why he thought what needs a man complain if leasing one he do another gain wherefore the t'other's damage to repair and that he might his own in quiet have and for marfisa seemly was unfair as no man need a dame more comely crave he doth forthwith unto them make repair denouncing straight the challenge stout and brave that he with those four knights at tilt would run till they slew him or he their lady won straight stepped out malagidge and vivian both pressed in her defence to break a spear not fearing to encounter man to man with those two pagans they saw present there but when the fray between them now began fierce rodomont stood still and doth forbear as coming thither with another mind and not to change his purpose first assigned now of the brothers vivian was the first that with great might the pagan did invade upon whose crest in vain his spear he burst 
His blow no hurt it did, no sign it made. His force was least, so was his fortune worst. For Mandricard, more perfect in his trade, with so great strength and skill his spear enforced, that he was overthrown and quite unhorsed. To venge his brother Malagigi thought, but of his thought he quickly was deceived. His force thus overmatched prevailed not. From off his saddle he was quickly heaved. Next Aldiger his coming dearly bought, for in his side a great wound he received. So down upon the grass he fell half dead, his visage waxing pale, his armor red. Then Richardetto came with mighty lance, and proved himself by his great force to be worthy the name of Paladin of France, as oft his foes did feel, his friends did see. But at this time one overthwart mischance did hap, that down among the rest lay he. His horse, wherein he put so great a trust, fell down with him and tumbled in the dust. When as no other champion did appear, but all were overthrown in this late fight, thinking this conquest now obtained clear, without more stay he from his horse doth light, and coming unto her with smiling cheer, Fair dame, quoth he, you now are mine by right, you cannot deny or once excuse it, for by the laws of battle so we use it. Indeed, Marphisa said, it were no wrong, and I were yours I grant by law of war, if I were theirs, or did to them belong that you have foiled in this present jar, but I shall make you know, I hope, ere long, you miss your mark, your aim did greatly are. I am mine own, mine owner is within me, he that will have me from myself must win me. I handle can, quoth she, both sword and spear, and have ere this made more than one man bleed. Then called she for her armor which was there, which by a page was brought to her with speed. Off goeth her gown, and, for she still did wear a slender truss beneath her woman's weed, her well-shaped limbs therein were plainly seen, in shape like Mars, in face like Egypt's queen. When at all pieces she was armed round, she vaunteth nimbly up into her seat, and twice or thrice she makes her horse to bound, to bait a little of his furious heat, and makes a turn or two above the ground. Then turns she to her foe to do her feet. Such was, I judge, Penthesilea's fight against Achilles, famous Greekish knight. Thus each themselves upon their horse advances, and with their couched spears forthwith they run. Up in a thousand splinters flies the lances, but unto them no hurt at all is done. The pagan greatly marvels how it chances that she should scape and curses moon and sun, and she with her success as ill-content blasphemeth eke the heavens and firmament. Then they essayed with swords most dreadful dint to wound the ton the t'other and to kill. Their strokes were such as might have pierced the flint, and to their force was joined passing skill. They lay on load amain, and do not stint. The sound doth all the place with echo fill, but never was it more for their behoof to have their armor of so passing proof. But while they now did most apply the fray, fierce Rodomont doth step them both betwixt, and blames him much for making such delay of that which late by him was firmly fixed. And then with courteous speech he doth her pray with lowly words and lofty, quaintly mixed, that she would help to aid Trojano's son, whose tents were in much danger to be won. To this request Marphisa doth assent, as well to help King Agrament thereby, as for she came to France with that intent, the forces of the paladins to try. This while Rogero, wroth and malcontent, after the stealer of his horse, doth hie, and having found of him the perfect track, he sends again his guide Hippolca back. And, for he thought that none could do it better, the messenger he makes her of his mind, and sends by her his lately written letter, protesting he will still continue kind, and that he doth himself acknowledge debtor, and would himself to her for ever bind. He only prays her for a time, excuse his absence, which he would not, might he choose. With this dispatch, Hippolca went her way, and came to Mount Albano that same night. Rogero made but very little stay until he had Frontino in his sight, which, seen and known, forthwith there was no way but he will have his horse again or fight with him that had with so unnoble force the damsel robbed of the gallant horse. 
and straight in show of war he couched his spear and to his face the pagan he defied but rodomont doth patiently forbear even as a job and all his words abide not that of him he had one spark of fear for his great value often had been tried but that the danger of his lord and king weighed more with him than any other thing wherefore he gently tells him for what cause he may not fight and him exhorted so what all divine and what all human laws unto his prince commands a man to do i said rogero am content to pause in this respect and make a truce with you so that this horse again to me you render which so to take your reason was but slender now while these two herein do square and brave the tartar king doth under them approach and when he saw what arms rogero gave he set another brabble straight abroach mine are quoth he these arms that now you have how dare you on my titles thus encroach the cause why mandricardo spake these words was that rogero gave the king of birds an eagle argent in a field of blue rogero gave while on the crest of troy as one that thence derived his pedigree and did by due descent the same enjoy but hereof mandricardo nothing knew or not believed and called it but a toy and took it as an injury and scorn to see the same by any other worn for he himself did give as for his coat that bird that bare up ganymede on high ere since he wan as they before did note don hector's arms and when such praise thereby the good success hereof makes him afloat so that he did rogero straight defy i shall quoth he some better manners teach thee than in such saucy sort to overreach thee as wood well dried will quickly fall on fire if so a man a little do it blow so was rogero kindled now in ire to hear the pagan reprehend him so thou think'st quoth he to have thy fond desire by charging me now with a double foe but know that i my party good will make from him mine horse from thee mine arms to take did not we two about this matter board and then to take thy life i did abstain because that by your side i saw no sword but now sith you begin this brawl again this shall be fight indeed that was but word and that your crest shall turn you to much pain which unto me descent and propagation hath left but you do hold by usurpation nay thou usurp'st the t'other straight doth say and with that word he durindana drew that sword that erst orlando flang away and then a cruel fray was like ensue but straight the t'other two did cause them stay and chiefly rodomont did seem to rue that mandricard of lightness showed such token that twice by him his promise had been broken first when to get marphisa he had thought he had conflicted more than twice or thrice and now with t'other quarrelled for naught about a bird or some such fond device nay then quoth he if needs you would have fought we two should try the title of our prize which by consent should stand still undecided until our prince's safety were provided wherefore for shame do as you have agreed and let us cease and lay all quarrels by and when our prince from danger shall be freed the first between us two the matter try and after if you live you may proceed to fight it out with him and so will i though well i wot when i have done with you but little will remain for him to do tush saith the tartar prince for him nor thee nor all the world beside i pass one straw for though you fight or though you do agree of neither of you both i stand in awe as water in a spring so strength in me shall still supply much more than you can draw i hope by that time i have done my feet from head to foot with blood i'll make you sweat thus one ill word another doth draw on and wrathful mandricard them both defies rodomont would have peace but they would none if this speak sharp then that more sharp replies if one strife be compounded yet anon another strife as bad or worse doth rise in vain marphisa labours to compound them for more and more untoward still she found them even as the painful husbandman doth think by care to keep the river in his bounds that swells with rain ready to pass the brink and overflow his mode or so it grounds 
he strengthens every place that seems to shrink yet more and more the water still abounds and while he stops one vent another groweth till over all perforce at last it floweth so when the dame of whom i last made mention saw how rogero stout and mandricard with rodomont continued in contention and each would seem for t'other too too hard she willing to compound the sharp dissension persuades them but they little it regard for still as one at her request forbears the other two are at it by the ears when as she saw their fury still increase let either us quoth she our prince assist and in the meantime let all quarrels cease or if you in this fury still persist then i with mandricard will have no peace do herein quoth rogero as you list for i resolved am to have my horse although it be by fair means or by force then do said rodomont your worst and best for with that horse to part i not agree but here before you all i do protest that if our king by this day damaged be and that for want of aid he be distressed the cause thereof did not proceed of me rogero little weighs his protestation but firmly holds his first determination and at the sarzen furiously he flies and with his shoulder gave him such a thrust he lost his stirrups and so loosed his thighs that hard he scaped lying in the dust what hold rogero mandricardo cries either not fight or fight with me you must and in great rage as that same word he spake rogero's beaver with great might he strake the blow was such as made him forward lean and ere that he himself again could rear upon him smote the son of uliane with so great strength as no strength might it bear that had his armor been of temper mean no doubt they had an end made of him there rogero's hands fly ope with senseless pain the ton his sword the t'other leaves his rein his horse away bears him about the green and balisard his blade is left behind marfisa that had to rogero been fellow in arms that day was grieved in mind to see him used so hardly them between and being strong of limbs and stout by kind she smiteth mandricardo on the crown so hard as once not much to fell him down after rogero rodomont doth get him and now frontino had well nigh been won but by the way stout richardetto met him and with him joined his cousin bovo's son tun jostles him and further off doth set him the t'other namely vivian doth run unto rogero that by this was waked and lends his sword unto his right hand naked now back he doth return enraged with scorn minding to pay his damage home again even as a lion whom the bull hath borne upon his head is full of fierce disdain flies at him still nor fears his cruel horn his anger making him forget his pain and on his beaver with such force he thundered as though he would his head in twain have sundered and sure he had performed it very near if balisarda had been in his hand which he let fall as you before did hear now when as discord saw how things did stand she thinks no peace can possibly be here and taking pride her sister by the hand now sister let us turn us to our friars for here quoth she are raised sufficient fires and so away they went and let them go and let me tell you how rogero sped who gave to rodomont so fierce a blow that such a great amazement it inbred that twice or thrice he reeled to and fro frontino with this senseless master fled also his sword had fallen out of his fist but that a chain did tie it to his wrist this while marfisa held the t'other tack and yet on either side the conquests weighed each had so good an armor on their back of piercing it they need not be afraid yet by a chance marfisa happed to lack and likewise happed to have rogero's aid for in a turn she made her horse did trip and in the dirt upon one side did slip and as again he labored up to rise the cruel tartar jostled him so cross that on his side the horse constrained lies foundering again upon the slimy moss which when rogero from aloof espies how near she was to danger great and loss he steps to mandricard fiercely assailing him while rodomont stands mazed his senses failing him 
the tartar doth as fiercely him resist but yet rogero strake so great a blow both to avenge himself and her assist whom mandricardo hap to overthrow that sure i think that blow had little missed quite to have cloven him to the saddle-bow save that the tartar's armor was so hard and that rogero wanted balisard by this the sarzan king again did wake and seeing none but richardetto near he calls to mind how for rogero's sake that youth to him was troublesome while e'er straight with great rage he toward him doth make minding to make him buy that curtsy dear and sure good richardetto had repented it but that his cousin with great art prevented it his cousin malagage whose skill was great in all that doth to magic art pertain with words that he without book could repeat did conjure up a sprite of hellish train and by this means he works a passing feat for though he named no place he doth ordain this sprite in Doralus's horse to enter and bear her thence away at all adventure the sprite thus conjured quickly doth his part into the damsel's gentle nag he crept and so his quiet nature did pervart that on the sudden thirty foot he leapt and ten foot high yet with so easy start that dorilice still the saddle kept yet cried she out in doubt to have miscarried for in the divil's name she thence was carried forthwith to help her rodomonte goth because she fled and cried to him for aid to stay behind the tartar is as loath for fear between them he may be betrayed he leaves rogero and marfisa both nor in the place so little time he stayed as to accord with them upon some truce or make at least some mannerly excuse this while marfisa was got up again and now she means to venge her on her foe but he was gone at which in great disdain she frets and chafes that he had served her so rogero chafes as much for all in vain he knew it would be after them to go they know their steeds and this doth grieve them more cannot outrun frontine and brilliador wherefore supposing as it was indeed that they were gone unto the turkish host to follow them forthwith these two agreed though not to follow as they went in post not doubting but when agrament were freed at leisure them to meet and to their cost they onward go but yet rogero meant to bid his friends farewell afore he went down from his horse he gently doth descend and richardetto he aside doth take and promised him for a to be his friend and to his noble sister for his sake to whom said he i pray you me commend yet in such pretty sort the same he spake his inward love was not thereby detected nor her great love to him one whit suspected thus solemn leave once ta'en on either side and proffers of great love and curtsy made to him was hurt and all the rest beside as still among great nobles is the trade rogero with marfisa on doth ride but how they did the christian camp invade and what great loss did charles thereby receive in next ensuing book you may perceive end of book twenty six the twenty seventh book of orlando furioso this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by thomas copeland orlando furioso by ludovico ariosto translated by sir john harrington Book twenty seven. The argument. Rogero and those other pagan kings make Charles again to Paris walls retire. Among the Turks, new seed of quarrel springs, and kindles in their hearts a quenchless fire, which all their camp in great disorder brings. Agrament to appease them doth desire. Fierce Rodomont doth leave the camp in wrath because his mistress him forsaken hath among the many rare and special gifts that in the female sex are found to sit this one is chief that they at sudden shifts give best advice and show most ready wit but man except he thinks and chews and sifts how every part may answer t'other fit by rash advice doth often overshoot him and doth attempt the things that do not boot him good malagici thought he had done wisely in making doralus to paris fly but if he had the matter weighed precisely though richardetto was preserved thereby he would have sure confessed it done unwisely his safety with so great a loss to buy for by this act which he then not forethought 
a loss unspeakable to Charles was wrought. Alas, how much might he have better done, if he had made the fiend the wench convey unto the fall or rising of the sun, to west or east, or any other way where Rodomont and Agricana's son from Paris walls might have gone far astray. But he that ever wishes Christen's evil, so at this time did prove himself a devil. The fiend, her silly horse, most slyly entered, and not before prescribed any place, he quickly all the company distempered, nor bare he her away a common pace, but over brooks and streams and ditches ventured, she crying still for aid, as in such case. Nor leaves her beast to fling, run, snore, and stamp, until she quite was past the Christian camp. There did she come, even as she could desire, among the midst of Agramante's train, and there at last she found the king her sire, that of Granada did possess the reign. The while her lovers both themselves do tire, and in pursuing her do take great pain by tracing her, with as great toil and care as huntsmen do with pleasure trace the hare. Now, Charles, tis time for thee to look about, and to thy walls and strengths in time betake thee. Thou never canst escape this plunge, I doubt, except thou stir up quickly and awake thee. Thy strength, the lamps of France, are quenched out, I mean, thy friends and champions chief forsake thee. Orlando thee, his wits have him relinquished, and all his virtues drowned and quite extinguished. Likewise Rinaldo, though not fully mad, yet little less than mad, seeks there and here for fair Angelica, and is full sad to see that he of her no news can hear. For why, a certain old enchanter had told him a forged tale that touched him near, how she, to whom of love he made profession, was in Orlando's keeping and possession. This made him at the first so loath to go to England, whither he was sent for aid. This made him back again to hasten so, then when the Turks his presence so dismayed. And thinking after that some news to know, by privy search the nunneries all he laid, and castles all in Paris and about, to see if he by search could find her out. But when he heard of her no news nor tiding, and that Orlando there likewise did want, he could in Paris make no longer biding, doubting his rival sought him to supplant. But up and down about the country riding, some time to Brava, some time to Anglant, supposing still Orlando her had hidden, lest of his pleasure he might be forbidden. And thus the wicked fiend his time espied to give the Christians such a fatal blow, whenas these two in whom they most affied were absent now their prince and country fro. Further, for soldiers of the Turkish side, all that were valiant men or counted so, were all against this time enticed hither, wholly uniting all their force together. Gradasso stout and Sacrapanti fierce, that in that charmed castle long had dwelt, which the English duke, as I did late rehearse, dissolved quite, and caused like snow to melt, these two likewise the Christian camp to pierce, the forces of these two the Christians felt. Rogero and Marfaisa made less haste, and so it happened they arrived last. The first two couple near the Christian's tents did meet, and then, after long consultation, each unto other showing their intents, they all conclude with one determination, and all of them to this give their consents, in spite of all the Christian generation, to succor Agrament, their lord and liege, and Moger Charles as might to raise the siege. Straight in one crew they force together knit, break through the Christian watch by force amain. Neither in hugger mugger did they it, but crying loudly, Africa and Spain, they lay on load, and every one they hit, dead or astonished, doth there remain. Alarum then, or all the camp was wrung, though few could tell the cause from whence it sprung. Some thought the Gascoigns, or the Switzers bold by mutiny, had made some insurrection, and their surmise unto the emperor told, who came with mind to give them due correction. But when he did the bodies dead behold, incurable unto the resurrection, he standeth still like one with wonder mazed, and on their woeful wounds long time he gazed. Even as a man that with a bolt of thunder hath seen his dwelling-house smit unaware, straight searcheth with no little fear nor wonder which way the bolt did pass that caused his care, so Charles that saw men's bodies cut in sunder, inquires of so great wounds who authors were, and when he knew how few they were that did it, did wish himself there present to forbid it. 
this while Marfisa, on another side, with good Rogero, do them sore impeach, and through the camp in spite of them they ride, killing or wounding all within their reach, as in a mine that lies close unespied, with trains of gunpowder men make a breach, or as a tempest goes along by coast, so suddenly these two break through the host. Many that scape the t'other four by flight, in flying fell unwares upon these twain, and felt by proof that neither flight nor fight can save a man ordained to be slain. Even as a fox, whom smoke and fire doth fright so as he dare not in the ground remain, bolts out, and through both smoke and fire she flieth into the terrier's mouth, and there she dieth. Thus, last of all, by this most noble pair, the Christian army once again was sundered, and then to Agramet they all repair, who welcomes them, and at their value wondered. Now hope and courage drive away despair. One Turk of Christians straight defied an hundred, so great a boldness in their mind doth rise by help and succor of these new supplies. Straightway on both sides out their men were brought, their standards and their banners all displayed, and there that day a bloody field was fought, and neither side made show to be dismayed, for hopes alike in either army wrought, tons passed conquests, t'other's present aid, but fortune on the Christians did so frown that they again were driven unto the town. The passing force of cruel Rodomount, the strength and value great of Mandricard, Rogero's virtue that doth all surmount, Gridasso's courage of no small regard, Marfisa's heart of principal account, the skill of sacrapunt with best compared, these were the causers of good Charles's loss, and sent the Christians home by weeping cross. Great store were drowned in Sequina with haste, the bridge so narrow was for to receive them, wishing, as Dedal's son had in time passed, some wings wherewith aloft in air to heave them. Some, thrusting, strave to get them in so fast that strength and breath and life at last did leave them. But that whereby King Charles was chiefly shaken was this, that many paladins were taken. Thus fortune once again did turn the wheel and good King Charles had her, but could not hold her. And of this foil, this hurt he then did feel, it fainter made his friends, his foes the bolder. The Marquis of Vienna, true as steel, was at that service wounded in the shoulder, and many hurt, but none did play his part so well that day as valiant Brandemart. He stoutly bare it out no little space, and when he saw there was no other way, then to the fury prudently gave place, and spared himself against another day. Now once again is Charles in woeful case, now once again to Paris siege they lay, young orphans and old widows' prayer and cries again unto God's heavenly throne arise. The angel Michael was but ill appaid finding the cause of those good Christians' tears. He thought his maker was but ill obeyed, and that he may be blamed, therefore he fears. He calls himself deceived and betrayed by her should set the pagans by the ears, from which it seemed now she did so vary, as she had rather done a quite contrary. Even as a servitor whose love and zeal more than his memory may be commended, forgetting in some weighty cause to deal that by his lord to him was recommended, would with new care his former fault conceal that ere his master know it may be mended, so this good angel went not up to God, till he had done as much as he was bawd. To seek Dame Discord he doth leave the sky, and to the abbey he returns again, where her amid the monks he might espy that change old officers and new ordain. She laughs to see their portices to fly, ready to knock out one another's brain. The angel takes her by her painted locks, and with great fury gives her many knocks. He break a cross's handle on her crown, and grievously doth beat her back and side. The wretch upon her merry bones falls down, at the angel's feet, and mercy, mercy, cried. Pack to the pagans then that see John town, quoth he, and see that you among them bide. For if this place again you ever trouble, assure thyself thy payment shall be double. Though Discord's back and arms were sore with beating, yet thence with all the haste she could she went, sore terrified with that great angel's threatening, doubting again in this sort to be shent, yet 
in this haste behind her not forgetting bellows and coals instead of those were spent by which in many minds and hearts invincible she quickly kindle might a fire inquenchable rogero mandricard and rodomont can now their former quarrels to renew as making of the christians small account that under paris walls themselves withdrew wherefore to agrament they do recount their quarrels and the grounds of whence they grew each one by challenge his just cause averring the combat's order to the king referring also marphisa doth the king entreat that she may end her combat first begun with as great haste thereof and as great heat against the tartar agricane's son this she desires with haste and instance great as one that thinks great wrong to her was done if in regard of any state or power she should attend one day or yet one hour but rodomont alleggeth that of right he first should end the matter with his rival sith by accord they first deferred the fight till time might serve after their here arrival no less rogero for his horse takes spite and swears that whether they agree or strive all to take frontino no man should restrain him or else to fight with him that doth detain him further the matter farther to entangle the argent eagle in the azure field gave to the tartar matter more to jangle and quarrel with rogero for his shield and so confusedly he then did wrangle as though with all at once he would the field and in his fury sure he had attempted it but that the king's commandment flat prevented it who first with grave and friendly admonition to peace and good atonement did exhort them but when beyond all means of composition he saw that wrath and fury did transport them to certain marshals he doth give commission according to the laws of arms to sort them and of all ways this was not thought the worst to try by lots which two should combat first four little scrolls were put into a pot the first had rodomont and mandricard rodomont and rogero next they wrote the third rogero was and mandricard the fourth pair that must try the present lot was stout marphisa joined with mandricard when lots were cast these two first out were ta'en fierce rodomount and son of agricane mandricard and rogero next they find rodomount and rogero next was said mandricard and marphisa stayed behind with which the stately dame was ill apaid nor was rogero well content in mind doubting that when they first their parts had played the combat will be such between them two he and marphisa should have naught to do not far from paris lay a level ground that was in compass scant a thousand paces this plain with rails and bars was compassed round and tents therein were set with equal spaces with scaffolds raised upon the outward bound to give to lookers-on convenient places now came the time these strifes should be decided among those knights those tents were thus divided in the pavilion bordering on the east stands rodomont with visage stern and grim ferrar and sacripant were ready pressed to put his scaly serpent's hide on him in t'other tent that was upon the west gradasso and stout falseron do trim with hector's arms so stately and so fair the valiant prince king agricane's heir on one side in a high tribunal seat do sit the kings of africa and spain with stordolan and other princes great both feared and followed of the turkish train happy was he that day that could but get a place to sit or stand although with pain on ridge of house or wall or top of tree in so great press the goodly show to see on t'other side sat ladies of great name in stately sort to see and to be seen that out of divers realms and countries came to visit or attend the spanish queen there dorilus was placed that lovely dame who wears a robe of crimson cut on green yet was the crimson stained in such a fashion it rather seemed inclining to carnation among the rest marphisa sat that day in short light clothes most sumptuously arrayed the fashion of such kind as well it may become a warrior and yet a maid hippolyta i think used such array when in the field her banner she displayed thus each thing was prepared for the fight and each man was prepared for the sight and herald in his coat of arms steps out 
and of the law of arms expounds the guise, professing to resolve each little doubt that in such case accustoms to arise. The people gazing standeth all about, attent with listening ears and longing eyes, when from the tent of valiant Mandricard, behold, a sudden noise and stir was hard. The cause was this. The king of Saracane, who, as before I did rehearse, was one that holped to arm the son of Agricane, taking his sword in hand to put it on, saw, written in the handle, Durindane, and looking more advisedly thereon, he saw Almonte's arms graven on the blade, the which strange sight him greatly wonder made, and glad he was, when once he did espy it, the chiefest cause that first to France he came, although before he never could come by it. Wherefore he questioned straight upon the same if Mandricardo wan it, or did buy it, who in this sort his answer then did frame, I with Orlando for this sword did quarrel, and ere I had it, put my life in peril. Further unto this answer he doth add, a farther lie his glory to increase, how that Orlando, for the fear he had, that for his sword he never should have peace, had thrown away the sword and feigned him mad, that thereby he might cause his quarrel cease, doing herein as is the caster wanted, bite off his stones when he is nearly hunted. Well, quoth Cradasso, what Orlando meant I cannot now discuss, nor do I know. But sure I am, it is not mine intent, now I have found it here, to let it go. The money, men, munition I have spent, deserve as good a thing as this, I trow. You did but find it, you yourself confess it, and now I challenge it and do possess it. If you deny my claim, here I will prove it, this field the court, this list my pleading bar. My plea is such as no writ can remove it. My judge must be the sequel of the war. War, said the other, who can better love it than I? These words to me as music are. If so, the king of Sarza will agree to stay his combat till I fight with thee. Be sure I'll answer thee, and all beside that dare presume to offer me offense. With that, Rogero stepped between and cried, Ho, oh, sirs! with this i mind not to dispense or let the fight proceed as lots have tried or i myself will put you to your fence shall he deny the sword and shall i yield that you shall wear mine eagle on your shield wherefore preserve that order first agreed on from which in honour you may no way start or if to break it further you proceed on i break will all if you do break apart Tush, quoth the Tartar, threats we have no need on. If Mars were in you both, and took your part, yet both should find it folly to attempt me of my shield or sword once to prevent. And with that word, forthwith he bent his fist, and on Gradasso's hand so fierce he strake, that suddenly, or ere Gradasso wist, he made him unawares the sword forsake. Who much repined he thus his purpose missed? and that so unprepared he could him take, and much more grieved at him that this disgrace was offered him in such an open place. Wherefore, to be avenged of so great wrong, he steppeth back, and out his sword he draws. The t'other doth no farther time prolong, though in respect of order there was cause, nay, which was more, he thought himself so strong to fight with all at once, he asked no pause, but to them both at once he makes defiance, in his own strength he had so great affiance. This man is mad, but let me with him try it, Gradasso said, I'll make him wise again. Nay, softly, quoth Rogero, I deny it, for this same combat doth to me pertain. Stand back, saith Tun, saith t'other, nay, not I yet, back you. Yet both still in their place remain. Thus do these three, with malice, great and spite, strangely begin a combat tripartite, and sure to much confusion it had grown, had not some men, more stout perhaps than wise, themselves among them undiscreetly thrown, with courage great, but yet with small advice, to succor others' danger with their own. Yet could no force them part, nor no device, till Agramant himself, their dreaded lord, in person came their quarrel to accord. The reverence great that unto him they bear made them forthwith their forces to restrain, who straight the causes of these broils did hear, and to compound them sought, but all in vain. 
for scant Credasso could be made forbear the sword so long with t'other to remain until the fight were ended now in hand of which the sequel could not yet be scanned scarce had the king with words of great persuasion this quarrel new begun a while appeased but that another strife by new occasion in rodomonte's tent them all diseased a hurly-burly and a fierce invasion there grows between two princes sore displeased between stout sacrapent and rodomount as i to you will presently recount king sacrapent as late before i told helping to arm the cruel sarsen king with those self-arms that nemrod wear of old from whom this prince his pedigree did bring whiles he i say did curiously behold his furniture and every other thing that to his horse or under him belong to see they might be sure and firm and strong while he that stately steed frontino viewed that proudly champing stood upon his bit and all his reins with snow-like foam bedewed without regard whose hands embroidered it a thought unpleasant in his mind renewed and to his heart did seem full near to sit he thinks this horse was very like in sight to one of his that front lat while um height and more and more with heedful look still eyeing the marks and shape and color of the steed after his long and very curious prying he saw and knew it was his horse indeed which horse from him then at albraca lying brunello stale for want of better heed and showed him an unusual cunning knack to steal his horse while he sate on his back brunello stale that time more things beside by name orlando's sword hight balasard angelica's fair ring of virtue tried which she recovered as before you hard likewise a sword even from marphisa's side this done he gave rogero afterward orlando's sword and this horse to the same but to frontino first he changed his name now then i say when sacrapent was sure this horse was frontlet that some time was his and that the marks he saw did him assure that he therein took not his mark amiss to hold his peace he could not long endure but said good sir no mine frontino is stolen late from me as i can make good proof although i trow mine own word is enough one at albraca stale from me the steed yet for our late acquaintance i consent because i see that now you stand in need that you shall use him now i am content conditionally that first it be agreed you shall acknowledge him not yours but lent else here i claim him as my goods and chattel and will defend my right in open battle the sarsen king that passed i think in pride all kings and knights that ever carried sword and passed i think in strength and courage tried all samples that old stories us afford made answer thus if any man beside durst unto me have spoken such a word he should have found i took it in such scorn he had been better have been speechless born but for our late begun acquaintance sake i am content this at your hands to bear so as you this do as a warning take the like attempt hereafter to forbear and if you will but hark what end i make with mandricardo then i do not fear but you shall see such sample of my force shall make you glad to pray me take your horse then villainy is courtesy with thee saith sacrapent inflamed with high disdain when you be offered fair you cannot see wherefore my purpose is i tell you plain my horse shall service do to none but me and with these hands i will my right maintain and that is more if these same hands should fail i will defend my right with tooth and nail thus galling speech between them multiplying till each last word the former worser made at last they fell to acts of flat defying and ton the t'other fiercely doth invade rodomont on his strength and arms relying yet t'other so defends him with his blade and makes it so about his head to hover that seems alone his body all to cover even as a chariot wheel that runs apace seems to the eye all solid firm and sound although twixt every spoke there is a space concealed from our sights by running round so sacrapent seemed armed in that place though armor then about him none was found so dexterously himself he then bestirred as well it stood upon him with his sword but quickly serpentino and ferrar with naked sword in hand stepped them betwixt with others more that present were and saw as friends of either part together mixed 
yet them no force nor prayer could once withdraw their lofty hearts were on revenge so fixed and wrath had quite so put them out of frame till agreement to them in person came upon the sight of him their sovereign lord they both agreed their fury to withhold who straight persuaded them to good accord and much good counsel to them both it told but peace and good persuasions they abhorred and either on his manhood made him bold their king doth but among them leaves his wind for more and more he froward them doth find by no means sacrapent will be entreated unto the sarsen king his horse to lend except that he as i before repeated to borrow it of him would condescend the t'other at this very motion freeted and swears nor heaven nor he should make him bend to seek to have by prayer or request a thing of which by force he was possessed king agrament doth ask by what mischance he lost his horse or who it from him stale the t'other opened all the circumstance and blushed for shame when as he told the tale namely how late before he came to france one took him napping as it did befall and underpropped his saddle with four stakes and so from under him his courser takes marfisa that was come to part this fray hearing of this stolen horse among the rest was grieved in mind for why that very day her sword was stolen as she most truly guessed and then king sacrapunt she knew straightway whom erst she knew not and that gallant beast for which of late these two began to fight she knew and said belonged to him in right while these things passed thus the standers by that still hereof had heard runello boast straight in such sort to him did cast their eye as turned greatly to brunello's cost by which marfisa plainly did descry him by whose theft her sword she late had lost to be brunello whom she saw there sitting among great lords a place for him unfitting she heard and much it grieved her to hear how for these thefts and many mo beside the king rewarded him and held him dear whereas in law for them he should have died these news so greatly changed marfisa's cheer that hardly she her wrath could longer hide let agrament accept it as he will she minds brunello presently to kill straightway she armed is from head to heel and makes her page her helmet close to clasp to him she goes and with her glove of steel she gives him such a blow as made him gasp and while the pain hereof doth make him reel with her strong hand his weak core she doth grasp as doth the falcon fierce the mallard gripe to which a while before she gave a stripe with fury great from thence away she flings while he for help and oft for mercy cried but willy-nilly him away she brings like to a thief with hands together tied where agrament among the meaner kings sat like a judge their causes to decide then making some obeisance for good manner she speaketh thus in short but stately manner sir king I mind to hang this thief your man, that by desart should long ere this have died. For when he stale that horse from him, even then he stale my sword that hanged by my side. But if there any be that dare or can deny my words, or say that I have lied, here in your presences I do desire to try by combat whether is the liar. But lest some should, as some by fortune may affirm, I choose this time to make new strife alone at such a time on such a day, when other quarrels in the camp are rife, I am content a day or two to stay and to prolong this wretched caitiff's life to see if any man will him defend, and after sure to hang him I intend. I mean, quoth she, to bring him three mile hence, and keep him as a prisoner in yon tower and with his life I promise to dispense for two days' space, and longer not an hour. If any list to fight in his defense, there let him come and try my force and power. Away she galloped when she this had said, and on her saddle bow the wretch she laid. The king was sore displeased at this attempt, and much it did his princely mind enrage, and minds himself to wreak so great contempt, until Sabrino one both grave and sage told him in wisdom he must be content his collar in this matter to assuage and said it were a base part for his highness to fight for one sprung up by theft and slyness yea though beforehand he were sure to win yet would such victory dishonour have because a woman vanquished were therein 
Wherefore, quoth he, if you his life might save with one word speech, to speak that word were sin, for sure she doth but law and justice crave, and princes never do themselves more wrong than when they hinder justice or prolong. You may, said he, to satisfy your mind, send after her in manner of request, and promise her that if just cause you find, he shall be hanged, and so all strife may rest. But if to this you find her not inclined, give her her will, for so I think tis best, so that she firmly in your friendship bide, hang up Brunello, and all thieves beside. This good direction agrament obeying, went not himself, nor sent none to molest her, but yet, according to Sabrino's saying, he sent a messenger that might request her. Himself the while doth travel in allaying the tumults fierce that all his camp do pester. Pride laughs at this, and discord so rejoices, as up to heaven fly their eternal voices. Five men most resolute have set their rest to be the first that will begin the fight, the strife so intricate as would molest Apollo to decide or set it right. Yet Agrament still strives to do his best, and to compound the matter if he might. And thus to end the matter he begun, twixt Rodamont and Agricani's son, he makes to them this good and friendly motion, that, sith for Doralus they only strave, they would agree to stand at her devotion, and let her take her choice which she will have, and that once made, to raise no more commotion. This pleased them both, to this consent they gave a certain hope and trust them both alluring, each on himself of her firm love assuring. The Sarsen king doth think that needs she must give sentence on his side and be his own, sith oft he had in turnies and in just her favors worn and his affection shown. How can she love, thinks he, or put her trust in one whom she scant three days' space hath known? Nor was alone his own opinion such, but all the camp beside did think as much they all think mandricardo overseen and made no question but she would reject him but he that knew what passed had them between and found that she did inwardly affect him was sure although his service were unseen and done by night that she would not neglect him wherefore of her good will he nothing doubting did scorn their scorns and flouted at their flouting Thus having put the matter in her choice, and put the choice in her own declaration, she, with a sober look and lowly voice, chose Mandricard, against all expectation. The Tartar prince hereat did much rejoice, but all the rest were filled with admiration, and Rodamont himself was so astound as hardly he could lift his eyes from ground. But when his wonted wrath had driven away that bashful shame that dyed his face with red, Unjust he calls that doom, and cursed that day, and clapping hand upon his sword, he said, This better arbitrate our matters may than women's foolish doom by fancy led, who oftentimes are so perverse in choosing, they take the worst, the offered best refusing. Go then, quoth Mandricard, I little care, I hope that fight shall yield you like success. And thus again to fight they ready are, but Agrament doth soon that rage repress, and said, Upon this point again to square, quite were against all laws of arms express. And Rodamont he sharply then controlled, that in his sight was against law so bold. The Sarsen king, that saw himself that day so noted by those peers with double scorn, both from his prince, whom he must needs obey, and her to whom so great love he had borne, with fury great he flings from thence away, and counts himself disgraced and quite forlorn. Of all his train two men he only taketh, the king, the camp, the place he quite forsaketh. And as a bull his loved herd that leaves, by his strong rival forced to be gone, among the trees all clad with thickest leaves doth hide himself and seeks to be alone, so he whom shame of comfort all bereaves flies sight of men, yet still he thinks thereon, and chief when he remembers what disgrace his mistress did him in so open place. Rogero gladly would have him pursued to get his horse, but yet he doth refrain lest men should think he had the fight as chewed that did twixt Mandricard and him remain. But Sacrapent, whom no cause doth include, pursues the Sarsen king the horse to gain, and doubtless had outgone him that same day but for mishap that chanced by the way. A damsel fell by hap into a river, and was in peril great to have been drowned, 
he lighting from his horseback to relieve her leapt in and brought her out all safe and sound but doing this good act her to deliver scarce all that day his horse again he found his horse got loose and he with all his cunning could scantly catch him in six hours running at last with much ado he doth him get and after rodamont he then doth make but where and how long after him he met and how the sarzan did him prisoner take i may not now proceed to tell as yet first tell i what wild words the sarzan spake that called his prince and mistress both unkind and for her fault doth rail at all her kind with scalding sighs that inward pangs berayed he breathes out flames in places where he goes from rocks and caves his plaints doth echo aid and takes compassion on his rueful woes o oh, women's wits how weak you are he said how soon to change you do yourselves dispose observers of no faith nor good direction most wretched all that trust in your protection could neither service long nor sured love by me above a thousand ways declared thy fickle mind to fastness so far move but wilfully to let thyself be snared if reason could have led thy mind to prove was mandricard with me to be compared hereof can reason be alleged by no man but this alone my mistress is a woman i think that nature or some angry god brought forth this wicked sex on earth to dwell for some great plague or just deserved rod to us that wanting them had lived well as in the worms an adder snake and toad among the beasts bears wolves and tigers fell and makes the air the fly and wasp to breed and tears to grow among the better seed why did not nature rather so provide without your help that man of man might come and one be grafted on another's side as are the apples with the pear and plum but nature can no mean nor rule abide but still she must exceed in all or some full easy tis the cause thereof to render for nature's self is of the woman's gender yet be not therefore proud and full of scorn a womankind that men come of your seed the fragrant rose growth on the pricking thorn the lily fair comes of a filthy weed in loathsome soil men sow the wholesome corn the basest mould the fairest flower doth breed ungrateful false and crafty yar and cruel born of our burning hell to be the fuel these words and like to these the pagan fierce doth spend amid his rage and frantic fumes and like a madman did the same rehearse some time in high oft times in baser tunes i tremble to set down in my poor verse the blasphemy that he to speak presumes and writing this i do know this that i full oft in heart do give my pen the lie but passion did this pagan sense so blind and left within the same so sharp a sting that he not only blamed his love unkind but also raged against his sovereign king and cursed him and wished in his mind that fortune so great woes on him might bring that he might lose his state and princely crown and see his country turned quite upside down and being to such miseries once brought and with adversity assailed so sore that then by him his freedom might be wrought and that he might his former state restore that agreement might by such proof be taught of faithful friends indeed to set more store and learn to know that such a friend as he deserved in right and wrong preferred to be thus blaming oft his lord more oft his love to his own native soil his course he bent but changing place could not his sorrow move nor travel's pain his pain of mind relent it seemed his horse frontino well to prove before his bridle should be drawn he meant to sonna he doth ride without a bait and mines fro thence to pass to provence straight and there to cast away all care and cark and all his anguish quickly to appease for africa he will himself embark and pass the large mediterranean seas but for the weather now wax dim and dark first in his inn he minds to take his ease for all the country even as far as spain and agramante's power did then remain now he resolves to lodge about the coast and long he is not of a place to seek for straight he was invited by an host to take his house if so it might him like 
it pleased the pagan well to hear him boast that he had corsic wine and french and greek for though he were a turk in all the rest yet did he like french fashion drinking best the pleasant host that was indeed of those that can with double diligence attend as having saved amid both friends and foes his goods and gained by that which both to spend when by that prince's view he did suppose him some great man he straight abroad did send and thither doth his kin and friends request to help him wait and welcome such a guest but lo his guest sits musing all apart and of his mistress runneth all his thought which though he would forget spite of his heart he thinks on still so strong the fancy wrought the standers by are not so malapert to talk to him till he occasion sought which having found up from his chair he started and salutations to them all imparted then asked he many questions of them all and as occasion served discourses varied but still we find and ever find we shall by thought of heart the speech of tongue is carried for last to treat of marriage he doth fall and asketh of the men if they be married and if they be he prayeth them to declare of their wives truths what their opinions are straight all of them made answer they had wives and but mine host all praised the happy state and said they were the comforts of their lives that draw a happy yoke without debate a playfellow that far off all grief drives a steward early that provides and late both faithful chaste and sober mild and trusty nurse to weak age and pleasure to the lusty tush quoth mine host under your good correction most noble guest these fellows say not right but either with fond love or foul subjection so blinded are they take the black for white i once myself was touched with this infection but now i see that then i wanted sight and now i know as being better taught that theirs and mine be all unchaste and naught for as the phoenix is a bird alone and of that kind the whole world hath no more so think i of all wives there is but one that liveth chaste in love and virtue's lore he blessed may be that lighteth her upon small hope think i there is in so scant store that many should have one of such a kind of which in all the world but one i find i once so blinded was as now be these till by good hap unto my house there came a gentleman of venice from the seas francis valerio was he called by name he knew and could declare them all with ease all women's wiles and stories to the same he had of old and of the later times to show both wives and single women's crimes he said and bade me hold it as my creed that all of them are false if they be tried if some seemed chaste it did of this proceed they had the wit to do and not be spied and knew by deep dissembling and good heed with sober looks their wanton lusts to hide and this to prove he told me such a tale as while i live i still remember shall and if it like you sir to lend me ear in my rude fashion i shall it recite right glad quoth rodomont by heavens i swear for thou hast hit my present humour right wherefore said he sit down i pray thee there for in thy speech already I delight. But here I end this book, for doubt I have that in this tale mine host will play the knave. End of book 27The twenty-eighth book of Orlando Furioso. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland. Orlando Furioso by Ludovico Ariosto, translated by Sir John Harrington, Book Twenty Eight. The Argument. Fierce Rodomont hears of his prating host a lying tale to women's great disgrace. Unto Algier he minds to pass in post, but by the way he finds more pleasing place. Fair Isabella passeth by that coast. The pagan changeth mind and sues for grace. The hermit warns her keep her vow and oath at which the pagan prince is passing wroth you ladies ye that ladies hold in prize give not pretty your ear to this same tale the which to tell mine host doth here devise to make men think your virtues are but small though from so base a tongue there can arise to your sweet sex no just disgrace at all fools will find fault without the cause discerning and argue most of that they have no learning 
turn o'er the leaf, and let this tale alone, if any think the sex by this disgraced. I writ it, for no spite nor malice none, but in my author's book I find it placed. My loyal love to ladies all is known, in whom I see such worth to be embraced, that theirs I am, and glad would be therefore to show thereof a thousand proofs and more. Peruse it not, or if you do it read, esteem it not but as an idle babble. Regard it not, or if you take some heed, believe it not but as a foolish fable. Uh, but to the matter. Thus it was indeed, when all the guests were cheered at the table. Near Rodomont, so was the pagan named, down sat mine host, and thus his tale he framed. Astolfo, whilom king of Lombardy, to whom his elder brother left his reign, was in his youth so fresh and fair to see, as few to such perfection could attain. Apelles' match, or Zeuxis he might be, that such a shape could paint without much pain. Great was his grace, and all the world so deemed it, but yet himself of all men most esteemed it. He did not of his scepter take such pride, nor that degree that common men are under, nor wealth, nor friends, nor meaner kings beside, that thereabout dwelt near or far asunder, but of his beauty, which he would not hide, at whose rare worth he thought the world did wonder. This was his joy, and all that he intended, to hear his comely face and shape commended. Among his courtiers, one above the rest, Fausto by name, by birth a Roman knight, who hearing oft so praised, as they know best, his face and hands, and all that praise he might, the king did bid him tell at his request, near or far off, if he had seen that white that in all parts so perfectly was wrought. But he was answered, as he little thought. My liege, quoth Fausto, plainly to declare both what myself doth see and others say, but few with your rare beauty can compare, and that same few were none, were one away, Jocundo hight a man of beauty rare, and brother mine, excepting whom I may prefer your grace before all other creatures, but he doth match or pass you for his features. The king to hear such tidings strange it thought, as having still till that day kept the prize, and with a deep desire straightways he sought to know this man, and see him with his eyes. In fine, with Fausto so far forth he wrought, to bring him to his court he must devise. Although, quoth he, to bring my brother to it, I shall be sure of work enough to do it. The cause is this, my brother never went forth of the gates of Rome scant all his life and such small goods as fortune hath him lent he hath enjoyed in quiet free from strife left by our sire and them he hath not spent nor yet increased his gains are not so rife and he will think it more to go to pavy than some would think to thindies in a navy but i shall find it hardest when i prove to draw him from his loving wife away to whom he is so linked in chains of love that all is vain if once his wife say nay but yet your grace is so far all above, you shall command me, certes, all I may. Thanks, quoth the king, and addeth such reward as might have moved any to regard. Away he posts, arriving in few days at Rome, and to his brother's house he went. And with such earnest words his brother prays that to return with him he doth consent. Also his sister's love he so allays that she doth hold her peace as half content, beside great thanks laying before her eyes preferments large that hereof might arise jocundo now resolved to go his way gets men and horse against he should depart sets forth himself with new and rich array as still we see nature adorned by art his wife at night in bed at board by day with watery eyes to show a sorry heart complains his absence will so sore her grieve till his return she doubts she shall not live I me, the thought, quoth she, makes me so frayed that scant the breath abideth in my breast. Peace, my sweet love, and life, Jocundo said, and weeps as fast, and comforts her his best. So may good fortune I my journey aid, as I return in threescore days at least, nor will I change the day I set thee down, no, though the king should grant me half his crown. All this might not assuage this woman's pain, Two months were long, yea, too, too long, she cries. Needs must I die before you come again. 
nor how to keep my life can I devise, the doleful days and nights I shall sustain, from meat my mouth, from sleep will keep mine eyes. Now was Jocundo ready to repent that to his brother he had given consent. About her neck a jewel rich she wear, a cross all set with stone and gold well tried. This relic late a Boheme pilgrim bare, and gave her father other things beside, which costly things he kept with no small care, till coming from Jerusalem he died, and her of all his goods his heir he makes. This precious cross to her good man she takes, and prays him for her sake to wear that token and think on her. The man that was most kind received it with more joy than can be spoken, although he needed not to be put in mind. For why, no time, nor no state, sound, nor broken, nor absence long, a mean could ever find to quail his love, not only while his breath maintains his life, but neither after death. That very night that went before the morrow that they had pointed surely to depart, Jocundo's wife was sick, and sounds for sorrow amid his arms, so heavy was her heart. All night they wake, and now they bid God morrow, and give their last farewell, and so they part. Jocundo on his way with all his train, his loving wife, doth go to bed again. Scant had Jocundo rode two miles forthright, but that his cross came now into his mind, which on his pillow he had laid last night, and now, for haste, had left the same behind. He would devise to excuse it if he might, but no excuse sufficient could he find. But that his love must needs be much suspected to find the precious jewel so neglected. When no excuse within his mind could frame, but that all seemed frivolous and vain, to send his man he counted it a shame. To go himself it was but little pain. He stayed, and when his brother did the same, Ride soft, quoth he, till I return again, for home again I must, there is no nay, but I will overtake you on the way. The fair is such as none can do but I, but doubt not you, I will return as fast. Away he spurs as hard as he could hie, alone without or man or page for haste. Now had the sun's new rising cleared the sky with brightest beams, ere he the stream had passed. He hies him home and finds his wife in bed, full sound asleep, such cares were in her head. He draws the curtain softly without sound, and saw that he would little have suspected. His chaste and faithful yoke-fellow he found, yoked with a knave, all honesty neglected. The adulterer, though sleeping very sound, yet by his face was easily detected. A beggar's brat bred by him from his cradle, and now was riding on his master's saddle. Now, if he stood amazed and discontent, Believe it, ye to try that would be loath, for he that tries it doubtless will repent, as poor Jocundo did, who was so wroth that out he drew his sword with just intent for their ungrateful act to kill them both. But lo, the love he bare her did withstand against his heart to make him hold his hand. O oh, ribald love, that such a slave couldst make of one that now was subject to thy force, he could not break her sleep for pity's sake that break all bonds of faith without remorse. But back he goes before they did awake, and from his house he gets him to his horse. Love so pricks him, and he so pricks his steed, he overtakes his company with speed. His look is sad, all changed is his cheer, full heavy was his heart, they well perceived. They see no cause of grief, nor guess they near, and they that guess most likely are deceived. They thought he went to Rome, but you do hear how at Cornetto he has hurt received. Each man espied that love procured that passion, but none described the manner nor the fashion. His brother deems that all his grief doth grow because his loving wife is left alone. But he a clean contrary cause doth know, her too much company did cause his moan. He bends his brows, his looks he casts low, with pouting lips and many a grievous groan. In vain doth Faustus comfort seek to bring him, for why he knows not where the shoe doth ring him. He gives a salve afore the sore is found, his plaisters are as poison to the smart. He seeks to heal, and wider makes the wound. He names his wife, but her name kills his heart. Gone was his taste, his sleeps do grow unsound, nature decayeth, and little helpeth art. 
and that fair face that erst was of such fame is now so changed it seemeth not the same his eyes are sunk so deep into his head it made his nose seem bigger than it should his flesh doth shrink his bones do seem to spread he was so changed as more cannot be told at last an ague makes him keep his bed and bait at inns more often than he would his fair complexion is now pale and withered much like the rose that yesterday was gathered with this mishap was faustus sore aggrieved not only for his brother's woeful state but fearing of his prince to be reproved unto whose grace he undertook so late to show the goodliest man as he believed now grown uncouth by force of inward bait yet as they could their way they so contrived that at the last in pavy they arrived he would not straightway show him to the king lest every one might deem his judgment small but sent by letters notice of the thing and what mishap his brother did befall how scant alive he could him thither bring a secret grief so greatly did him gall and with an ague pulled him down so sore he seemed not now the man he was before and yet behold this noble king is glad that he is come and means to make him cheer as if he were the dearest friend he had so sore he had desired to see him here nor would the worthy-natured prince be sad in praise of beauty to have found a peer he knew jocundo's beauty had excelled but that by this disease it was expelled he placeth him to his own lodging nigh he visits him each day and every hour great plenty of provision he doth buy to welcome him he bendeth all his power but still jocundo languishing doth lie his wife's misdeed makes all his sweet seem sour no songs no sights which oft he heard or saw one dram of this his dolor could withdraw fast by his lodging was amongst the rest a fair large room which very few did use here would he walk as one that did detest all pleasing sights and comforts all refuse here the wide wound he bare within his breast with thousand thoughts unpleasant he renews yet here he found which few would have believed a remedy for that which had him grieved for at the upper end of this old hall there was a place of windows void and light save that the lime new molten from the wall let in a little beam that shined bright here did he see which some may think a tale a very strange and unexpected sight he heard it not but saw it in his view yet could he scant believe it should be true for at the chink was plainly to be seen a chamber hanged with fair and rich array where none might come but such as trusty been the princess here in part doth spend the day and here he saw a dwarf embrace the queen and strive a while and after homely play his skill was such that ere they went asunder the dwarf was got aloft and she lay under jocundo standeth still as one amazed supposing sure that he had seen a vision but seeing plain when he a while had gazed it was an act and not an apparition good god said he are this queen's eyes so dazed to love a dwarf more worthy of derision whose husband is a prince of worthy fame so brave a man such love now fie for shame he now began to hold his wife excused his anger now a little was relented and though that she her body had abused and to her servant had so soon consented not her for this but he the sex accused that never can with one man be contented if all quoth he with one like stain are spotted yet on a monster mine was not besotted the day ensuing he returned thither and saw the dwarf courageous still and jolly eke he another day repaired hither and still he found the queen committing folly he oft returns he finds them oft together they ceased not work on days profane nor holy yea which was strange the goodly queen complained that of the dwarf she found she was disdained one day when in the corner he had stayed he sees her come all sad and malcontent because the dwarf is coming still delayed for whom of purpose twice before she sent once more she sends this answer brings the maid forsooth unto his play he is so bent that for mistrust at chess to lease a shilling to come to you the ape's face is not willing 
Jocundo, who before had still been sad, upon this sight became of better cheer. The pains, the plaints, the cloudy storms he had away were blown, the coast began to clear. Most ruddy fair he cheerful grew and glad, that angel-like his beauty did appear, so as the king and others thought it strange in so short time to find so great a change. Now, as the king desired much to know the mean whereby his hurt so soon was healed, no less Jucundo did desire to show, and would not have the thing from him concealed, so as his collar might no greater grow than his had been, when as it were revealed. But first he made him swear on his salvation, upon the parties to use no castigation. He made him swear for aught he heard or saw, wherewith his mind might fortune be diseased, yet from his collar so much to withdraw, as that in show he may not seem displeased, nor punish it by might nor yet by law, nor first nor last, but hold himself appeased, so as the fenders might not have suspected that their misdeeds were to his grace detected. The king, so sure by oath so solemn bound, as one that little thought his queen so stained, Jocundo first his own grief doth expound why he so long so doleful had remained, and in whose arms his own wife he had found, and how the grief thereof so sore him painted, had not that salve unlooked for been applied, of that conceit no doubt he should have died. But lying in your highness' house forlorn, I saw, quoth he, that minished much my moan, for though it grieved me to wear a horn, it pleased me well I wear it not alone. This said, he brought him where the wall was torn, and showed him that that made his heart to groan, for why the dwarf did manage with such skill, though she curvets, he keeps his stirrup still. Much did the king this foul prospect mislike. Believe my words, I say, I need not swear. Hornwood he was. He was about to strike all those he met, and his own flesh to tear. His promise to have broken he was like, if of his oath he had not had some fear. But unrevenged all must now be borne, for on his annus day he had sworn. Now to Jocundo gently he doth speak. Good brother mine, advise me what to do. Sith I am bound by oath, I may not wreak the fact with such revenge as longs thereto. For sooth, let's try, if others be as weak, Jocundo said, and make no more ado. This was the counsel he did give the king, into their order other men to bring. We both are young, and of such pleasing hue, not to be matched with such another pair. What she will be so obstinately true, but will be one with youth and being fair? If youth and beauty both do miss their due, the want herein our purses shall repair. Let us not spare our beauty, youth, and treasure, till of a thousand we have had our pleasure, to see strange countries placed far apart, of other women eke to make some trial, will ease the pain, the while on pierced our heart and salve our sore, there can be no denial. The king, that longs to ease his new-found smart, consented straight, and to avoid a spile, himself, the knight, two pages, and no mo, out of the realm forthwith disguised go. Away they passed through Italy and France, and through the Flemish and the English land, and those whose beauties highest did advance, those still they found most ready to their hand. They give, they take, so lucky is their chance, they see their stock at one stay still to stand. Some must be wooed, forsooth, they were so chaste, and some there were that wooed them as fast. In countries some a month or two they tarried, in some a week, in others but a day. In all of them they find the women married, like to their wives, too gentle to say nay. At last, because they doubt to have miscarried, they mean to leave this sport and go their way. They found it full of danger and debate to keep their standings in another's gate. They do agree to take by common voice some one whose shape and face may please them both, in whom without suspect they might rejoice. For wherefore, quoth the king, should I be loath to have yourself a partner in my choice? I must have one, and I believe for troth among all women kind there is not one that can content herself with one alone. But of some one we too might take our pleasure, and not enforce ourselves beyond our ease. But, as they say, take meat and drink and leisure, and by our doings other not displease. 
well might that woman think she had a treasure that had us too her appetite to please and though to one man faithful none remain no doubt but faithful they would be to twain the roman youth much praised the prince's mind and to perform it seemed very fain away they posted as they had assigned by town and city over hill and plain till at the last a pretty piece they find the daughter of an innkeeper in spain a girl of person tall and fair of favour of comely presence and of good behaviour she now was entering in the flower and pride of those well-pleasing youthful years and tender her father many children had beside and poverty had made his portion slender and for them all unable to provide it made him soon consent away to send her the price agreed away the stranger's carrier because the father money wants to marry her in concord great she did with them remain who took their pleasure one and one by turn as bellows do where vulcan's wonted pain by mutual blast doth make the metal burn their meaning is now they had travelled spain by syphax realm to make their home return and having left valencia out of sight at fair zativa they did lodge at night the masters go abroad to view the town and first the churches for devotion's sake and then the monuments of most renown as travellers a common custom take the girl within the chamber sate her down the men are busied some the beds do make some care to dress their wearied horse and some make ready meat against their masters come in this same house the girl a greek had spied that in her father's house a boy had been and slept full often sweetly by her side and much good sport had passed them between yet fearing lest their love should be descried in open talk they durst not to be seen but when by hap the pages down were gone old love renewed and thus they talked thereon the greek demands her whither she was going and which of these two great estates her keeps she told him all she needs no further wooing and how a night between them both she sleeps ah quoth the greek thou tellest my undoing my dear fiametta and with that he weeps with these two lords wilt thou from spain be banished are all my hopes thus into nothing vanished my sweet designments turn it are to sour my service long finds little recompense i made a stock according to my power by hoarding up my wages and the pence that guests did give that came in lucky hour i meant ere long to have departed hence and to have asked thy sire's good will to marry thee and that obtained unto a house to carry thee the wench of her hard fortune doth complain and saith that now she doubts he sues too late the greek doth sigh and sob and part doth feign and shall i die quoth he in this estate let me enjoy thy sweetness once again before my days draw to their doleful date one small refreshing ere we quite depart will make me die with more contented heart the girl with pity moved thus replies think not quoth she but i desire the same but hard it is among so many eyes without incurring punishment and shame ah quoth the greek some means thou wouldst devise if thou but felt a quarter of my flame to meet this night in some convenient place and be together but a little space tush answered she you sue now out of season for every night i lie betwixt them two and they will quickly fear and find the treason sith still with one of them i have to do well quoth the greek i could refute that reason if you would put your helping hand thereto you must said he some pretty excuse devise and find occasion from them both to rise she first bethinks herself and after bad he should return when all were sound asleep and learned him who was there of right glad to go and come what order he should keep now came the greek as he his lesson had when all was hushed as soft as he could creep first to the door which opened when he pushed then to the chamber which was softly rushed he takes a long and leisurable stride and longest on the hinder foot he stayed so soft he treads although his steps were wide as though to tread on eggs he were afraid and as he goes he gropes on either side to find the bed with hands abroad displayed and having found the bottom of the bed he creepeth in and forward goeth his head between fiametta's tender thighs he came that lay upright as ready to receive 
At last they fell unto their merry game, Embracing sweetly now to take their leave. He rode in post, ne can he bait for shame. The beast was good, and would not him deceive. He thinks her pace so easy and so sure, That all the night to ride he could endure. Jocundo and the king do both perceive The bed to rock, as oft it comes to pass, And both of them one error did deceive, For either thought it his companion was. Now hath the Greek taken his latter leave, And as he came he back again doth pass, And Phoebus' beams did now to shine begin. Fiametta rose and let the pages in. Now with Jocundo gan the king to jest. Brother, quoth he, I doubt we do you wrong, it were more time for you to take your rest that had this night a journey rode so long. Jocundo answers him again in jest. Oh, sir, you do mistake. You sing my song. Take you your ease, and much good do your grace that all this night have rid a hunting pace. I, quoth the king, I would in faith, I swear, have lent my dog a course among the rest, but that I found yourself so busy were and rode so hard you could not spare the beast. Well, said the knight, it seemeth me to bear, although you break your promise and behest, yet privy quips and taunts the needed none, you might have bid me let the wench alone. One urged so far, the t'other so replied, that unto bitter words their tongues were moved. Scarce one forbear to say the t'other lied, and plain to try whose truth should be reproved, they called the girl the matter to decide who was afraid, as well as her behooved, and she must tell they standing face to face which of them two deserved this disgrace. Tell, quoth the king, with grim and angry sight, nor fear not him nor me, but tell us true, which of us two it was that all this night so gallantly performed all his due. Thus either deeming he did hold the right, they looked both which should be found untrue. Fiametta lowly laid herself on ground, doubting to die because her fault was found. She humbly pardon craves for her offence, and that they pity would her woeful case, that she with pity moved to recompense his love that lasted had no little space. And who it was she told them, and of whence had his ill luck in this unlucky place. How she had hoped that though they happed to wake, yet for his partner either would it take. The king and his companion greatly mused when they had heard the practice so detected, and their conceits not little were confused to hear a hap so strange and unexpected. And though no two were ever so abused, yet had they so all wrathful mind rejected that down they lay and fell in such a laughter they could not see nor speak an hour after. And when at last their stomachs and their eyes watered and ached, they laughed had so much, such shifts, quoth they, these women will devise, do what we can, their chastity is such. If both our cares could not for one suffice, that lay betwixt us both, and did us touch, if all our hairs were eyes, yet sure they said, we husbands of our wives should be betrayed. We had a thousand women proved before, and none of them denied our request, nor would, and if we tried ten thousand more. But this one trial passeth all the rest. Let us not then condemn our wives so sore that are as chaste and honest as the best. Sith they be as all other women be, let us turn home and well with them agree. When on this point they both were thus resolved, they gave the Greek Fiametta for his wife, and tied the knot that cannot be dissolved, with portion large to keep them all their life. Themselves went home, and had their sins absolved, and take again their wives, and end all strife. And thus, mine host, the pretty story ended, with which he prayed them not to be offended. The pagan prince, of whom I erst made mention, was pleased with this story passing well, and heard the same with heed and great attention, and praised it, and said it did excel, and swears he thought no wit nor no invention, no pen could write, no tongue attain to tell, by force of eloquence or help of art, of women's treacheries the hundredth part. But at the table sat another guest, of riper years and judgment more discreet, who such untruths to hear could not digest, and see their praises so trod under feet. Wherefore his speech he presently addressed unto his host, and said, We daily meet with slanders, and with lying fables told, and this is one, to say I dare be bold. Nor thee, nor him that told thee, trust I will. No, though in other things he gospel spake. 
I dare affirm it well, that evil will, not any trial that himself could make, moved him of all the kind to speak so ill, belike for some one naughty woman's sake, that he that would enter in women's praise, on higher steps aloft his style must raise. But tell me now, if any one of you that married are, have not a wry yet stepped? No, scarce a man that hath not been untrue, and with some other woman hath not slept. Nay, what is more, they woo, they seek, they sue, they try, they tempt those that be safest kept. Yet women seek not after men, I ween, I mean not such as common harlots been. Surely the man on whom your tale you father cannot himself, nor other men excuse, who still to take an unknown peace had rather, although their own were better far to choose. But if themselves were wood, I surely gather, such courtesies they never would refuse, but rather strain themselves beyond their might, such kindness with more kindness to requite. But be it some woman breaks chaste wedlock's laws, and leaves her husband, and becomes unchaste, yet commonly it is not without cause. She sees her man in sin his substance waste, she feels that he his love from her withdraws, and hath on some perhaps less worthy placed. Who strikes with sword, the scabbard him may strike, And sure love craveth love, like asketh like. Indeed, in their behalf, agree would I, That all wives that adultery do commit, Should by a law condemned be to die, If so their husbands guiltless be of it. But if that men unpunished walk awry, Doubtless in sense and reason tis not fit The weaker sex should for this sin be vexed, do as you would be done to, saith the text. Yet when a man is bent to speak his worst, That in despite he can of women say, He calls them but incontinent and cursed. No greater fault he to their charge can lay, To rob, to spoil, houses to break and burst, Whole cities, towns and countries to betray, Usury, murder, all such sins appear proper to men. Women of them are clear. This said this grave wise man, and would have told some story to the same his speech to verify, of women that had lived till they were old, chastely and virtuously, and with sincerity, but that the cruel Turk did him behold with so grim look, as did the poor man terrify, and made him hold his peace with threats and terror, yet hating inwardly the pagan's error. These brabbles ended, night on them did creep, to rest they went, having their bodies fed, but Rodomont scant all the night could sleep for cares that ran still in his troubled head. His unkind mistress him doth waking keep. She troubles him whether he lie on bed, whether he go or ride or sit or stand, whether it be by water or by land. And though himself could take but little rest, yet of his horse he takes no little care, both that he should be diligently dressed and have good provender to mend his fare. To go by water now he thought it best, himself to ease, and his good horse to spare. That horse he gat, as he might justly vaunt, spite of Rogero and of Sacrapunt. He takes a bark, and down the pleasant stream of Sona he doth pass with wind and oar. Great haste he makes to get to his own ream, but changing place doth help him ne'er the more. In sleep of her unkindness he doth dream, awake he sighs, and still renews the sore. To talk was best, and yet not much the better, Say what he list, yet cannot he forget her. Annoyed by boat, again he taking land, Vienna, Lyon, and Valenza passed, All which then were in Agramante's hand, His late good hap had so them all aghast. To Aquamort he turns on his right hand, And thence he will to Algier turn in haste. And in his way, his journey to a bridge, He passed a Vignon at the sumptuous bridge. Not far from Montpellier a town he saw of Bacchus and of Ceres well beloved, though then so spoiled by soldiers that for awe the dwellers all themselves for thence removed. Also there was a church for Christian law, but yet the priests, in this to be reproved, to save themselves their church had quite forsaken, so as the same by Rodomont was taken. This seat, this place, did so the pagan please that here he minds to make his firm abode. For of the one side he might see the seas, on t'other side the ground with corn well load. 
here all provisions he might find with ease here he doth cause his men his stuff unload and makes that church a horrible abuse serve him to his profane ungodly use now standing pensive in this pleasing place as still he used he saw a lady fair though mourning yet most full of pleasing grace who with a friar made thither her repair a goodly horse they led a soft slow pace and as they went he taught her many a prayer that horse did bear a coffin on his back all over spread in mourning sort with black methink by this description you may guess who this same friar and who this damsel is yet for more plainness sake i will express her name lest any may the matter miss twas isabella who did late profess that state that leadeth straight to heavenly bliss he was the friar that to that mind converted her when as despair had almost quite subverted her within the morning coffin was enclosed his corse whom she so loved alive and dead and though to grief she seemed all disposed though all in black she went from foot to head yet in that woeful show there was disclosed so worthy grace as in the pagan bred a fancy moving such an alteration as made him change his first determination for where before he did dispraise and scorn all women now again he doth commend that sex that doth indeed the world adorn his second love to place he doth intend on this sith that his first hath him forlorn here now he hopeth all his woe to end and with this passion to drive out the t'other as men to drive out one nail with another and straight in mildest manner that he can saluting her he asked what caused her pain and she the woeful tale to tell began how her true love by mandricard was slain for whose sake she would never marry man but serve god all her life that doth remain the pagan laughs at that the damsel saith as one that knows no god and hath no faith and greatly he her good intent controlled affirming her to merit as great blame as doth the miser that hoards up his gold and neither doth himself employ the same and yet from those that would doth it withhold so shut not up yourself quoth he for shame fierce lions bears and serpents that have stings should be shut up not fair and harmless things the godly friar that took no little care lest this ill speech might turn her to small good with new exhortings bade her to beware that such enticements strongly be withstood and for that end forthwith he doth prepare a sumptuous mess of ghostly inward food but this vile pagan did no sooner taste it but up again his squeamish stomach cast it and seeing that the speech of this friar whom he could make by no means hold his peace seemed greatly to contrary his desire wrath kindled and at last did so increase that this poor priest got but a sorry hire but here a while my story now shall cease lest my mishap or punishment be such as was the priest's for talking over much end of book twenty eight The twenty ninth book of Orlando Furioso. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland. Orlando Furioso by Ludovico Ariosto. Translated by Sir John Harrington. Book twenty nine. The Argument. Fair Isabel, to lose her head, is glad to save her chastity from pagans' might. To pacify her ghost, the pagan sad, doth make a bridge, at which falls many a knight. Orlando cometh thither being mad and in the water both together light from thence the madman onward still proceeds and by the way doth strange and monstrous deeds o oh, thoughts of men unconstant and unstable as subject under change as western wind in all designments fond and variable but chiefly those that love breeds in the mind lo he that late devised all he was able to slander and deface all women kind yet now with them whom he so sore reviled even on the sudden he is reconciled indeed most noble dames i am so wroth with this vile turk for this is wicked sin for speaking so great slander and untroth of that sweet sex whose grace i fain would win 
that till such time he shall confess the troth, and what a damned error he was in, I shall him make be so in conscience stung, as he shall tear his flesh and bite his tongue. But with what folly he was then possessed, the sequel of the matter plain doth show. For he that yesterday himself professed to all the kind a sworn and open foe, now to this stranger, one in state distressed, whose birth, whose kin, whose name he doth not know, with one small glance and sober cast of eye, was so enthralled he woos her by and by. And as new fancy doth his heart inflame, so to new speech it doth his tongue direct, a new discourse, new reasons he doth frame, with great persuasions, but to small effect. For still the godly friar refutes the same, exhorting her such speeches to neglect, and fast to hold her purpose good and holy, of serving God and leaving worldly folly. He saith the way of death is large and spacious, but that to life is straight and full of pain. But Rodomont, that saw him so audacious, in spite of him this doctrine to maintain, steps to him, and with hand and tongue ungracious, first bids him get him to his cell again, then his long beard grown on his aged chin, all at one pull he pilleth from the skin. And so far forth his wrath and fury grew, he wrings his neck as pincers ring a nail, and twice or thrice about his head him threw, as husbandmen that thresh to toss a flail. Reports most diverse afterwards ensue, but which be true and which of truth do fail is hard to say. Some say he was so battered that all his limbs about a rock were scattered. Some say that to the sea he hurled him, though divers furlongs distant from the place, and that he died because he could not swim. Some others tell some saint did him that grace to save his life, and heal each broken limb, and to the shore did bring him in short space. The likelihood hereof who list may weigh, for now of him I have no more to say. Thus cruel Lodemont, that had removed the babbling friar that did him so much spite, the fearful damsel's love to win he proved, by all kind words and gestures that he might. He calls her his dear heart, his soul beloved, his joyful comfort and his sweet delight, his mistress and his goddess, and such names as loving knights apply to lovely dames. Her reasons he doth courteously confute. Love soon had made him such a learned clerk. In phrases mannerly he moves his suit, and still his suit was leveled at one mark. And though he might by force have plucked the fruit, yet for that time he doth but kiss the bark. He thinks it will more sweet and pleasing make it, if she do give him leave before he take it. Wherefore, while he is content to pause in hope by time to win her love and grace, she deems herself like mouse in cat's sharp claws in strangers' hands and in a stranger place. She sees he feared not gods nor human laws, nor had no pity of her woeful case, that only for his lust would her persuade to break the vow that she to God had made. Her heart and eyes oft times to heaven she lifts, and prays the blessed virgin and her son to save her from this pagan's filthy drifts, that under her no villainy be done. She doth bethink her of an hundred shifts, how she his beastly lust may safely shun, that like an open gulf on her did gape, so as it seemed impossible to scape. She finds out many excuses and delays, that to prolong which vain she would prevent. Sometime, in humble manner, him she prays that to release her he would be content, but being still repulsed at all essays, at last she doth away and means invent not only how to shun that present shame, but merit to herself eternal name. Unto the cruel Turk, that now began from all good course of courtesy to swerve, she cometh in the meekest sort she can, and saith, if he her honour will preserve, which is the part of each true valiant man, she would of him that favour well deserve, and give him such a gift as in due measure should far surpass this momentary pleasure. But if you needs will me deflower a wis, she said, when you have done, you will repent to think how fondly you have done amiss, and lost that might have bred you true content. As for your carnal love, you need not miss more fair than I, and fitter for your bent. 
but in ten thousand one you shall not know that such a gift upon you can bestow i know quoth she an herb and i have seen a little since the place where as it grew that boiled upon a fire cypress clean and mixed with elderberries and with rue and after strained harmless hands between will yield a juice that who in order due anoint therewith shall never damage feel by flame of fire nor yet by dint of steel i say if one therewith anoint him thrice these strange effects thereof will straight ensue provided always that in any wise he must each month the liquor's strength renew i have the way to make it in a trice and you shall see by proof that it is true this thing i think should joy you more to gain than if you conquered had all france or spain and now for my reward of you i pray let me obtain this favourable meed to swear that you henceforth will not assay my chastity by either word or deed fell rodomont thinks this a blessed day and hopes he now shall never armour need and swears he will her honour safe defend though to perform it he doth not intend yet till she might this work bring to effect he doth himself against his mind and force and that she might no violence expect he doth not offer any sign of force but that once done his oath he will neglect for of an oath he never had remorse but specially he thought it least disgrace his oath to violate in such a case he makes to her a solemn protestation and with most damned oaths the same doth bind that he will never do her molestation if she procure a juice of such a kind this sinks so deep in his imagination of cygnus and achilles runs his mind for by this means he doth himself assure such privilege as they had to procure poor isabella glad of this delay by which a while her chastity she shields receiving this his promise goeth straightway to seek these herbs amid the open fields in every bank and grove and hedge and way she gathers some such as the country yields and all the while the pagan walketh by and to the damsel casteth still an eye and lest she should want cypress wood to burn he with his sword cuts down whole cypress trees and in all other things to serve her turn that each thing may provided be he sees now with her herb she made her home return the cauldrons are on fire no time to lease she boils and purboils all those herbs and flowers in which he thought there were such hidden powers at all these ceremonies he stands by and what she doth he many times doth look the smoke and heat at last made him so dry that want of drink he could no longer brook greek wines there were and those he doth apply two firkins late from passengers he took he and his men by drinking both that night their heads full heavy made their hearts full light though by their law they are forbidden wine yet now that here they did the liquor taste they thought it was so sweet and so divine that nectar and that manna far it passed at that restraint they greatly do repine that did debar them of so sweet repast and at their own law and religion laughing they spend that night carousing and in quaffing now had fair isabel finished that confection which this gross pagan doth believe to be against both steel and fire a safe protection now sir she said you shall the trial see and that you may be sure that no infection is in these drugs you first shall prove by me i shall you show thereof so perfect trial as you shall see the proof past all denial myself quoth she mine first to take the say that you may see i do not feign nor lie then after on yourself you prove it may when you have made a witness of your eye now therefore bid your men to go away that none be present here but you and i and thus as with herself she had appointed her neck and breasts and shoulders she anointed which done in cheerful sort she open laid her naked neck before the beastly turk and bade him strike for she was not afraid she had such skill and trust in this rare work he unadvised and haply overlaid with wine that in his idle brain did work was with her speech so undiscreetly led that at one blow he quite cut off her head the head where love and all the graces dwelt by heedless hand is from the body severed 
alas whose heart at such hap could not melt yea what is more the head cut off endeavoured to show what pleasure of her death she felt and how she still in her first love persevered thrice from the floor the head was seen rebound thrice was it heard zerbino's name to sound his name to whom so great love she did bear as she to follow him would leave her life to whom tis hard to say if that she were a truer widow or a kinder wife o soul that didst not death nor danger fear a sample to these latter times not rife to save thy chastity and vowed truth even in thy tender years and greenest youth go soul go sweetest soul for ever blest so may my verse please those whom i desire as my poor muse shall ever do her best as far as pen can paint and speech aspire that thy just praises may be plain expressed to future times go soul to heaven or higher and if my verse can grant to thee this charter thou shalt be called of chastity the martyr at this her deed so strange and admirable he that above all heavens doth a remain looked down and said it was more commendable than hers for whom tarquino lost his reign and straight an ordinance inviolable a to be kept on earth he doth ordain and thus he said even by myself i swear whose power heaven earth spirits men and angels fear that for her sake that died of this name last whoever shall hereafter bear that name shall be both wise and continent and chaste of faultless manners and of spotless fame let writers strive to make their glory last and oft in prose and verse record the same let helicon pindus parnassus hill sound isabella isabella still thus said the highest and then there did ensue a wondrous calm in waters and in air the chaste soul up into the third heaven flew where zerbin was to that she did repair now when the beastly turk saw plain in view how he had proved himself a woman's slayer when once his drunken surfeit was digested he blamed himself and his own deed detested in part to satisfy for this offence and to appease her ghost as twere in part although he thought no pardon could dispense nor punishment suffice for such desart he vows a monument of great expense of costly workmanship and cunning art to raise for her nor minds he to go further than that self church where he had done the murder of that self place he minds her tomb to make and for that cause he gets a workman's store for love for money and for terror's sake six thousand men he set to work and more from out the mountains massy stones they take with which well wrought and hewed and squared therefore with high and stately arch that church he covers and in the midst entombs the blessed lovers and over this was raised with curious sleight a pyramid a huge and stately tower which tower an hundred cubits had in height by measure from the top unto the flower it seemed a work of as great charge and weight as adrian made to boast his wealth and power of goodly stones all raised in seemly ranks upon the edge of stately tigress banks now when this goodly work was once begun he makes a bridge upon the water by that of great depth and force did ever run in former time a ferry there did lie for such as would a further circuit shun and pass this way more easy and more nigh the pagan takes away the ancient ferry and leaves for passengers nor boat nor wherry but makes a bridge where men to row are wont and though the same were strong and of great length yet might two horses hardly meet a front nor had the sides a rail or any strength who comes this way he means shall bide a brunt except he have both courage good and strength for with the arms of all that this way come he means to beautify fair isabel's tomb a thousand brave achievements he doth vow wherewith he will adorn this stately work from whom he taketh all these spoils or how he cares not whether christian or turk now was the bridge full finished and now his watchmen on each side in corners lurk to make him know when any one comes near for all that come he means shall buy it dear and further his fantastic brain to think that sith by drinking wine he did that sin in lieu thereof he now would water drink 
as oft as by mishap he should fall in. For when he should unto the bottom sink, the top would be an L above his chin, as who should say, for every evil action that wine procures were water satisfaction. Full many there arrived in few days, some men, as in the way from Spain to France, some others fondly thirsting after praise, in hope by this exploit their names to advance. But Rodomont doth meet them both the ways, and such his value was, so good his chance, that still as many men as there arrives lost all of them their arms, and some their lives. Among the many prisoners that he took, all those were Christians to Algier he sent, and willed his men safely to them to look, because ere long himself to come he meant. The rest, save that their armors they forsook, all harmless back into their countries went. Now while such feats were by the pagan wrought, Orlando thither came, of wits bestraught. At that same instant that Orlando came was Rodomont all armed save his head. The naked earl, with wits quite out of frame, leaps o'er the bar, and went, as folly led, to pass the bridge. The pagan him doth blame for his presumption, and with all he said, Stay, saucy villain, proud and undiscreet, for such as thee this passage is not meet. For lords and knights and squires of good estate this bridge was built, and not for thee, thou beast. He that no sense had in his idle pate, not heeding what was said, still onward pressed. I must, the pagan thinks, this fool's pride bait. It seems belike he thinks I am in jest. And thereupon he makes the madman towards, and minds to drown him, sith he was so frowards. He little looked to find a match so hard. Now, while they two together gan to strive, behold, a gallant dame of great regard at that same bridge by fortune did arrive, fair Fjordelege, that late before had hard how love did of his wits this earl deprive. She hither came to seek out Brandemart, that now in Paris was with pensive heart. And thus this lady, as before I told, came at that season to this dangerous place, and knew this earl when she did him behold, and wondered much to see him in such case. Now held Orlando with his foe hard hold, in vain the pagan strives him to displace, and grinning to himself he said at length, Who could have thought a fool had had such strength? And fretting that he had his purpose missed, he doth by slight the madman's force assay, Sometime he puts his hand below his twist, sometime above, sometime another way. Orlando stands unmoved, do what he list. The pagan seemed to do by him that day, as doth the bear that would dig up the tree from whence she fell, but sees it will not be. Orlando, full of force, though void of sense, about the middle took the pagan fast, and heaves him up from ground, and so from thence into the stream himself he backward cast, unto the bottom, both to sink, from whence each one was glad to get him in great haste. Orlando, naked and light, swam like a fish, so that he soon gat out as he would wish, and being out, away he straight doth run, nor tarries he to hear or to expect if men do blame or praise what he had done, but follows on his former course direct. This while the pagan drank nigh half a ton of water ere he could himself erect, and hardly he escaped being drowned, so heavy armed, and in place so profound. Now while the pagan swimmeth for his life, fair Fjordelege, with sad and pensive heart, a lively pattern of a virtuous wife, doth search the sepulchre for Brandemart. She took her time, while they fell first at strife, and up and down she looked in every part, but here she finds nor arms, nor yet his mantle, nor meets with such as of him tidings can tell. But leave we her a while, thus mourning sad, and seeking him each where, save where he was, and tell we now what hap Orlando had, and what strange feats his fury brought to pass. You might perchance believe that I were mad if none of his mad pranks I overpass, which were so strange and in so great a number as you to hear and me to tell would cumber. I only shall some few of those recite as to my present purpose shall pertain. The madman westward held his course forthright, straight to the hills that sever France from Spain. He seldom baits, but travels day and night, so much he was distempered in his brain, 
and by the mountain side as he did pass he met two young men driving of an ass this ass they loden had with clefts of wood fast bound upon his burden bearing back they seeing one run naked as he were wood amid their way they cried ho sirrah back but he makes answer neither bad nor good for sense and understanding he did lack but with his foot the poor ass he so spurned that both his load and him he overturned he tossed him like a football up on high whence down he fell and brake his neck with it that at the men he doth with fury fly of which the ton had better hap than wit for down the rock the ton leapt by and by deep threescore yards and by the way did hit upon a bank of firs grown in the place and scaped with only scratching of his face the t'other that of fear like passion feels did straight to clamber up upon the rock but straight orlando takes him by the heels and pulls him down and beats him like a stock as fishers used to beat their sliding eels and even as falconers tear some time a cock to give unto their hawks their entrails warm so tears he leg from leg and arm from arm these same and other like stupendous feats he put in practice while those hills he passed even such as speech and credit all exceeds his fits so furious were his strength so vast so far unto the westward he proceeds that to the sea he now was come at last even to the sandy shores of terracona that leadeth right the way to barcelona upon those sands such was his mad conceit he purposed with himself a house to build and being noyed with the parching heat he thinks with sand his skin there fro to shield straight with his hands he digs him out a seat and though the o's his body all defiled yet with that mould his members all he covered that nothing but his head could be discovered now as he lay half buried in the sand for save his head the rest was all unseen there thither came as in their way by land medoro with angelica his queen she not aware what in her way did stand of her lorn lover's boasting then i ween came unto him so near and on such sudden that upon him her horse had well nigh trodden but seeing straight up start a naked man the sight did her greatly amaze and fright she knows him not nor guess at him she can she thinketh sure he is some hellish sprite rough grisly beard eyes staring visage wan all parched and sunburned and deformed in sight in fine he looked to make a true description in face like death in colour like egyptian but she at this strange sight as erst i said did gallop thence as fast as she could ride and screeching loud she crieth out for aid unto medoro her beloved guide the mad orlando was not ill apaid when such a pretty damsel he had spied though he no knowledge nor remembrance had how this was she for whom he first fell mad yet as delighted with her pleasing hue and liking well to see so fair a face with great desire he straight doth her pursue even as a hound the fearful doe doth chase medoro moved herewith his rapier drew and after this mad fellow rides apace and with his horse he thinketh down to tread him and with his blade he thinketh to behead him but by effect contrariwise he found that he without his host his reckoning made the madman shrinketh not an inch of ground and his bare skin was harder than the blade yet suddenly when as the madman found that one behind his back did him invade he turned and with his fist so smote the horse as made him lie on ground a senseless course and in a trice he back again doth go to catch angelica who spurs with speed and thinketh still her palfrey's pace too slow for such a turn and so it was indeed for had it gone like arrow from a bow it hardly could have hope her at this need at last her only hope was in the ring for now to help her was none other thing the ring that never failed her at her need did make her now to vanish out of sight but whether that it were for want of heed or that the suddenness did her affright or that her beast did founder with the speed or that she did determine to alight of all these which it was i cannot tell but topsy-turvy from the beast she fell had she fallen shorter or on t'other side in likelihood the madman had her caught which if he had she doubtless should have died but great good fortune her delivery wrought but now another beast she must provide 
for this another pace will soon be taught orlando still doth her pursue so fast that needs he must overget her at the last as for angelica i take no care i know that she a beast long will not lack but rather steal one as she did the mare that now in madman's hands will suffer rack to follow her orlando doth not spare till he her stayed and leapt upon her back then galloped he as long as she was able and lets her rest in neither field nor stable until at last in leaping o'er a ditch the poor mare put her shoulder out of joint he with his fall took neither atch nor stitch nor of the bruise he passeth not a point nor seeketh he for turpentine or pitch the poor beast's bruised members to anoint though he might see with this fall he had marred her yet fain he would she should have borne him farther at last on his own shoulder her he laid and bare her so about an arrow shoot but feeling then that she too heavy weight he leadeth her and lets her go on foot she limping follows him and still he said come on come on but little did it boot at last to make her her slow pace to alter about his right leg he doth tie her halter and tells her now with ease she follow may and so to harry her he doth begin the sharp stones lying in the rugged way fret off her hair and afterward the skin the beast misused thus lives scarce a day orlando hath her tied unto his shin he sees not nor he knows not she is dead but on he draws her as his fury led and sure he would have served her such a touch i mean his mistress if he could have caught her had not the virtue of that ring been such as how to walk invisible it taught her ah cursed be that ring and cursed as much be he that so unluckily it brought her else sure orlando had revenged then her often wrongs to him and other men yet why wish i this curse on her alone i would the like might hap on all the kind for in a thousand good there is not one all be so proud unthankful and unkind with flinty hearts careless of others moan in their own lusts carried most headlong blind but more herein to speak i am forbidden sometime for saying truth one may be chidden end of book twenty nine the thirtieth book of orlando furioso this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by thomas copeland orlando furioso by ludovico ariosto translated by sir john harrington book thirty the argument strange feats by mad orlando are achieved fierce mandricard is by rogero slain himself so hurt that all the camp believed he had been dead the foremost of the twain his love with his long absence sore is grieved to break his word his wounds to him constrain rinaldo with his kinsfolk and his friends to set his prince at liberty intends when men with wrath and sudden pangs of ire permit themselves to be o'erwhelmed and drowned and hot revenge that burns like flaming fire moves hearts to hurt or tongues or hands to wound though after to amend it they desire yet place of pardon seldom can be found ah worthy ladies i do you beseech to pardon that my former foolish speech for i am grown like a diseased man that when he finds by physic no relief and now no more with patience suffer can the burning torture of his lingering grief doth fall to rave and rage and curse and ban blaspheming god renouncing his belief but when that fit is past then would he fain but ah he cannot call it back again yet ladies of your clemency i hope i pity shall not only pardon find although i somewhat swerve from reason's scope and rash words flow from unadvised mind she only bears the blame that slays my hope and for true service shows herself unkind that i did speak was partly of compassion with sympathy moved of orlando's passion who as i partly did before declare in monstrous sort surveyed marsilio's reign and wrought great woe great danger and great care to all the then inhabitants of spain i told you how he drew the silly mare tied to his leg till she was dead with pain and how he had so small sense in his head he drew her after him when she was dead but coming to a great deep running water he was constrained to let her there abide 
and for he swims as perfect as an otter he quickly passed to the other side where then a herdman came his beasts to water and on a kirtle he himself did ride and though he saw the madman and did view him yet being naked he would not eschew him the madman prayeth him that he would spare his horse that they two might together cope i left quoth he on t'other side my mare and fast about her neck i left a rope i left her dead but yet with heed and care of her recovery there is good hope the herdman laugheth at his senseless words and unto him no answer he affords ho oh, saith orlando fellow dost not hear i must thy kirtle have thou needst not laugh and with that word approaching somewhat near the crabbed herdman with a crab-tree staff gave him a bastinado on his ear which put the mad earl into such a chaff that with his fist he made the herdman reel till pain itself made him no pain to feel this done he leapeth on the horse's back and at adventure on he takes his way where e'er he comes he putteth all to rack his horse tastes neither provender nor hay but though this tired a horse he may not lack the next he meets by force he takes away to strive with him it was but little boot he is resolved not to go afoot he passeth to the straits of zibaltar or zibalterra call it which you will and as he went with force of open war towns he did burn and all the dwellers kill ten years will hardly make that he would mar within one hour and thus he travelled still till on a day riding upon the sand he saw a ship new loosed from the land the air was clear and mild and calm the weather and certain gentlefolk had hired the bark with mind to take their solace there together and to return again ere it were dark the man-man cries ho sirs let me come thither his deeds his words they neither mark nor hark or if they did you may be sure they thought they would not cumbered be with such a fraught he hallows after them and hoops and hails to have them stay and with fair words doth woo them glad might they be they went with oars and sails for might he come he surely would undo them the fool that sees how small his speech prevails beats on his horse and means to ride unto them in vain his horse would shun this hard adventure but he perforce makes him the sea to enter first he his feet doth wet and then his knees and next his belly after that his back now scant his nose one in the water seas and still he lays him on poor horse alack that either in these seas his life must lease or swim to afric ere he can turn back at last with swimming tired with water cloyed his belly filled till limbs of life were void the horse unto the bottom quickly sunk and had for company his burthen drowned if fortune that helps frantic men and drunk had not him safe conveyed to afric ground orlando at the danger never shrunk but to the shore he swam both safe and sound it happy was the seas were then so still else had the earl been drowned for all his skill now being safe arrived at the shore near setta strait he ranged o'er the coast and did such deeds as he had done before on t'other side to many poor men's cost at last he came whereas he found great store of warlike weapons and a mighty host but how with them this madman disagreed i may not in this book to tell proceed and further how angelica the fair did meet her love again and what a lord he grew by matching with so great an heir and lived with her in love and sweet accord although in birth an unfit matched pair i leave for other muses to record for now i must address myself to tell what haps in agramante's camp befell i told you two books past thereabout how mandricard was doralise's choice and how in face of all that pagan rout she gave that doom that made him much rejoice for she was deemed for beauty out of doubt the best in europe by the common voice now chief since fair angelica was fled and worthy isabella lost her head but yet this pleasure was not so entire but that it sauced was with some annoy for wrath and envy set his heart on fire and much abated of his present joy it spites him that rogero dare aspire to give his coat being a beardless boy and further that the king of saracane should openly lay claim to durandane 
and first rogero will by no means yield by no entreaty nor by no request that mandricard should carry that same shield which had the argent eagle on the crest except he first could win it in the field on t'other side gradasso doth not rest but he will be the first to try by fight which of them two had to the sword most right with agrament marsilio took great pain in all or part these quarrels to appease but when they saw their labor was in vain to govern or persuade with one of these the chance quoth agrament shall make that plain for which you strive and even as fortune please so let it be and let some lots be cast which two or three shall fight the first or last and yet this just request deny me not before the matter any further goeth though now you be so violent and hot that speech of peace and all accord you loath to grant that who shall combat first by lot may leasing lease and winning win for both this motion most indifferent must seem sith both their values equal we esteem this motion neither of them do mislike and straight credasso's and rogero's name upon two scrolls were writ so passing like you would have judged them both to be the same a boy of fourteen year of age they piked to draw the lot and he that first out came must fight with mandricard and make it known he fights for t'other's title and his own when on this order all parts were agreed the lot to fight upon rogero fell which hap great grief did in gradasso breed although in show he seemed to take it well contrariwise it did all joy exceed the joy rogero had it so befell so well of his own value he believed he joyed at that at which the other grieved but yet credasso doth with great regard both favor and advance rogero's side and showeth him how he must lie to ward a coming blow how he might slip aside how for a thrust he may be best prepared which blows be firm and which be falsified when best time is to follow thrust or blow how one may best take vantage of his foe the rest of that same day that did remain ensuing this same course of casting lots they spent as pleased each man's private vein in talk or banqueting or tossing pots to see this fight the people glad and fain clamour the scaffolds gazing still like sots some for delight to come by break of day and some all night within the place to stay thus as i say these simple fools do long to see the combat these brave knights betwixt and blame the stay and think the time too long that for the same the heralds had prefixed but sober men that knew what did belong to such exploits whose wiser heads were fixed on public good this quarrel much lament and travelled all they can it to prevent the chief marsilio and sabrino sage advise king agramant to stay the fight and these same champions fury to assuage and to take up the quarrel if they might for warning him when they must battle wage with charles of france the loss of one such knight will do him greater hurt and damage then than would the loss of thousands other men but agrament knew all was true they spoke and fain he would their counsel wise obey but could not tell his grant how to revoke only he doth in courteous sort them pray that they may strike with them so great a stroke either to end or to defer the fray and yield the rather unto his persuasion because it rose upon so light occasion or if they did esteem such toys so far as though they matters were of true renown that yet they would the fight so long defar until the son of pippin were put down and till they conquered had the realm by war and tain from him his mantle and his crown this motion had in likelihood taken place save each thought first consent would be disgrace above them all and more than all the rest that in this sort their speech in vain had spent fair doralus doth mandricard request that to the king's desire he would assent she doth exhort entreat persuade protest she doth complain and languish and lament to think that by his over hasty collar she still must live in anguish and in dolor how can i hope said she that ere i shall live any hour in solace and in joy when still i see you ready be to brawl with every man for every trifling toy the sarsen's foil doth me no good at all my choice of you hath bred me more annoy to end that quarrel ah, ah what did it boot sith straight another quarrel is on foot 
I, simple fool in mind, was proud and glad that such a prince, so brave a man as you, for love of me his whole state ventured had. But now I find, by this that doth ensue, that I had far more reason to be sad, sith each like cause like danger doth renew, and not my love, but your own native fury to bide such hard adventures did procure ye. But if your love be such as in your speech you do profess, and in your open show, then by that love I humbly you beseech, and by that fancy which too well I know doth even my heart and soul with love bewitch, let not this quarrel any further grow. I see not why it should you so molest to see your eagle in another's crest. If needs you will attempt this hardy feat, and vent her life upon a thing so vain, the hazard that you make must needs be great, but none or very small can be the gain. But if that fortune change her fickle seat, think then, oh, think, what woe shall I sustain? Then never yet was emperor or king could boast that he had fortune in a string. But if that life be unto you less dear than is a painted bird upon a shield, yet for my sake, whom it doth touch more near, let me entreat you to this motion yield. If you were slain, what joy could I have here? Death, soul, from woe, both could and should me shield, nor fear I death. My only grief would be before my death thy woeful end to see. Thus earnestly fair Dorilice dealt all that same night, as in his arms she lies, and as she spake, the tears distill and melt in watery streams down from her crystal eyes. The tartar, that no little passion felt, to comfort her saith all he can devise, and wipes her cheeks, and her sweet lip doth kiss, and weeps for company, and answers this. Ah, do not grieve thyself so sore, my dear. Ah, do not grieve thyself for such a toy. Pluck up thy sprites, and be of better cheer. There is no cause of fear, mine only joy. No, though that all the kings and captains here had sworn my death and vowed mine annoy, yet all the kings and captains I would vanquish. Why then should you causeless in sorrow languish? What, did not I with truncheon of a spear, you know yourself whether I say the truth, not having sword or other weapon there, win you from all your guard? And shall a youth, a beardless boy, cause you my safety fear and breed in you so unadvised ruth? Well might you deem I were a dastard lout, if a Rogero I should stand in doubt. Gradasso, though unto his grief and shame, yet if one ask him, cannot it gainsay that when he last unto Soraya came, I met and took him prisoner by the way? Yet he is of another manner fame than is Rogero, you yourself will say. I had him there a prisoner at my will, and if I listed, might have kept him still. And lest I should of this good witness want, beside Gradasso, there be hundreds more, as namely Isolir and Sacrapunt, whom I set free and had great thanks therefore. Also the famous Griffin and Aquilant, that there were taken but few days before, with divers more, both Turkish and baptized, that by my force were taken and surprised. Their wonder in those countries still doth last, of that great value I that time did show. And should I now a doubt or peril cast? Am I in greater danger now, you trow? Shall one young youth me hand to hand aghast? Shall I now doubt his force or fear his blow? Now having Durandana by my side, and Hector's armor on my back beside? Why did not I, as pointed was by lot, with Rodamond first bloody battle wage, that by his ill success you might for what the speedy end of this young sorry page? Dry up these tears, my dear, and bring me not before the combat such an ill presage. Nor think an eagle or a target painted moves me hereto, but doubt of honor tainted. Thus much said he, but she such answer made him, with words expressing such a loving moan, as were not only able to persuade him, but might, I think, have moved a marble stone. The force was great wherewith she did invade him. In fine, 
so far she conquers him alone he grants thus far to be at her devotion if peace be offered to accept the motion and so i think indeed he would have done had not rogero early in the morn got up before the rising of the sun and entered in the lists and blown his horn to show that he the battle would not shun and that jove's bird by him was justly born which either he will carry on his shield or else will leave his carcass in the field but when the tartar fierce did hear that sound and that his men thereof had brought him word he thinks great shame should unto him redound if any treaty he of peace afford arm arm he cries and straight he arms him round and by his side he hangs his trusty sword and in his countenance he looks so grim scarce dorilus herself dare speak to him and armed at all pieces up in haste he gets and that same courser he bestrides that was that christian champions in times past who now doth run his wits and sense besides and thus he comes unto the lists at last the place that all such quarrels still decides the king and all his court soon after came and now ere long begins the bloody game now on their heads their helmets are made fast now are the lances put into their hands now was the token given by trumpet's blast which both the horse and horseman understands now in a full career they gallop fast and either strongly to his tackle stands now with such force the tongue the t'other strake as though that heaven did fall and earth did shake the argent eagle comes on either side with wings displayed on either captain's shield the bird which jove men say was seen to ride though better winged o'er the thessalian field as for their mighty strength and courage tried their massy spears sufficient witness yield nor stirred they more with those tempestuous knocks than wind stirs towers or waves to stir the rocks the splinters of the spears flew to the sky as turpin writeth that was present there and were on fire by having been so nigh unto the scorching of the fiery spear the champions out their swords draw by and by as those that neither sword nor fire did fear and either thrusteth at the t'other's face and seeks by force the t'other to displace they never sought to hurt each other's steed not that they made together such accord but that they deemed it an unworthy deed not worthy of a worthy knight or lord of base revenge they count that act proceed and meet of noble minds to be abhorred so that in those days none were known to kill a horse except it were against his will upon their visors both do strike at once and though the same were firm and plated double as being made of proof and for the nonce yet did the force of such fell strokes them trouble and still they lay on load as thick as stones of hail that often turn the corn to stubble i think it needless further to allege if they have strength or if their swords have edge yet long they fought together in that field ere any sign of any blow was left such wary heed each took himself to shield but durandan at last fell with such heft full on the circle of rogero's shield that half way through the argent bird it cleft and pierced the coat of mail that was within and found a passage to the very skin the cruel blow made many hearts full cold of such as wished well to rogero's part for most of those that stood by to behold rogero favored in their mind and heart so that afore to say one might be bold if fortune follow with the greater part fierce mandricard were slain or else should yield so that this blow offended half the field but surely some good angel i believe the force of this so fearful stroke abated rogero though the wound him somewhat grieve yet was his mind therewith no whit amated great usury he mindeth him to give and that the strife may quickly be debated he frankly strikes with his whole force and might full on the helmet of the tartar knight with so great force and fury came the blow as to the teeth no doubt had cloven his head saving by what mishap i do not know but want of heed that too much haste had bred it lighted flatling on him else i trow that stroke alone had him most surely sped but as it was it made his head so idle he opened both his hands and loosed his bridle good brilliador that felt the slacked rein 
i think still mourning for his master's change ran up and down at random on the plain his senseless rider suffering him to range who when he came unto himself again and saw his horse to run a course so strange a spurned viper hath not so much wrath nor wounded lion as the tartar hath he claps the spurs to brilliodoro's side and on his stirrups he himself advances and to his foe with fury he doth ride and up on high his right arm he enhances to strike a blow but when rogero spied his arm lie ope as oft in fight it chances he chopped his sword's point under t'other's arm and pulled it out with blood both wet and warm by which he did not only maim his foe by letting blood upon so large a vein but baited much the fury of the blow which notwithstanding fell with force so main as made rogero stagger to and fro and mazed his head and dazed his eyes with pain and much it was that time for his behoof to have his helmet of so good a proof but having now again recovered force and as it were new wakened from his dream upon the tartar prince he turned his horse and on his thigh he strikes with strength extreme that through the steel he did the sword enforce out spins the blood in pure vermilion stream naught could avail enchanted hector's arms against his sword with stronger tempered charms the tartar feeling to his great disease his body wounded as he little thought did rage as terrible as do the seas with highest winds and strongest tempests wrought he curseth heavens his smarting pangs to ease the shield that had the bird for which he fought away he hurleth from him for the nonce and to his sword he sets both hands at once ah quoth rogero too plain trial this is that to that eagle thou no title hast that first didst with thy sword cut mine in pieces and now thine own away from thee dost cast thus much said he but whatsoever he says he must the force of durindana taste which fell upon his forehead with such might a mountain might have seemed to fall as light i say the blow upon his forehead fell but yet his beaver saved it from his face it happened at that time for him full well that in the hollow there was so much space yet harmless quite to scape him not befell for why the sword that ever cuts apace did pierce his plated saddle and beside an inch did enter into rogero's side thus each with crimson had his armor dyed and blood did stream from both a double way yet hitherto it could not be descried on whither side would chances balance sway at last rogero did that doubt decide with that same sword that ever home doth pay and where the t'other's target wants there just rogero pays him with a speeding thrust the blade gainst which prevails no magic art his curates pierced and ribs and flesh it tore and found a passage to the naked heart now must the tartar prince for evermore in sword and painted shield forsake his part not only so but that which grieves him more he must forsake his much beloved life more loved honor and most loved wife the wretch yet unrevenged did not die but gave hard recompense ere he departed at good rogero's head he doth let fly and had no doubt the same in sunder parted save that his arm was maimed and so thereby much of his force from thence had been divarted much of his force divarted was from thence before when for his arm he wanted fence but as it was yet too too hard it fell and caused the noble knight great pain to feel his helmet it did cleave though plated well and made for proof of tough well-tempered steel and in the very skull it clove a spell two fingers deep and made him backward reel he backward falls the pain was so exceeding with grievous wound his head most freshly bleeding rogero was the first that tumbled down and mandricardo fell a good while after all thought rogero dead because his crown still bled but chiefly stordilano's daughter joys that her spouse had won this fight's renown now hopes she she shall turn her tears to laughter and as she thought so was the common voice so that the tartar's friends did all rejoice but when there did appear by certain signs the live man living and the dead man slain then dorelice wrings her hands and whines and grief came there and comfort here again 
the chiefest part, whose favor all inclines unto Rogero, are full glad and fain, and gratulate his good success, and grace him, and run to him, and in their arms embrace him. Nor was this show of love dissimulation, but true unfeigned kindness and good faith, but yet Gradasso's faint congratulation makes men surmise he thinks not as he saith. He secretly envies such reputation, though outwardly the flatterer he playth, and curseth were it destiny or chance that to this enterprise did him advance. But Agrament, that ever did before do him great honor and him well esteem, now he doth him admire, extol, adore, so highly of his value he doth deem. In him alone he puts affiance more than all his camp together, it should seem, now that the seed of Agricane was spent, and Rodamont gone thence a malcontent. What should I tell the praise that many a lady gave of this knight of Africa and of Spain, who knew that Mandricardo was no baby, and saw him now by this man's value slain? Yea, doleful Dorilis herself, it may be, save that for modesty she must refrain, would have been moved with a small request to speak as well of him as did the rest. I say it may be, but I cannot tell, for why before unconstant she was proved, and sure Rogero's parts did so excel as any lady doubtless might have moved. While t'other lived, perhaps she liked him well, but now to seek anew it her behooved, such one as she herself might able warrant to ride both day and nightly on her errand. Now brought the king Rogero with great care to his own tent, that there he may be cured. The best physicians thither sent for are to search his wounds, they straight his life assured. The shield and arms that Mandricardo bare, the which this bloody battle first procured, all save the sword that was Gradasso's right, were hanged up by his bed's head that night. Howbeit, that brave courser Brilliador Rogero needs would give unto the king, who took it thankfully, and set more store by that same steed than any such like thing. But hereof now, a while I treat no more. First must you hear what news the maid did bring, I mean Hippolca, to her mistress dear, whom love had made to be of heavy cheer. She told her first what hap to her befell, how Frontine by a Turk was ta'en away, and after how she found at Merlin's well Ricardo and Rogero that same day, to whom she did her hard adventure tell, and how Rogero went with her straightway to win the horse out of the pagan's fist, but at that season he his purpose missed. Also she told to Bradamant the cause why her dear love himself did now absent, who promised her to take a little pause, and then her mind most thoroughly content. In fine, Hippolca from her bosom draws that letter which was to her mistress sent, who so much less did seem to like the letter, because she would have liked his presence better. For sith before she did himself expect, now paper in his steed to have, and ink, it causeth her to fear and to suspect, and made some doubts into her thoughts to sink. Yet liked she well the meaning and effect, and kissed the letter off, and sure I think had burned it with the heat of her desire, save that the tears she shed did quench that fire. She read the writing o'er five times or six, the words, the phrase, the sense her pleased so well, and then she made the maid each time betwixt the message that Rogero sent to tell and save he did so short a time prefix to come to her and a with her to dwell i think she never would have ceased mourning till she had seen or heard of his returning rogero to apolka promised had fifteen or twenty days at most to stay and her to tell her mistress so he bade but swearing to come sooner if he may but ne'ertheless good bradamant is sad still doubting chances to prolong that day all things said she, to fortune are subjected, and chief in wars that are by chance directed. I, my Rogero, who could once have thought, sith I more than myself esteemed thee, that thou by any means couldst have been brought to bear thy very foes more love than me, whom thou shouldst hurt, by thee their help is sought, whom thou shouldst save, by thee they spoiled be. Needs must I blame thy negligent regarding, as well in punishing as in rewarding. 
Trojano slew thy sire, I think thou knowest, for sure the stones it know, yet to his son thou think'st in honor thou such duty owest, that thou must see no hurt may him be done. Is this sufficient a revenge thou trowest? Think'st thou true fame can by such facts be won? Lo, unto what thy show of honors tends, to serve thine enemies and slay thy friends, Thus Bradamant spake to her absent love with passion great, and evermore her maid with reason seeks that fancy to remove, assuring her she need not be afraid, and wishing her with patient mind to prove if so he would not do as he had said, and that she would in all things hope the best, and then to God and fortune leave the rest. With this good speech of hers and strong persuasion, she doth his coming till the day expect which good rogero break not by occasion that he his word and promise did neglect but that which happed against his expectation his wounds had bred so dangerous effect but chief the same he last took in his head which made him forty days to keep his bed now pradamant doth wait the twenty days and stayed at montalbano with her mother and making still inquiry many ways if she might hear some news of one or other but none she heard save that which to his praise was told her after by her younger brother which though she joyed to hear as was most meet yet mingled was some sour with that same sweet for why the value of marfisa stout which did assist them greatly as he told to win their kinsmen from the moorish rout that unto bertolage should have been sold this bred in bradamante's mind some doubt and strake into her heart a jealous cold because, twas said, they two together went to agrament that in his camp was pent. For though she could not choose but greatly praise her that did herself so stout and valiant prove, yet on the t'other side her beauty phrase her, lest he perhaps on her might set his love. But yet in fine hope of his promise stays her, so that in twenty days she did not move from Montalbano, and in that same place there thither came the chief man of her race. I mean not chief of birth, but chief of name, for two there were in birth more old than he. Rinaldo unto Montalbano came, his brothers, cousins, and his friends to see, whom he had heard by speech of flying fame now safe arrived at that place to be, and how Rogero and Marfisa wrought their liberty when they were sold and bought. Wherefore he came to see them face to face, and understand with them how each thing stood. It seemed he was as welcome to the place as is the swallow to her tender brood that almost starved and in sorry case have long expected sustenance and food. And when they there had stayed a day or twain, both they and he to Paris went again. Alardo and Guichardo, Richardet and Melagigi and good Vivienne, close after this brave lord themselves to get, and Bradamant with them they would obtain, but she alleged she could not come as yet, but hopes ere long they should be overtain. She praised them, for that time content to hold them, for why she was not well at ease, she told them. And true it was, she was not well at ease, not that she had a fit of any fever or any other corporal disease. It was a fit of love that burneth ever, whose heat no herb nor physic can appease. This fit did her from that brave crew dissever, but in another book I shall repeat what succor they did bring to Charles the Great. End of book thirty. The thirty first book of Orlando Furioso. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland. Orlando Furioso by Ludovico Ariosto, translated by Sir John Harrington, Book Thirty One, The Argument. Unwares doth Guidon with Rinaldo fight, but afterward is by his brethren known, by whose great courage and united might the Turks are vanquished and overthrown. Good Brandimart seeks out that woeful knight whose wits by love distraught are not his own, is tain, and of his life was in great peril. Rinaldo and Gradasso fall to quarrel. What state of life more pleasing may we find than theirs that true and hearty love do bear, whom that sweet yoke doth fast together bind that man in paradise first learned to wear? 
were not some so tormented in their mind with that same vile suspect that filthy fear that torture great that foolish frenesy that raging madness called jealousy for every other sour that gets a place to seat itself amid this pleasant sweet doth help in the end to give a greater grace and makes love's joy more grateful when they meet whoso abstains from sustenance a space shall find both bread and water relish sweet men know not peace nor rightly how to deem it that have not first by war been taught to steam it though eyes want sight of that they would see fain the thought yet sees and hearts with patience take it long absence grieves yet when they meet again that absence doth more sweet and pleasant make it to serve and see you long time for little gain so that all hope do not even quite forsake it one may endure for when the pain is past reward though long it stay yet comes at last the sharp repulses and the deep disdains and all the torments that in love are found at last with pleasure recompense the pains and make far more contentment to abound but if this hellish plague infects the brains though afterward it seem both whole and sound the quality thereof is so mischievous the very thought is to a lover grievous this is that cruel wound against whose smart no liquor's force prevails nor any plaster no skill of stars no depth of magic art devised by that great clerk zoroaster a wound that so infects the soul and heart as all our sense and reason it doth master a wound whose pang and torment is so durable as it may rightly call it be incurable this is a plague that quickly doth infect all lovers hearts and doth possess their thoughts as well with causeless as with just suspect by this a man to madness mere is brought o oh, plague by whose most damnable effect in deep despair to die have diverse thought o oh, jealousy that didst without desert possess the noble bradamante's heart not for the tale her maid or brother told which made within her mind a sharp impression but other news that made her heart full cold how her love of new love did make profession as i more plain hereafter shall unfold for now i needs a while must make digression to brave rinaldo that to paris were did march with that same crew of great regard the day ensuing ere it yet was night they met an armed knight upon the way a lady fair accompanied the knight his armor all was black save that there lay athwart the breast a wreath of argent bright and straight the foremost man in their array which richard detto was as then did chance he challenged with him to break a lance the gallant youth that never man refused straight turned his horse a space for course to take as one that for his time had often used such feats as this to do and undertake rinaldo standeth still and then perused to see which knight the fairest course could make now richard Ed thinks if i hit him just i shall this gallant tumble in the dust but otherwise it then to him befell and of his reckoning he was quite deceived the t'other knew to hit and sit so well that richard it was from the saddle heaved alardo seeing how his brother fell did think to avenge the foil that he received but he likewise inferior did remain his arm was bruised his shield was rent in twain guichardo next the self-same fortune tried and was constrained unto the ground to incline although to him rinaldo loudly cried stay hold your hands for this course should be mine vivian and malagage and more beside that at their kinsman's foil did much repine would then have fought with this same stranger knight save that rinaldo claimed it as his right and said my friends we must to paris haste but to himself he said it were a jest for me to stay till all they down were cast by one and one i'll fight and they shall rest this said he spurs his horse and cometh fast and as he runs he sets his spear in rest the t'other doth as much and either spear the stroke doth in a thousand pieces tear the horsemen with the stroke stir not an inch they both had learned so perfectly to sit but on their horses it doth shrewdly pinch yet bayard scarce his course doth intermit the t'other's horse had such a parlous wrench that marred him quite and break his back with it his master 
that was greatly grieved to see it, forsakes his seat, and takes him to his feet. And to Rinaldo, that with naked hand came toward him in show of truce, he said, Sir Knight, I give you here to understand, I liked so well this horse that here is dead, I think it would not with mine honor stand to leave him unrevenged, which hast me led to challenge you, even as you are true knight, that you will answer me again in fight. Rinaldo answered, If your horse you lost, the only cause of this your quarrel be, then comfort you, for of mine only cost your want herein shall be supplied by me, with such a horse as I may boldly boast to be as good a one as e'er was he. Not so, sir, said the t'other, you mistake it, I will expound my mind and plainer make it. Though I liked well my serviceable horse, yet, sithy now is in this conflict slain, think not that of his death I so much force as that alone moves me to fight again, but in plain terms, on foot to try your force as well as erst on horseback I would fain. Rinaldo, that of no man's force accounted, without delay straight from his horse dismounted. And sith, quoth he, I see your noble mind, of this my company hath no suspicion. They shall go on, and I will stay behind, and so will fight with you on even condition. This said, his band to part thence he assigned, who went their way upon their lord's commission, which bred great admiration in the stranger to find a man so little fearing danger. Now when his standard quite was out of sight, and all Rinaldo's company was gone, then hand to hand they do apply the fight. With force and fury great they lay it on, each marvels at the t'other's passing might, and yet of either side the gain is none. They felt the blows so heavy and so hard that glad they were to lie well to their ward. Thus these two knights, for honor's only sake, together combat in such eager sort that every little error they should make endangered life in this unpleasant sport. An hour and half this travel they did take, each laboring to cut the t'other short, and in his mind Rinaldo marvels much who this should be whose skill and force was such, and save he could not with his reputation, he would have wished the battle at an end, and offered of a truce communication, and of his unknown foe have made his friend. Likewise the t'other felt such inclination, now finding scarce he could himself defend, that he repented his rash hardy part, and would have had a truce with all his heart. It waxed dark, there fell an evening mist, so that at last they neither of them know when he did hit aright right and when he missed, nor how to give nor how to ward a blow, when first Rinaldo wished him to desist, sith now the sun descended was so low, and that the combat might be now rejourned till Phoebus were about the world returned, offering, at which the stranger greatly mused, and his rare courtesy therein commended, to lodge him where he should both be well used and like a man of honor well attended. The t'other his great curtsy not refused, and so between them two the fray was ended, and straight Rinaldo gave him as his gift his page's horse, that was both strong and swift. Thus on they rode unto Rinaldo's tent, and grew acquainted ere they thither came, by means in certain speeches as they went. Rinaldo happened to tell his name, by which the stranger knew incontinent that this was that same paladin of fame, and that himself was to Rinaldo brother, by father's side alone, and not by mother. The savage guide in this brave warrior height, that travelled had full many a hundred mile, with those two brothers named the Black and White, and Sansonet, until by craft and guile they were surprised, as you heard last night, and made against their wills to wait a while for maintenance of laws unjust and bad that wicked Pinabel devised had. Now when as noble Guidon certain knew that this Rinaldo was, whom he before desired long to see, he much did rue that he had done, and did lament it sore. A blind man, would not be more glad to view the light he doubted he should ne'er see more than Guiden in his mind was well appaid to see this night, and thus to him he said, What strange mishap, what sinister adventure hath bred this fault in me, my noble lord, that I with you into this strife should enter, with whom I ought to have all kind accord? I am your father's son, not by one venter. I ever have your name and stock adored, Guiden I hight, Constanza was my mother, born beyond Euxine's seas, but yet your brother. 
wherefore I pray pardon my fond offence, that have instead of duty offered wrong, and tell me wherein I may recompense this oversight, and I will do ere long. Rinaldo, that had heard of him long since, and to have seen him did not little long, embraced him, and not only did forgive him, but commendation great and praise did give him. He said his value was a perfect sign to show himself in fight so fierce and stout that he was truly come of that same line whose noble root was blown the world about. For if your manners did to peace incline, then had there been, said he, more cause of doubt. The fearful heart comes not of lion's seed, nor doth a silly dove a falcon breed. Thus fell they two acquainted by the way, and talked together friendly as they went. But neither did their talk the journey stay, nor did their riding make their speech relent, until they came where all their brothers lay, when as a great part of the night was spent, who with great joy and pleasure did behold them, and chief when who this was Rinaldo told them. For though he must to them no doubt have ever been very welcome as a brother dear, yet could he be to them more welcome never than now what time as you before did hear they all did mind to do their best endeavour to rescue charles that was of heavy cheer wherefore for this one cause above the rest he was unto them all a welcome guest thus now the day ensuing on went guidon joining himself unto rinaldo's crew and as to paris walls they forward ride on they met two valiant youths that well him knew Further with him conferring, they descried one, a lady, richly clad and fair of hue. These warlike youths had Gismund to their mother, white griffin, and black aquilant his brother. Now Guiden knew them, and to them was known, as having been together many days, by whom they were unto Rinaldo shown and praised for gallant men at all assays. As in your judgment, likewise in mine own, Rinaldo said, these youths do merit praise for they have oft been proved two perfect warriors as well in spite as sport at tilt and barriers rinaldo did by their apparel know them tun ever wearing white that other black and friendly countenance he now did show them chiefly because the king did suffer lack wherefore into his band he doth bestow them that band that to the turks must bring much rack and they do join them to rinaldo's banner forgetting all old jars in loving manner between the house of ammon and these twins about one truffledin a jar there fell the matter at the first not worth two pins wherefore the circumstance i will not tell but now rinaldo their affection wins by using them so courteously and well for courteous speech and usage mild and kind wipes malice out of every noble mind now after these another knight there came, hight Sansonet, a man of great account, who welcomed was, and took it for no shame of stout Rinaldo's band himself to count. While this thus passed, behold, the gallant dame that knew this noble lord of Claramount, for she was one that all the French lords knew, told him a tale that made him greatly rue. My lord, said she, I bring you sorry tiding. He whom the church and empire held so dear runs all about in no one place abiding of sense and argument deprived clear. He naked goes, not nature's secrets hiding, which me to tell and you must grieve to hear. Orlando, that same light and lamp of France hath lost his wits, God knows by what mischance. His arms and sword that he away had thrown, as things by him left and forsaken clearly, I saw a courteous knight, to me unknown, but one it seemed that loved Orlando dearly, them gather where they scattered were and sown, and even of charity, as seemed merely, in triumph wise, on tree he hanged the same, and underneath he graved Orlando's name. But straight the sword that hanged on the tree with force and scornful speech away was ta'en, as I can witness well that did it see, by Mandricard, the son of Agricane. Think you what hurt this will to Europe be, that once again the Turks have Durandain. The gentle knight strave long with him to save it, but in the end was forced to let him have it. I saw Orlando late in monstrous guise to run about uncouth and all unclad with strangest clamours and most hideous cries. In fine, I do conclude that he is mad, 
and save I saw it so with these mine eyes, I would not trust if any told it had. She further told how she had seen him later with Rodamont to tumble in the water, and last of all she told him she had heard how that about his sword there grew some strife between Gradasso Stout and Mandricard, and how the Tartar having lost his life the sword was given Gradasso afterward, as over all the pagan camp was rife, and having ended this so sad narration, thereto she addeth this short exhortation, that he and every one that were not foe to stout Orlando would take so much pain in Paris or elsewhere him to bestow till he had purged his distempered brain. Mine husband Brandemart, said she, I know, to do him any good himself would strain. Thus Fior de Leger spake the loving wife of Brandemart that loved her as his life. At this strange tale and woeful accident, such inward grief the good Rinaldo felt, that with the thought his heart incontinent did seem like snow against the sun to melt, and with all speed he might to go he meant, and by all means he might so to have dealt to seek Orlando, whom, if he can find, he hopes to bring him to a better mind. But sith he now had thither brought his band, or were it the will of God or were it chance, he first doth mind to end the cause in hand, and rescue Paris and the king of France. Wherefore he makes his men all quiet stand till night, what time himself will lead the dance, and then between the fourth and second watch he means at once the matter to dispatch. He makes his men lie close for all that day by way of ambuscado in a wood, and ease themselves and horses all they may, and take the sustenance of rest and food. The place within three leagues of Paris lay. And when the sun was set, he thought it good what time the world doth use his lesser lamp to Parisward to move his silent camp. And as he purposed, he performed indeed, for straight himself with that same gallant crew set out by night, as first they had decreed, in silent sort suspicion to eschew. Now came the time that they must do the deed. Now near unto the Turkish camp they drew, when first the heedless sentinels in trapping, they killed them all because they took them napping. The watch once slain, they are no longer dumb, but after stout Rinaldo soon they came. They sound the trumpet and strike up the drum, and calling still upon that noble name that often had the pagans overcome, I mean Rinaldo's house of Montalbain, which cry he caused both his own men to quicken, and that the Turks might in more fear be stricken. Himself well mounted on his famous horse doth press amidst the pagan prince's tents, and with his own and with his horse's force he treads them down and all in pieces rents. Unarmed or armed he kills without remorse, who ever cometh in his way repents. The drowsy men half-armed make poor resistance against so brave a man with such assistance. For why, beside those men I named before, whose virtue and whose value oft were shown, Rinaldo had six hundred men, and more, all perfect trained, of strength and courage known, which about Claremont he kept in store for his own use and causes of his own, though at this need his prince's turn to furnish, he soon agreed his own towns to unfurnish. And though Rinaldo had no great revenue, the which chief sinews unto war affords, yet kept he still six hundred in retinue, what with good usage and with gentle words, that all of them did still with him continue at his command, with lances, horse, and swords, nor was there any that from him away went, though diverse others offered greater payment. Now think, when this brave crew the Turks assailed, at unawares half wake or half asleep, how that same name and that same noise them quailed, how here they fled and there with hold and keep, but smally flight, and less their flight prevailed. But even as goats from lions, or as sheep from wolves make small defence, such, in comparison, these pagans made against Rinaldo's garrison. On t'other side, King Charles, that by a spile had notice of Rinaldo's coming hither, with all that crew so noble and so loyal, that to his aid combined were together, with divers lords came forth in person royal, and all his men of arms likewise came thither. Eke Brandemart, rich Montodontes heir, did with King Charles unto the field repair. 
whom when his spouse that near about did hover had found out by his standard in his arms and plainly saw it was her dearest lover she rusheth in among the men of arms and unto him herself she doth discover who straight embraceth her in open arms and leaving then the battle drew apart that each to other might their minds impart and after sweet embracing oftentimes they did confer together of their state o virtue of those unsuspicious times when ladies early wander might and late and yet be faultless deemed and free of crimes where now each small suspect turns love to hate yea even for all their watching and safe keeping they doubt their wives do wake while they are sleeping among the conference this couple had the lady did unto her spouse unfold how his good friend orlando was fall mad how she herself his madness did behold his running naked careless and unclad not credible had any else it told but credible it was now she had said it for in far greater things he gave her credit. She further did to Brandemark recount how she had seen the bridge the pagan made, I mean the cruel pagan Rodemount, unto the stream so deep as none could wade, where he the passengers of best account did from each side with fury great invade, and with the spoils of those he killed and took did beautify a tomb built by the brook. And last she told how with his strength extreme Orlando heaved the Turk armed from the ground, and so with him fell backward in the stream with peril great there to have both been drowned, from whence Orlando went about the ream where his mad parts would make him soon be found. This tale in Brandemart did breed such sorrow, he stayed not for the next ensuing morrow, but taking for his guide fair Fjordaledge, and being ready armed, as then he was, he goeth to seek that foresaid parlous bridge, in mind whatever hap the same to pass, where many men their lives line did abridge, as in such dangers soon it comes to pass. No sooner came he to the utmost ward, but Rodemount had notice by his guard. He greatly did to hear such news rejoice, and straight he cometh forth with warlike gesture, and bids him with a loud and scornful voice unto the tomb to yield his arms and vesture, or threatens him if he refuse this choice to make him drink beyond all good digesture. But Brandemart his threats did nothing fear, and makes no answer but with couched spear. Then straight to horse's side he sets the spurs, the horse he rode upon Batoldo height. The horse, though good, yet snores and starts and stirs, much scared with narrow bridge and water sight. Eke Rodemount, his good Frontino spurs, who never starts, as used to this fight, although the bridge did shake all under feet, when in the middle way these knights did meet. Their spears, that were of firm, well-seasoned wood, with so great force upon their armor strake, that, though their horses were both strong and good, yet both fell from the bridge into the lake, quite overwhelmed with water and with mood. Yet neither horseman did his horse forsake. Long tarried they within the stream below, to search if any nymph dwelt there, I trow. This had not been the first time, nor the fifth, that from this bridge the Turk had been thrown down, wherefore his horse and he could better shift, for neither horse nor he did doubt to drown. For where the stream was most profound and swift, he often had been plunged above his crown, which made his horse and him the more audacious amid the stream, although profound and spacious. He knew by proof, for he had tried it oft, where all the shelves and where the channel lay, which parts were gravelly and which were soft, the t'other ignorant was borne away, tossed here and there, now low and then aloft, the while the pagan, greedy of his prey, at all advantages doth still assail him, whose horse's footing more and more did fail him. At last, with plunging and with striving tired, he backward fell into the weeds and mood, where he was like to have been drowned and mired, save that his spouse, that by the river stood in humble wise the pagan prince desired, and in most earnest manner that she could, even for her sake, whose ghost he did adore, to help her worthy knight unto the shore. Ah, gentle sir, if ever you did taste of love, she said, or of a lover's passion, save that same knight on whom my love is placed, and let him not be drowned in so vile fashion. 
suffice it you your tomb will be more graced with one such prisoner of such reputation than hundreds other that shall here arrive then take his spoils and save himself alive these words that might have moved a stone i think moved him to rescue noble brandemart who without thirst had tained such store of drink as from his limbs his life did well nigh part but ere he brought him to the river's brink he caused him with his sword and arms depart and made him swear now he was in his power to yield himself true prisoner to his tower the dame of comfort all was quite bereaved when as she saw how ill her spouse had sped and yet less grief of this chance she conceived than if he had been in the water dead she calls herself the cause that he received this harm that fondly had him thither led into a place of danger such and jeopardy as needs must hazard either life or liberty about the place in vain she long did hover then parted she in mind to seek some knight of charles's camp that might her loss recover and prove himself though not more strong in fight at least more fortunate than was her lover long did she travel all that day and night and eke the day ensuing ere she met one yet was it her good hap at last to get one a champion in a rich attire she met all wrought with withered leaves of cypress tree hereafter i will tell you but not yet what white this was whether a he or she now turn i to the camp lest i forget the noble knights that set their sovereign free i mean rinaldo and his new-come brother with cunning malagage and many other unpossible it was account to keep of those were killed that night and those that fled fierce agrament was wakened from his sleep and with all speed that might be up he sped he weighs the peril and the danger deep his soldiers run away ne'er making head marsilio with sobrino and the rest wish him to fly for fear he be distressed advising him sith fortune now gan frown unto this tempest wisely to give place and to arley or some other town so strong to dure assault no little space so might he save his person and his crown as first was to be cared for in such case and then with wisdom warily proceeding to wait till time might serve of better speeding thus agrament to so great danger brought well knew not what to do nor what to say but did as by his counsel he was taught and in great haste conveyed himself away the while much woe into his men was wrought the christians them discomfit kill and slay the darkness caused the number be unknown that in this fight were killed and overthrown with haste full many were in water drowned that saw there was no safety in the land more succor in their heels than hands they found against such fierce assailants few durst stand but greatest damage did to them redound by those six hundred of rinaldo's band who did distribute strokes in so great plenty as every one of them massacred twenty some think that malagigi played his part in this conflict not wounding men or slaying but making of their foes by magic art to hear so huge a noise of horses neighing such sound of drums such shouts from every part as all the world had vowed their decaying by which they all were stricken in such fear as not a man of them durst tarry there yet though the turkish prince fled thence so fast the brave rogero he would not forget but caused him from danger to be placed and on an easy paced horse him set thus now the turks were by the christians chased and glad they were a walled town to get but yet gradasso and his valiant band did still unto their tackles stoutly stand nay which was more when as he understood how that rinaldo paladin of france was he that shed such store of turkish blood he was so glad he ready was to dance he thanks his gods that were to him so good to send him this so much desired chance by which he hopes and makes account most clearly to win that horse rinaldo held so dearly for why gradasso king of saracane long since to france came with an army royal with only hope to conquer durindan that famous blade of so good proof and trial and eke rinaldo's courser to obtain that bayard height and now when in a spile he knew rinaldo was on that beast mounted the conquest sure the horse his own he counted so much the rather for that once before about this matter they had made a fray fast by the sea upon the sandy shore 
to tell the circumstance i may not stay but malagigi thence his cousin bore and did into a barge him safe convey and thereupon rinaldo ever since was ta'en but for a coward by this prince wherefore in hope so rich a spoil to reap two hours before the rising of the sun all armed on althana he doth leap and with his lance to death are divers done on french the moors on moors the french doth heap and all he meeteth he doth overrun so did ambition set his heart on fire to meet rinaldo such was his desire soon after this each met with spear in rest but neither then at first the other knew each brake his spear upon the t'other's crest unto the heavenly car the splinters flew then with their swords either was ready pressed their lances thrown away their swords they drew each laying on the other so fell strokes as if not knights had fought but clowns felled oaks gradasso though he knew him not by sight for yet the morning beams were not displayed yet did he guess both by the horse's might and those fierce strokes that t'other on him laid wherefore with words that savoured scorn and spite he straight begins rinaldo to upbraid and said he had his challenge disappointed and not appeared on the day appointed belike you thought i should have met you never but now said he you here are met right well assure yourself i will pursue you ever were you ta'en up to heaven or down to hell no height nor depth should hinder mine endeavour i mean to find you out where'er you dwell to shun the fight with me it doth not boot until you leave your horse and go on foot at this his speech were divers standing by as guidon richardet and others more who would have slain gradasso by and by had not rinaldo stepped them before and said in wrath what masters am not i well able wreak my private wrongs therefore then to the pagan gently thus he spake and wished him mark the answer he did make whoever saith that i did fight as chew or showed effect of value any way i say and do avouch he saith untrue and i will prove by combat what i say i came unto the place to meet with you no excuses did i seek nor no delay and frankly here to you i offer fight but first i wish you were informed right then took he him aside and more at large he told what happened him and how by art his cousin malagage into a barge conveyed him and forced him to depart in fine himself of blame quite to discharge he brought him out to witness every part and then to prove that this was true indeed he offered in the combat to proceed gradasso that both courteous was and stout gave ear unto the tale rinaldo told and though it seemed he stood thereof in doubt yet him in all his speech she not controlled but in conclusion having heard it out he doth his former purpose firmly hold which was by combat fierce to try and know if so he could by ardo win or no the paladin that passed not a point of no man's force to meet him gave his word the place in which to meet they did appoint was near a wood and by a pleasant ford there only added was a further point which was that durandan orlando's sword should to rinaldo as of right accrue if he the pagan overcame or slew thus for the present time departed they until the time approached a pointed fight although rinaldo friendly did him pray to rest him in his tent that day and night and offered frank safe conduct for his stay so courteous was this same courageous knight gradasso greatly praised the noble offer but yet refused the curtsy he did proffer the fear was great that secretly did lurk in all the minds of all rinaldo's kin who knew the strength and cunning of this turk was such as doubt it was which side should win fain malagigi by his art would work to end this fray before it should begin save that he heard rinaldo's utter enmity in so base sort for working this indemnity but though his friends did fear more than was meet himself assured himself of good success now at the pointed time and place they meet both at one very instant as i guess and first they kindly do embrace and greet the tone the t'other with all gentleness but how sweet words did turn to bitter blows the next book saving one the sequel shows end of book thirty one
The thirty second book of Orlando Furioso. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland. Orlando Furioso by Ludovico Ariosto. Translated by Sir John Harrington. Book thirty two. The argument. Good Bradamant, Rogero long expecteth, but heareth news that touch her very nigh, how he all other loves beside neglecteth to wed Marphisa. Thus the fame doth fly. To Arley Bradamant her course directeth to kill Marphisa, or herself to die. Three kings, and Ulani she doth subdue, those with her spear, and this with passing you. I now remember how by promise bound before this time I should have made you know, upon what cause fair Bradamant did ground the jealous humours overcharged her so. She never took before so sore a wound, she never felt before such bitter woe. No, not the tale which Ricardetto told her, in such a fit and so great pangs did hold her. To tell you first, when I should have begun, Rinaldo called my tale another way. No sooner with Rinaldo had I done, but straight with Guiden I was forced to stay. From this to that thus unawares I run, that I forgot of Bradamant to say. But now I mean to speak of her before I speak of those two champions any more. Yet needs I borrow must a word or twain how Agramant to Arley did retire, and gathered there the few that did remain escaped from the fury of the fire, where not far off from Africa nor Spain he plants as fit as he could well desire, for lying on a flood so near the seas, both men and victual were supplied at ease. To muster men Marsilio had commission that may supply the place of them were lost, of ships of war there was no small provision soon had he gathered up a mighty host there was no want of armor and munition there was no spare of labor nor of cost that with such taxes africa was cessed that all the cities were full sore oppressed and further agrament that he might win fierce rodomont to aid him with his power did offer him a match of his near kin king almont's daughter with a realm and dower but he his proffer weighs not worth a pin, but keeps the bridge, and doth the passage scour, that with his spoils the place was well nigh filled, of those he had dismounted, ta'en, and killed. But fair Marphisa took another way, for when she heard how long the siege had lasted, how agrament his camp at Arley lay, how both his men were slain and store was wasted, she sought no cause of any more delay, but thither straight without inviting hasted her purse and person offering in the fight in just defending of his crown and right she brings brunello and the king she gave him who had given cause of every just defence ten days and ten she did of curtsy save him to see who durst to stand in his defence but when that no man made the means to have him though she to kill him had so good pretence she thought it base her noble hands to file upon an abject dastard and a vile she will defer revenge on all his wrong, and unto Arley brought him to the king, whose joy to tell would ask a learned tongue, both for the aid and present she did bring. For show whereof, before it should be long, he offered her to make Brunello ring, and at what time she pleased to appoint, to have him sent to crack his chiefest joint. Unto some desert place he banished was, to serve for meat for carrion crows and pies. Rogero, that had helped him oft, alas, now cannot hear his piteous moans and cries. He lies sore wounded as it comes to pass, and little knows where poor Brunello lies. And when he understands thereof at last, it is so late, already it is past. This while what torments Bradamant endured those twenty days, how did she wail and mourn, against which time she thought herself assured her love to her and to the faith should turn? She makes no doubt, but he might have procured within that space to make his home return, yea, though he were in prison kept or banished, if troth and care of promise were not banished. In this long looking, she would often blame the fiery coursers of the heavenly light. She thought that Phoebus' wheels were out of frame, or that his chariot was not in good plight. Great Joshua's day seemed shorter than these same, and shorter seemed the false Amphitryon's night. Each day and night she thought was more than doubled, so fancy blind her sense and reason troubled. She now envies the dormouse of his rest, 
and wished some heavy sleep might overtake her wherewith she might most deadly be possessed till her rogero should return to wake her but waking cares a lodged in her breast that her desired sleep did quite forsake her to sleep so long doth so much pass her power she cannot frame her eyes to wink one hour but turns and tosses in her restless bed alas no turning turns her cares away oft at the window she puts forth her head to see how near it waxeth unto day when by the dawning darksome night is fled she notwithstanding stands in that same stay and during all the time that day doth last she wishes for the night again as fast when fifteen days were of the twenty spent she grows in hope that his approach is nigh then from a tower with eyes to paris bent she waits and watches if she can descry at least some messenger that he hath sent may bring the news where her sweetheart doth lie and satisfy her mind by what hard chance he is constrained to stay so long in france if far aloof the shine of armor bright or anything resembling it she spies she straightway hopes it is her only knight and wipes her face and clears her blubbered eyes if any one unarmed do come in sight it may be one from him she doth surmise and though by proof she find each hope untrue she ceaseth not for that to hope anew sometime all armed she mounteth on her steed and so rides forth in hope to meet her dear but soon some fancy her conceit doth feed that he is past some other way more near then homeward hasteth she with as much speed yet she at home no news of him can hear from day to day she passeth on this fashion hither and thither tossed with her passion now when her twenty days were full expired and that beside were passed some days more yet not rogero come whom she desired her heart with care and sorrows waxed sore with cries and plaints the woods and caves she tired her breast she beat her golden locks she tore nor while these gripes of grief her heart embrace doth she forbear her eyes or angel face why then quoth she beseems it me in vain to seek him still who thus for me doth slide shall i esteem of him that doth disdain my suit and scorn the torments i abide him in whose heart a hate of me doth reign him that accounts his virtues so well tried as though some goddess should from heaven descend before that he his heart to love would bend though stout he is he knows how well i love him and how i honor him with soul and heart yet can my hot affection nothing move him to let me of his love possess some part and lest he might perceive it would behoove him to ease my grief if he did know my smart to give me hearing of my plaint he fears as to the charm the adder stops his ears love stop his course that doth so loosely range and flit so fast before my sorry pace or with my former state else let me change when i sought not to track thy tedious trace i hope in vain remorse to thee is strange thou dost triumph upon my piteous case for hearts thy meat thy drink is lovers tears their cries the music doth delight thine ears but whom blame i it was my fond desire that first enticed me to this killing call and made me past my reach so far aspire that now i feel the greater is my fall for when aloft my wings be touched with fire then farewell flight and i am left to fall but still they spring and still i upward tend and still i see my fall and find no end desire quoth i myself i was too light to give desire an entrance in my breast who when he had my reason put to flight and of my heart himself was full possessed no room for joy is left or heart's delight since i do harbor this unruly guest who though he guide me to my certain fall the long expectance grieves me worst of all then mine the fault be if it be a fault to love a knight deserves to be beloved with all good inward parts so richly fraught whose virtues be so known and well approved and more whom would not his sweet face have caught myself i must confess his beauty moved what blind unhappy wretch were she would shun the pleasing prospect of the precious sun beside my destiny which drew me on by others sugared speech i was entrained as though i should by this great match anon another paradise on earth have gained 
but now their words into the wind be gone and i in purgatory am restrained well may i merlin curse the false deceiver yet my rogero i shall love for ever i hoped of merlin's and melissa's promises who did such stories of our race foretell is this the prophet of believing prophecies and giving credit to the sprites of hell alas they might have found them better offices than me to flout that trusted them so well but all for envy have they wrought me this so to bereave me of my former bliss thus sighs and lamentations are not feigned small place was left for comfort in her breast yet spite of sorrows hope was entertained and though with much ado yet in it pressed to ease her mourning heart when she complained and giving her some time some little rest by sweet remembrance of the words he spake when he was forced of her his leave to take the minding of those words did so recure her wounded heart that she was well content for one month's space his absence to endure yea when his days of promise quite were spent yet still she looked for him you may be sure and many a time that way she came and went till by the way at last such news she hard that all the hope she had before was marred for she by chance did meet a gascoigne knight that in the wars of africa was caught one that was taken captive in that fight then when for paris the great field was fought what she requires to know he could recite but careless of the other news he brought of her rogero chiefly she inquires to hear of him is all that she desires of whom the knight could let her understand for in that court he late his life had led how mandricard and he fought hand to hand and how much blood on either part was shed and though by wounds himself in peril stand that he subdued his foe and left him dead now if with this his story he had ended rogero's excuse had very well been mended but he proceeds to tell how one was there a lady hight marfisa in the field whose fame for martial acts did shine most clear whose beauty rare to few or none did yield rogero her she held rogero dear they never were asunder or but sealed and that they too as every one there saith the ton the t'other plighted have their faith and if rogero once were whole and sound their wedding should be celebrate with speed that such a pair as yet was never found and happy they should come of such a seed how much it joyed the pagan princes round to think upon the race they too should breed which likely were all others to excel in feats of arms that erst on earth did well the gascoigne knight of all that he had said himself had reason to believe was sooth so general a fame thereof was spread there were but few but had it in their mouth some little kindness she did use had fed their foolish humours of this false untruth still fame will grow if once abroad it fly although the ground be troth or be a lie they came indeed together to this fight and many times together they were seen for he was warlike stout and worthy knight and she a gallant fair and dainty queen by which suspicion never judging right did gather straight they had assured been and specially because when she departed to visit him she was so soon revarted of just suspect their reason was but slender if they had weighed well their virtues rare though of his wounds she seemed to be so tender and of his danger had so great a care against bad tongues no goodness can defend her but those most free from faults they least will spare but prate of them whom they have scantly known and judge their humours to be like their own now when the knight avowed the tale he told and yet in truth you know twas but a tale the damsel's heart was touched with shivering cold the little hope she had away it stale almost in sound her seat she scarce could hold with morning cheer and face both wan and pale she said no more but mad with grief and ire her horse she turned and homeward did retire and all in armour on her bed she lies she wished a thousand times she now were dead she bites the sheets to damp her sobs and cries the gascoigne's news still bearing in her head her heart is swollen and blubbered be her eyes with trickling tears bedewed is her bed when grief would be no longer holden in needs out it must and thus it doth begin how wretched me 
whom might a maiden find in whom she might be bold to put her trust since you rogero mine become unkind and tread your faith and promise in the dust you only you mine eye so far did blind i still esteemed you faithful true and just ah never wench that loved so sincerely was in requital punished so severely why my rogero why do you forget sith you in beauty pass each other night and do in feats of arms such honour get as none can match your chivalry and fight this gold and virtue with the rest to set by which your glorious name will shine more bright if as in other graces you abound so in your promise constancy were found this is the virtue breeds most estimation by which all other virtues show more clear as things most fair do lose their commendation which by the want of light cannot appear what glory was it by false protestation her to deceive whose saint and god you were whom your fair speeches might have made believe that water should be carried in a sieve from any heinous act wouldst thou refrain that murderest her who bears thee so good will how wouldst thou use thy foe that thus in pain dost let thy friend to be tormented still thou that with breach of faith thy heart dost stain no doubt thou dost not care for doing ill well this i know that god is ever just he will ere long revenge my wrongs i trust for why unthankfulness is that great sin which made the devil and his angels fall lost him and them the joys that they were in and now in hell detains them bound and thrall then mark the guerdon thou art like to win for why like faults like punishment do call in being thus unthankful unto me that always was so faithful unto thee besides of theft thyself thou canst not quit if theft it be to take that is not thine the keeping of my heart no that's not it that thou shouldst have it i do not repine thyself thou stalest which i cannot remit thyself thou knowst thou art or shouldst be mine thou knowst damnation doth to them belong that do keep back another's right by wrong though thou rogero do forsake me so i cannot will nor choose but love thee still and since there is no measure of my woe death is the only way to end mine ill but thus to cut off life and thou my foe it makes me do it with a worser will yet had i died when best i did thee please i should have counted death no death but ease when with these words she was resolved to die she took her sword in hand for that intent and forced herself upon the point to lie her armor then her purpose did prevent a better spirit checked her by and by and in her heart this secret reason went o noble lady born to so great fame wilt thou thus end thy days with so great shame nay rather if thou beest resolved to die unto the camp why dost thou not repair where bodies of brave knights in heaps do lie lo there to honour the directest stair the loss of life with glory thou mayst buy to die in thy rogero's sight were fair and happily by him thou mayst be slain so he that wrought thy woe may rid thy pain thou mayst be sure marphisa there to see who hath so falsely stolen away thy friend if first on her thou couldst revenge it be with more contented mind thy days would end unto this counsel she doth best agree and onward on this journey straight doth tend she takes a new device that might imply a desperation and a will to die the color of her bases was almost like to the falling whitish leaves and dry which when the moisture of the branch is lost forsakenly about the tree doth lie with cypress trunks embroidered and embossed for cypress once but cut will always die a fine conceit she thinks to represent in secret sort her inward discontent she took astolfo's horse and goldalance as fittest both for this her present feet that spear could make the bravest knight to dance and caper with a touch beside his seat but where astolfo had it by what chance or why he gave it need i not repeat she took it notwithstanding her election not knowing of that magical confection thus all alone without both squire and page thus furnished she set herself in way 
to Parisward she travelled in a rage, whereas the camp of Sarsens lately lay, and, as she thought, kept up King Charles in cage, not understanding how before that day Rinaldo, aiding Charles with Malagige, had forced them from thence to raise their siege. Now had she left Mount Dordon at her back, when little way behind her she descried a gallant damsel following of her track, a shield of gold unto her saddle tied. Of squires and other servants none did lack, and three brave knights were riding by her side. But of the squires that overtook her last, she asked one what those were that by her passed, and straight the worthy lady it was told how from Pole Arctic that same damsel came, sent from a queen with that fair shield of gold unto King Charles. That there was known by fame but so as he must this condition hold that on a knight he must bestow the same such one as he in his imagination for prowess deemed most worthy reputation for she of island isle that holds the rein and is and knows it that she is most fair doth think she should her worth not little stain and her great fame and honour much impair if any knight her isle and her should gain except he stood so high on honour's stair as that he were adjudged in feats of war the primer man and passing others far wherefore the cause she sends to france is this she thinks if she shall find one anywhere that in the court of france he surely is and therefore she doth send to greet him there as for those three because you shall not miss to know the truth i'll tell you what they were they were three kings of whom great fame there goeth of norway one one swethland one of goth these three though far they dwell from island isle yet love of that same queen hath brought them hither this isle is called Perduta otherwhile, because the seamen lees it in foul weather. These kings lived from their country in exile, and to this queen were suitors altogether, and she, that knew not well how to forbid them, with this same pretty shift from thence she rid them. She saith she minds to wed for her behoof that white that most excels in warlike action and though quoth she you show no little proof of value here as twere in private faction yet i must have you tried more far aloof before my mind can have full satisfaction wherefore i mean myself and crown to yield alone to him that bringeth back my shield this is the cause that these three kings did move each one to come from so remote a nation with purpose firm their utmost force to prove to win the golden shield with reputation or lease their lives for that fair lady's love if that they failed of their expectation when he had told her thus he her forsook and soon his company he overtook the damsel rode a softer pace behind, and so as in a while she lost their sight, and often she revolved in her mind the tale the fellow told with small delight. She doubts this shield bestowed in such a kind will be in France a cause of brawl and fight. That this will be a means, she greatly fears, to set her kin together all by the ears. This fancy moved her much, but more than this, that former jealous fancy did her move that her rogero's kindness altered is that on marphisa he had placed his love this so possessed her sense that she did miss her way nor never thought as did behoove till night was almost come and sun nigh set where she a lodging for herself may get even as an empty vessel that was tied unto a wharf with some old rotten cable if that the knot do hap to break or slide so that to hold it be no longer able is borne away as please the wind and tide so bradamant with mind and thoughts unstable was in such muse as she the right way missed and so was born where rabicano list but when she saw the sun was almost set she took more heed and asking of a clown a shepherd that by hap thereby she met where she might lodging get ere sun went down the shepherd made her answer that as yet she was almost a league from any town or other place where she might eat or lodge save at a castle called sir tristram's lodge but every one that list is not assured though he do thither come to stay therein to martial feats they must be well inured with spear and shield they must their lodging win such custom in the place hath long endured and many years ago it did begin wherefore tis good that one be well advised ere such an act by him be enterprised in brief thus is their order 
if a knight do find the lodgings void they him receive with promise that if more arrive that night either he shall to them his lodging leave or else with each of them shall prove in fight which of them can of lodging t'other reeve if none do come that night he shall in quiet have both his horse meat lodging and his diet if four or five do come together first the castle keeper must them entertain who cometh single after hath the worst for if he hope a lodging there to gain he must according to that law accursed fight with all those that did therein remain likewise if one come first and more come later he must go fight with them yet ne'er the later the like case is if any maid or dame do come alone or else accompanied both they that first and they that latest came must by a jury have their beauties tried then shall the fairest of them hold the same but to the rest that come shall be denied thus much the shepherd unto her did say and with his finger showed to her the way about three miles was distant then the place the damsel thither hastes with great desire and though that rabicano trot apace yet was the way so deep and full of mire the snow and drift still beating in their face she later came than manners good require but though it were as then both dark and late she boldly bounced at the castle gate the porter told her that the lodgings all were filled by knights that late before them took who now stood by the fire amid the hall and did ere long to have their supper look well answered she then have they cause but small if they be supperless to thank the cook i know quoth she the custom and will keep it and mean to win their lodging ere i sleep yet the porter went and did her message bold to those great states then standing by the fire who took small pleasure when they heard it told for thence to part they had so small desire now chiefly when twas rainy dark and cold but so their oath and order did require that they must do it were it cold or warm and therefore quickly they themselves did arm these were those three great kings whom that same day dame bradamant had seen but few hours past though they had sooner finished their way because she rode so soft and they so fast now when they were all armed they make no stay but all on horseback mount themselves at last no doubt but few in strength these three did pass yet of those few sure one this damsel was who purposed as it seemeth nothing less than in so wet and in so cold a night to lack a lodging and sleep supperless now those within at windows see the sight the men themselves on horseback do address to look thereon for why the moon gave light and thus at last though first twere somewhat late they did abase the bridge and ope the gate even as a secret and lascivious lover rejoiceth much when after long delays and many fears in which his hope did hover he hears at last the noise of pretty kays so bradamant that hopes now to recover a lodging for the which so long she stays did in her mind in such like sort rejoice when as she heard the watchful porter's voice now when those knights and some few of their train were past the bridge the dame her horse doth turn to take the field and then with speed again with full career she doth on them return and couch that spear yet never couched in vain for whom it hits it still doth overturn this spear her cousin when he went from france gave unto her the name was goldalance the valiant king of swethland was the first that met her and the next the king of goth the staff doth hit them full and never burst but from their saddles it did heave them both but yet the king of norway sped the worst it seemed to leave his saddle he was loath his gurses break and he fell upside down in danger with the mire to choke and drown thus at three blows three kings she down did bear and hoist their heels full high their heads full low then entered she the castle void of fear they stand without that night in rain and snow yet ere she could get in one caused her swear to keep the custom which they made her know and then the master doth to her great honour and entertainment great bestow it on her now when the lady did disarm her head off with her helmet came her little call and all her hair her shoulders overspread and both her sex and name was known withal and wonder great and admiration bred in them that saw her make three princes fall for why she showed to be in all their sight as fair in face as she was fierce in fight 
even as a stage set forth with pomp and pride where rich men cost and cunning art bestow when curtains be removed that all did hide doth make by light of torch a glittering show or as the sun that in a cloud did bide when that is gone doth clearer seem to grow so bradamant when as her head was barest her color and her beauty seemed rarest now stood the guests all round about the fire expecting food with talk their ears yet feeding while every one doth wonder and admire her speech and grace the others all exceeding the while her host to tell she doth desire from whence and whom this custom was proceeding that men were driven unto their great disquiet to combat for their lodging and their diet fair dame said he some time there ruled in france king pharamond whose son a comely knight clodian by name by good or evil chance upon a lovely lady did alight but as we see it oftentimes doth chance that jealousy and love mars men's delight thus he of her in time so jealous grew he durst not let her go out of his view nor ever argus kept the milk-white cow more straight than clodian here did keep his wife ten knights eke to this place he doth allow thereby for to prevent all casual strife thus hope and fear between i know not how as he prolongs his self-tormenting life the good sir tristram thither did repair and in his company a lady fair whom he had rescued but a little since from giant's hand with whom he did her find sir tristram sought for lodging with the prince for then the sun was very low declined but as a horse with galled back will wince even so our clodian with as galled mind forecasting doubts and dreading every danger would by no means be one to lodge a stranger when as sir tristram long had prayed in vain and still denied the thing he did demand that which i cannot with your will obtain in spite of you said he i will command i here will prove your villainy most plain with lance in rest and with my sword in hand and straight he challenged the combat then to fight with clodian and the other ten thus only they agreed upon the case if clodian and his men were overthrown that all then presently should void the place and that sir tristram there should lie alone so clodian to avoid so great disgrace the challenge took for why excuse was none in fine both clodian and his men well knocked and from the castle that same night were locked triumphant tristram to the castle came and for that night as on his own he seized and there he saw the princess lovely dame and talked with her who him not little pleased this while sir clodian was in part with shame and more with thought and jealous fear diseased disdaining not in humble sort to woo him by message mild to send his wife unto him but he though her he do not much esteem for why by means of an enchanted potion isotta fairest unto him did seem to whom he vowed had his whole devotion yet for he did the jealous clodian deem some plague to merit he denied his motion and swears it were no manners nor no reason a lady to unlodge at such a season but if saith he it do his mind offend to lie all night alone and eke abroad tell him i will this other lady send to him that shall with him make her abode now tell him that to keep this i intend the which to win i have such pain bestowed tis reason that the fairest should remain with him that is the strongest of us twain clodian in mind was wondrous malcontent used so not like a prince but like a patch that puffing blowing up and down he went all night as one were set to keep a watch but whether he do chafe or else lament he found the night for him too hard a match next day sir tristram let him have his wife and so for that time finished was the strife for openly he on his honour swore that he her honour had that night preserved although discourtesies he had before had at his hands a great revenge deserved yet in that clodian had lodged out of door he was content that penance should have served he natheless took it for no good excuse to say that love was cause of such abuse for love should gentle make rude hearts and base and not in gentle mind breed humours vile now when sir tristram parted from the place sir clodian meant to stay there but a while 
but to a knight that stood much in his grace he grants the keeping of this stately pile keeping one law for him and for his heirs with every one that to the place repairs that namely ever he that was most strong should there be lodged and she that was most fair and that the rest should take it for no wrong to walk abroad into the open air this is the law which hath endured long and no man may the strength thereof impair now while the man this story did repeat the steward on the board did set the meat the board was covered in a stately hall whose match was scarce in all the country seen with goodly pictures drawn upon the wall all round about but chiefly on the screen these they did look on with delight not small and would have quite forgot their meat i ween save that their noble host did them advise to feed their bellies first and then their eyes now as they down did at the table sit the master of the house began to lower and said they did an error great commit to lodge two ladies come in sundry hour needs one must be put out where e'er it hit and go abroad into the cold and shower the fairest sith they came not both together must bide the foulest must go try the weather two aged men and women more beside he called and bade them quickly take a view which of the twain should in the place abide and namely which of twain had fairest hue this jury do the matter soon decide and gave their verdict as it was most true that bradamant passed her in hue as far as she excelled the men in feats of war then spake the knight unto the island dame whose mind was full of timorous suspicion i pray you think it not a scorn or shame for hence you must there can be no remission poor uleni so was the damsel's name doth think she now is driven to hard condition yet in her conscience true she knew it was that bradamant in beauty her did pass even as we see the sun obscured sometime by sudden rising of a misty cloud engendered by the vapour breeding slime and in the middle region then embowed so when the damsel plainly saw that time her presence in the place was not allowed she was so changed in countenance and in cheer that even unlike herself she did appear but much astonied with the sudden passion she ready was to sound in all their sight but bradamant that would not for compassion permit that she should go abroad that night did say this trial was of no good fashion and that the judgment hardly could be right when men observe not this same chief regard as not to judge before both parts be hard i that on me do take her to defend say thus that be i fair or less or more i came not as a woman nor intend as woman now to be a judge therefore who knows my sex except i condescend to show the same and one should evermore shun to confirm things doubtful or deny it when chiefly others may be harmed by it yet who can say precisely what i am for many men do wear their hair as long and you do know that as a man i came and all my gestures to a man belong wherefore in giving me a woman's name to both of us perhaps you may do wrong your law appoints women if their right be done by women not by warriors to be won but yet admit it were as you do guess that i indeed were of the female gender though that it is so i do not confess should i to her my lodging then surrender if that my beauty of the two were less no sure in that the reason were but slender the price that unto virtue longs of duty should not be taken away for want of beauty and if your law were such that needs of force unto the fairest lodging should be given yet at this feast i tarry would perforce and from my lodging i would not be driven wherefore mine arguments i thus enforce that this same match between us is not even for striving here with me the case is plain she much may lease and little she may gain and where the gain and loss unequal is the match is evil made in common sense wherefore i think it were not much amiss with this same law for this time to dispense and if that any dare mislike of this or seem to take the matter in offence i will with sword be ready to maintain that mine advice is good and his is vain thus noble ammon's daughter moved with pity in her behalf who to her great disgrace should have been sent where neither town nor city was near almost in three leagues of the place 
framed her defence so stout and eke so witty that to her reason all the rest gave place but chief the peril great and hazard weighing that might have grown to them by her gainsaying as when the sun in summer hath most power and that the ground with heat thereof is rived for want of rain the dry and parched flower doth fade and is as twere of life deprived but if in season come a fruitful shower it riseth up and is again revived so when the damsel this defence did hear she waxed fair again of better cheer and thus at last they fell unto their feast in quiet sort for none did come that night to challenge any of them or molest no traveller nor any wandering knight all merry were but bradamante least fell jealousy barred her of all delight her stomach so distempering and her taste she took no pleasure of that sweet repast when supper ended was they all arise although perhaps they would have longer sate save for desire they had to feed their eyes and now the night was spent and waxed late the master of the house in seemly wise doth call for torches to set out his state and straight with torchlight filled was the hall but what they saw hereafter show i shall end of book thirty two